Recorded Books Romance presents an unabridged recording of The Night Drifter by Susan Carroll, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. This book is copyrighted 1999 by Susan Coppola. This recording is copyrighted 2000 by Recorded Books, producer and publisher of Romantic Sounds, an imprint that features dramatic tales that will carry you away to exotic locales and sweep you off your feet. And now, The Night Drifter. Prologue It was the kind of night when anything could happen. Magic, moonlight, the sea roaring like a dragon, breathing a soft mist that was slowly enveloping the land. The stalwart figure who drifted along the rocky shoreline materialized like an apparition in his glinting chainmail and dark tunic. A ghostly knight from King Arthur's court who had wandered into the 19th century by mistake and couldn't quite find his way back to Camelot. But Lance St. Ledger was merely a man, attired in the costume he had worn to the Midsummer's Eve fest and had not yet troubled to remove. He had far weightier matters on his mind. He scanned the dark and silent beach ahead of him, his face anxious and tense. He was possessed of strong, handsome features, a square jaw, a hawk-like nose, and a deeply tanned complexion framed beneath a sweep of raven-black hair. But a certain cynicism already marred the velvet darkness of his eyes, despite the fact that he was a relatively young man, only twenty-seven. The disillusionment that tugged at the full curve of his lips made him seem older, giving his mouth a hard cast, except when he smiled. He wasn't smiling now, as he studied the overturned hull of an abandoned fishing boat, the sea raking cold fingers of foam across the sand, obliterating all traces of any footsteps. But Lance was certain this was the place where he had been attacked only an hour before, surprised by some hooded brigand and rendered unconscious. When Lance had awoken, he had found his watch and signet ring missing, but that had not been the worst of it. The thief had also taken his sword, the one that had been in his family for generations, a weapon as steeped in mystery and magic as the St. Ledger name itself. When the sword had first been handed down to Lance on his 18th birthday, he had sensed the power in it. Merely touching the hilt had somehow made him feel stronger, better, more noble. He had earnestly recited the pledge that all St. Ledger heirs were required to give. I vow that I will only employ this blade in just cause, that I will never use it to shed the blood of another St. Ledger, and on the day that I marry, I will offer this sword up to my bride as a symbol of my undying love, along with my heart and soul forever. But that had been a long time ago back when Lance still believed in such things as just causes, magic, and true love, back when he still believed in himself. Lance desperately circled the area around the boat, but he didn't know why he'd bothered to come back here, what he was hoping to find, that the thief had experienced a change of heart, that he would suddenly reappear to return the stolen treasure to Lance, scraping and bowing while he babbled, Oh, here you are, Master Lance. Here is your ancestral sword. Please forgive the impertinence. Lance's lip curled in contempt at his own folly. He swore beneath his breath, cursing both the unknown brigand and himself. He'd certainly made mistakes in the past, brought enough disgrace to his family's name, but allowing that sword to be stolen was by far the worst thing he'd ever done. Not true, a sad voice whispered in his ear. The worst thing was what you did to your brother Val. But Lance refused to think about Val. He was already racked with enough guilt over the disappearance of that infernal sword. 
Despairing of finding any clue to his attacker on the beach, Lance turned and headed up the path toward the village instead. Despite the fact that he'd recently cashiered out of the service, Lance still moved with the military bearing of a man who spent nearly nine years as an officer in Wellington's army. Slipping quietly alongside the forge next to the blacksmith's shop, he peered toward the line of whitewashed cottages. Earlier, Torakum had been a riot of noise and laughter, alive with all the excitement of the Midsummer's Eve festival. But the village slumbered now, not a soul stirring across the green in the centre of town. Lance thought briefly of conducting a house-to-house -house search, only to discard the notion. He doubted that anyone from the village would have dared to attack him. The local folk were too much in awe of the St. Ledger's, and their legends. Legends of a family descended from a notorious sorcerer. The mighty Lord Prospero might have come to a disastrous end, burnt at the stake, but he had passed on a legacy of strange talents and powers to his descendants, of which Lance had inherited his share. No, Lance was convinced no one from the village would have trifled with the St. Ledger. The thief had to have been an outsider, a stranger, and there had been plenty of those wandering through Torakum tonight because of the fair. Many of them were stopping over at the inn, and that seemed the most likely place for Lance to begin his search. He stole across the village square until the Dragon's Fire Inn loomed over him. A quaint building, it still bore traces of its original Tudor construction, with mullioned windows and overhanging eaves. An ostler bustled about the stable yard, attending to the horse of some late arrival. Lance watched, keeping to the shadows. Long ago he had promised his father that he would never reveal the secret of his own peculiar and frightening power to anyone outside of the family. And one did not likely break promises given to Anatole St. Ledger, the dread lord of the castle ledger. Lance was deeply grateful that, at this moment, his father was far from Cornwall, travelling abroad on an extensive holiday with Lance's mother and three younger sisters. He'd already proved enough of a disappointment to Anatole St. Ledger, Lance reflected grimly. With any luck at all, he would be able to recover the sword before word of his latest escapade reached his father's ears. He had to. Huddling behind a tree, Lance wished that he was merely a clairvoyant, like his second cousin Maeve. It would certainly make his search for the sword easier, and safer. The ostler was taking a damned long time about disappearing into the stables. The blasted fool was doing more stroking and talking to that horse than he was attending to it. Lance cast an uneasy glance toward the sky, trying to calculate how much time he had left until dawn. It wouldn't do for him to be caught abroad, exercising his strange gift, when the sun came up. That could prove dangerous. In fact, deadly. He was filled with relief when the ostler moved on at last, leading the horse into the stables. Stealing from his hiding place, Lance drifted toward the inn. After a moment of hesitation, he braced himself and shimmered straight through the wall. Chapter One Lady Rosalind Carlion sat with her chin perched upon her hands, her elbows resting upon the open casement. Her long hair rippled in a golden braid down the back of her fine lawn nightdress, her bare toes peeking out beneath the hem. With eyes the serene blue of a lake in summer, she stared dreamily out the window of her second-story chamber at the Dragon's Fire Inn, past the dark and silent inn yard to where the fair had once been. She'd been watching most of the evening. There'd been a puppet show and a fire-eater and dancing on the green, tents gaily decked out with flags and ribbons after the fashion of a medieval tournament. At one point, she believed there had even been some manner of joust, but the men had crowded about so thick it had been impossible to see. 
Impulsively, Rosalind had snatched up her shawl, preparing to dart down there and find out exactly what was going on, lose herself in all the colour and excitement. She'd been held back only by her maid. As soon as she'd mentioned the fair, Jenny Gray's earnest eyes had widened with alarm. Oh, no, miss, she'd cried. These country fairs can be dangerous, full of such vulgar and rough characters. No place for a respectable young lady to be walking alone. Whatever would his lordship's, God rest his noble soul, whatever would his aunts think? The mere mention of Clotilde and Miranda Carlyon, with their sour, disapproving scowls, had almost been enough to send Rosalind hurtling out the inn door, defiantly prepared to do as she pleased. After all, she was no longer a chit out of the schoolroom, but a twenty-one-year-old widow. In the end, however, she had yielded to Jenny's pleas and had spent her evening curled up by the hearth with her much-worn copy of Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur. Rosalind regretted it now as she sat by the window, gazing out at the empty village square. The laughing crowds had long ago dispersed, the torches extinguished, the tents struck, leaving her with the forlorn sensation of having been left behind while the rest of the world moved on. All she'd wanted had been a wee bit of excitement, a shade of adventure. She'd known too little of that in her life. The sole child of a doting older couple, she'd been cosseted by parents whose only fault had been loving her too much. And when Walter and Sarah Byrne had fallen victim to a cholera epidemic, the task of sheltering Rosalind had passed on to her guardian, Lord Arthur Carlyon, an honourable gentleman some twenty years her senior. Despite the difference in their ages, it had seemed the most right and natural thing to marry Arthur. It had been more than a year since his death, and still she grieved. The village was completely silent now, the houses snug beneath their thatched roofs, as though the cottages had donned nightcaps and were all peacefully asleep. It was lonely, Rosalind thought, being the only one left awake. She'd had difficulty sleeping ever since Arthur had died. Her maid had bustled off to find the inn's kitchen and brew Rosalind a posset that Jenny swore would cure her mistress's insomnia. Rosalind only hoped the girl was right. She needed to get some rest, or she would be exhausted tomorrow, and she had a special call to pay before she continued on with her journey. If she was ever fortunate enough to travel into this part of the country, she had always promised herself that she would look up an old friend of her father's, the Reverend Septimus Fitzledger. She'd only met the elderly clergyman once, years ago, when he'd paid a visit to their house in Hampshire. But Rosalind retained a vivid memory of the kindly old man who had dandled her upon his knee his pocket stuffed full of sweetmeats and an ancient timepiece he had permitted her to play with. He'd seemed more of a magician than a vicar to her, a regular Merlin with his snowy white tufts of hair and wise twinkling eyes. He told her delightful stories of the land he came from, so different from the quiet, well-ordered house and garden where she was growing up like a sheltered princess. A country of storm-lashed cliffs, wild moors, and a fairy-tale castle perched high above the sea. Cornwall. She had repeated the name after Mr. Fitzledger in accents of childish wonder, certain it must not be a part of England at all, but a magical kingdom unto itself. And some day, when you are quite a lady grown, Miss Rosalind, Mr. Fitzledger had told her with a smile, you must promise to come visit me in my kingdom by the sea. Rosalind had slipped her small hand into his gentle, aged one and solemnly given her word. But it had taken her a great many years to keep that promise. She wasn't even certain if the old man still lived, but on the morrow she intended to find out, so it would not do to wear herself out to the point that she overslept. Closing the casement, Rosalind turned away from the window, when she was startled by her bedchamber door crashing open, Jenny bolted back into the room, but there was no sign of any posset in the little maid's trembling hands. She slammed the door closed and leaned up against it, her thin face as white as her mop cap. 
which had gone askew. She panted and shook like a frightened rabbit who'd just outrun a pack of ravenous hounds. Recovering herself from her shock at Jenny's abrupt appearance, Rosalind rushed to the agitated maid's side. Jenny, my poor girl, whatever's the matter? Jenny moaned and shook her head, clearly unable to answer. She seemed in danger of swooning away. But somehow Rosalind managed to coax Jenny away from the door and get her settled into the large overstuffed chair by the hearth. Hunkering down beside the trembling girl, Rosalind chafed her wrists. Heartened to see some colour seeping back into the girl's face, Rosalind repeated her anxious inquiries. My dear Jenny, do tell me what's happened. Oh, my lady, my lady, was all Jenny could groan. Rosalind squeezed her hand. You've obviously had a dreadful fright. Did some rogue here at the inn attempt to accost you? Did someone try to do you a harm? N not someone, Jenny quavered. Something. What? Jenny recovered herself enough to straighten a little and go on in halting accents. I, I was making my way down to the ki kitchen when I got lost. I fetched up in this, this storeroom, kind of scary and dark-like, and I saw the largest, most dreadful... The girl broke off, shuddering. A rat? Rosalind asked faintly. No, my lady. Far worse. A, a, a ghost? Rosalind gaped at the girl. Tis true, my lady. Jenny's linen cap bobbed up and down as she nodded. I'd swear on me mum's grave. I did see a ghost. A terrible knight, all in armour. Like the one you was telling me about. I was so scared I, I could couldn't even scream, and then my candle blew out so I didn't get a real good look at him. But I'm certain it's that same dreadful spectre that went after poor Sir Gawain. Dear me, Rosalind murmured. What I told you about Sir Gawain was only a story, Jenny, out of the tales of King Arthur and his knights. But you said King Arthur was real, my lady. That's why you came to Cornwall to have a look at that ruined castle where he was born, see the caves where Merlin used to do his magic. Well, yes, I hope to do so, Rosalind said. Arthur was indeed a real king, but... Then it stands to reason. The ghost was real too, and still knocking about. Jenny was so thoroughly in earnest and so thoroughly frightened, Rosalind was not even tempted to smile. She was flooded with guilt instead. This was all her fault. Would she never learn her lesson? Arthur had often tried to warn her. It was one thing for Rosalind to be such an avid collector of legends, but she must try to contain her enthusiasm in front of the servants, refrain from filling their heads with such things as vampires, banshees and knockers. Their butler, Mr. James, had complained that he could not even get a footman to fetch a bottle of port from the wine cellar unaccompanied any more. Rosalind had tried to be more careful after that, but her new maid, Jenny, had seemed so unflappable. She shared Rosalind's own delight in tales and legends, both wondrous and horrible. Jenny had even chatted with the other servants at the inn when she'd gone below stairs to fetch up her mistress's supper tray and returned to Rosalind with all manner of fascinating local gossip, stories about a mysterious castle very close by and a strange family named St. Ledger. She and Jenny had had a delightful time over supper, swapping lore of sorcery, ghostly apparitions, and even darker things. But now it was clear to Rosalind that, as usual, she'd gone too far and had frightened poor Jenny out of her wits. She tried to comfort the girl and urge her to put the matter out of her mind and go to sleep. But Jenny continued to quake. Oh, no, m m lady. I'll just sit here in this chair till dawn. I'm sure I couldn't get a wink of sleep now. Not in this dreadful haunted inn. Which meant that Rosalind was unlikely to get a wink of sleep either. Rosalind sighed, seeing only one way to remedy the damage she'd done. Although she didn't exactly relish the prospect. She gave Jenny's shoulders a comforting squeeze and said, How would it be if I go to this storeroom and have a look round? Then, when I report back to you that there's no ghost, you may feel quite easy again. Oh, 
Jenny's mouth rounded with dismay. I couldn't let you do a thing like that, my lady. What if that horrible spectre's still there prowling about? Aren't you afraid of ghosts? I don't know, Rosalind said honestly. I've never encountered one. She did experience a momentary qualm. It might be better to summon the landlord, demand that one of the male servants be sent to investigate. But, despite his unctuous manner, there was something about Mr. Silas Bragg's small, narrow eyes and sly smiles that Rosalind had found repellent from the first. She thought she'd far rather risk encountering a ghost than endure any more of the innkeeper's oily courtesies. Besides, creeping about the darkened corners of an inn at night could prove an adventure. A smallish one, but an adventure all the same. Rosalind shoved resolutely to her feet, snatching up her candle before she could change her mind. Jenny was torn between admiration and terror, begging Rosalind not to go, and at the same time cautioning her to be very careful. The girl was still quaking so badly from her fright, Rosalind settled the maid in her own bed. She draped her shawl about Jenny's trembling shoulders and plied the girl with a box of chocolates before slipping out of the room, assuring Jenny she would return very soon. Outside her door, Rosalind hesitated, Jenny's directions having been a little incoherent. Down the hall and turn right, or was it left? She would have to be careful. It would not do at all to seize upon the wrong room and blunder in on some guest who'd been imprudent enough to leave his door unbolted. Shielding her candle from any stray draughts, Rosalind padded cautiously along. But it was not as difficult to locate the door Jenny had described as Rosalind had feared it might be. It stood at the end of another long hall, and while fleeing the ghost, Jenny had left it ajar. Cracking the door open further, Rosalind peered at the darkness that loomed before her with some trepidation. This part of the inn seemed silent and deserted, certainly no place for a respectable young widow to be wandering alone in the dead of night. Bucking up her courage, she slipped inside, holding the candle before her like a Valkyrie brandishing her sword. She didn't expect to find anything more sinister than an oddly draped piece of furniture or moonlight casting eerie shadows on the wall. The Dragon's Fire Inn seemed too cheerful and bustling a place to be haunted, especially not the storeroom. She found herself in a large chamber, with the mullioned window allowing rays of moonlight to play across the wooden floor. During the older days of the inn, it had likely been a handsome bedchamber reserved for the most illustrious of guests. The wall still boasted beautiful linen-fold panelling and ornate candle brackets. Now it appeared to be used solely for storage, crates and chests, mismatched chairs stacked haphazardly alongside a table with a broken leg. The fire-blackened hearth looked cold and dismal from lack of use. Rosalind shifted her candle, darting her light into every corner of the chamber. If there truly had been a ghost strolling about here, there was no sign of him now. She released a long sigh, relieved at finding nothing, yet strangely disappointed as well. She never even noticed the night melting out of the woodwork until she collided with him. Her entire body shuddered with the sensation, as though her veins were being pierced by slivers of light, slivers of darkness, her soul torn apart by conflicting emotions, the warmth of intimacy, the chill of despair. Staggering forward a few steps, she felt stunned, not quite certain what had just happened to her. She was trembling, goose flesh parading along her arms, the hairs at the nape of her neck prickling. Very carefully, she turned around. He stood not more than a foot away, transfixing her with his eyes. His black hair, like his tunic, and the dark steel of his chain mail were calculated to blend with the night. A warrior emerged straight from the halls of Camelot. Rosalind realized what had just happened to her. She had just walked through a ghost. She might have screamed if she still had a voice. All she could manage was a soft moan. Dropping her candle, she cowered away from him, retreating until there was no place to go. She flattened herself against the wall. The candle snuffed out, 
but she was trapped in the beam of moonlight spilling through the diamond-shaped panes of glass. For what seemed like an eternity, he simply stood and stared at her, a silent shadow. Recovering from her initial shock, she was almost able to breathe again when he stirred, coming closer. Rosalind gulped, trying to force the air into her lungs for one mighty shriek. He drifted into her circle of moonlight, and she hardly dared raise her eyes to his face, anticipating some truly hideous countenance. She peered fearfully up at him, and her racing heart stopped altogether. Light played over the face of a hero straight from the pages of a fairy tale or a woman's most secret dreams. High cheekbones and an iron jaw, full sculpted lips, and his brows two straight slashes as lustrously black as his hair. It was a strong face, one of remarkable character and vitality for a ghost. He couldn't have been so very old when he died, not more than thirty. The thought filled Rosalind with an inexplicable sorrow. Seen up close, he no longer seemed such an alarming spectre, his dark eyes less fierce than tired and sad. He could have done his haunting with that soul-weary gaze alone. Please, don't be afraid, he said softly. I, I, I'm not, she stammered, astonished to realise that was almost true. You're not going to scream or faint. She shook her head, struggling to credit the evidence of her own eyes. Her gaze skimmed wonderingly over him. She wasn't sure what she would have expected a ghost to look like if she ever encountered one. More transparent, more unreal, perhaps. Yet she had actually seen him come walking straight out of the wall. Or had she? The muscular compactness of his frame seemed far too solid. She felt as though she ought to be able to rest her hand on the hard plane of his chest, feel the cold weight of his chainmail, the tensile strength of his arms. She reached out to touch his hand. But her fingers melted through his, sending an odd tingle through her. She snatched her hand back at once. There was no doubt about it. Whoever and whatever he was, he was not of this world. Perhaps she would faint after all. She sank wearily down on top of an old trunk instead. He gazed down at his hand, flexing his fingers with a slight frown. Whether he had been offended by her attempt to touch him or merely astonished, Rosalind could not tell. That... that was very rude of me, she said finding her voice at last. It came out somewhere between a gasp and a squeak. I shouldn't have been poking at you. I'm sorry. That is quite all right, my lady. I am sure your fingers are very gentle and soft. I'm only sorry I could not feel your touch. His smile was filled with genuine regret. You really are a ghost she murmured, more to herself than to him, as though by admitting the fact aloud she could convince herself she was not dreaming. A ghost? he repeated, sounding surprised, as though he was just becoming aware of the fact himself. Um, yes, that's exactly what I am. But whose? Who are... Who were you? What is your name? Lancelot. Lancelot? Du Lac? She gasped. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Sir Lancelot Du Lac, at thy service. Milady. He dropped down on one knee before her. It was the most dashing, the most romantic thing she'd ever seen any man do. He did it naturally and gracefully, as though he had paid homage to ladies this way his entire life. Which he likely had, if he was who he claimed to be. 
All she could do was clutch the sides of the trunk and gawp at him like a freshly landed fish. Sir Lancelot du Lac. The Sir Lancelot. The spirit of the most famous knight of King Arthur's round table. Could it possibly be so? What reason would a ghost have to lie? There would have been plenty of people in her life to warn her that she would be a fool to believe him. Only her papa would have understood. Walter Byrne had been something of an Arthurian scholar himself. Frequently ridiculed by his learned colleagues for his insistence that there really had once been a King Arthur and his knights of the round table. But now, kneeling before Rosalind, was proof that her papa had not been a fool. Emotion sifted through Rosalind in quick silver succession. Incredulity replaced by awe, replaced by a surge of unbelievable delight. Papa was right, she whispered. I beg your pardon, milady. Papa was right, she cried with even more conviction. Sir Lancelot, this is too good to be true. Did you know that I travelled to Cornwall, hoping to find you? You have? He rose to his feet, clearly nonplussed. I mean, thou hast? Not you, exactly. I was looking for anything to do with the King Arthur legends. I travelled into Cornwall for that very reason, to visit all the famous places like Tintagel and King's Wood and the Maiden Lake. You would be astonished by the number of people who refused to believe that you and your fellow knights even existed, deeming it all a pack of nonsense. Rosalind beamed up at him. But here you are. What more proof could anyone ask for? If it was possible for a ghost to pale, Sir Lancelot did. He backed away from her, retreating into the shadows, appearing about to take flight at once. No, please. I'm a shy, retiring sort of... Uh, spirit. If you reveal my existence, I shall be set upon by throngs of gaping fools. I do not care for large crowds of people. No, of course not, she soothed. I didn't mean I was going to tell anyone. People would think me more mad than they already do. It is enough that I have proved to myself that you exist. No one else need know if you do not wish it. Indeed, I do not. Though I fear I have already betrayed myself to one other, the little lass who stumbled into this room a while ago. Jenny... You did give her quite a fright. Rosalind gave a rueful chuckle. But she did not get a very good look at you. I merely came to reassure her that there was nothing here, which is exactly what I shall tell her. But you must promise not to terrify her again. Most readily. It grieves me much that I did the first time. Is she all right? Oh, quite. I left her tucked up in my shawl, blissfully eating sweetmeats, Chocolates, I find, are a great restorer of one's nerves. Rosalind thought he smiled a little at that. She was gratified when he trusted her enough to step back into the circle of light. Considering the bold warrior he'd once been, she was much struck by his uncertainty, his aura of vulnerability. She found his shyness rather endearing. She'd always been a little shy herself, especially around striking young men. That was why it had been so comfortable to marry Arthur, someone she'd known from the earliest years of her childhood. If Sir Lancelot had been flesh and blood, she would have been overwhelmed, unable to stammer out two words to him. So devastatingly handsome, such a powerful specimen of a man. Though not overly tall, she would have fit nicely beneath his chin, if he were still alive. But the fact that he was a ghost left her curiously at ease in his presence. She rose to her feet, relieved to discover that her legs no longer trembled beneath her, even when he subjected her to a rather searching inspection with his fine dark eyes. Thou art this Jenny's guardian angel, then? he asked. Hardly. 
She is my Abigail. Rosalind laughed, then realized with a start that she'd quite forgotten to introduce herself. What must he think of her? I have the most rag manners, she said. I've not even told you who I am. I already know who thou must be. You do? Verily. Thou art the Lady of the Lake, the fair damsel who came from the castle beneath the shimmering waters of the Maiden Lake to bestow upon my liege Arthur the wondrous sword Excalibur. Oh, no, Rosalind cried in dismay at his error. But thou hast the eyes of that enchantress, jewel bright, and thou art clothed in white samite. White samite? What was he talking about? Rosalind glanced down, and to her horror realized she'd been prancing around before him, clad only in her nightgown. After her usual impulsive fashion, she dashed out of her room, not even remembering to snatch up a wrapper or a shawl. Flushing, she crossed her arms over her bosom in defensive fashion. Sir Lancelot must have sensed her embarrassment, for he averted his gaze. Whether alive or dead, the man was the soul of chivalry. Rosalind inched back so that she was not quite so fully illuminated by the moonlight. This is not Samite, only my linen nightdress, she explained, blushing furiously. Then thou art not my lady of the lake? No, I'm sorry. And thou hast no magical sword for me? I'm afraid not she said regretfully. Do you need one? Thou hast no idea how much. Rosalind puzzled over his wry remark for a moment, wondering why a ghost, even if he was Sir Lancelot, could still have need of a sword. When she dared glance up at him again, she saw that his eyes twinkled, his lips curved in a smile. Comprehension flooded her at once. Oh... You never really thought you were only teasing me. Alas, I was. Forgive me, my lady. She tried to look indignant and failed. Her late husband had been such a good man, but so serious. She'd rarely been teased, but she discovered she didn't mind so much. Sir Lancelot's gaze was not mocking, but filled with an amusement that was almost tender. His eyes lit up by his smile. Any woman in the world would have pardoned Sir Lancelot for that smile. Rosalind certainly was not proof against it. Forgive me, he repeated again, more gently. I do, she said, but only because I'm pleased to see that, after so many centuries, you still have a sense of humour. It is about all I have left. His mind seemed to wander to some reflection that deeply saddened him, but he wrenched his attention back to Rosalind. So if thou wilt not be guardian angel, nor even my lady of the lake, then what may I call thee? I am Lady Rosalind Carlion. She started to curtsy and extend her hand, then pulled back, remembering the futility of such a gesture. I am one of the guests of this inn. Travelling through Cornwall in search of legends. Yes. I know it must sound odd to you, because I'm sure ladies did not do such things in your day. They didn't have to look for legends. They lived them. Such a pursuit is not even normal for ladies in my time. But my own papa was an Arthurian scholar. I suppose I inherited the madness from him. To come to Cornwall... To actually see Tintagel, where Arthur was born, and find the magic lake where he received Excalibur. It's a journey I've always dreamed of making, ever since I was a little girl. She added wistfully, I just never imagined I would have to make it alone. Your father, he is gone now? Lancelot asked. They all are. Mama, Papa. 
She could not quite suppress the small catch in her voice. And I lost my husband only last year. I am sorry, he said. You, thou art full young to be a widow, all alone in the world. Hast thou no brothers or sisters? No, I've no one. She ducked her head, fearing that she might be revealing more than she should. Her husband had always worried that she was far too trusting of strangers, showing a lamentable tendency to confide in anyone who showed her the smallest kindness. He'd begged her to be more circumspect. Did that warning also extend to sympathetic ghosts? Rosalind felt something brush her, as though a soft breeze stirred her hair. She glanced up to discover Sir Lancelot attempting to touch her, to comfort her. Quite impossible, of course. Looking frustrated and helpless, he allowed his hand to drift back to his side. Her eyes locked with his. In that instant, Rosalind felt a jolt of recognition, a connection so strong she was at a loss to explain it a feeling that he understood her grief completely, because he, too, knew what it was like to be all alone. The longer that Rosalind gazed into his eyes, the more she was certain. Sir Lancelot du Lac was no stranger to her. She'd known him all her life, through the tales and legends, known of his nobility, his courage, his chivalry, known him as well as her own dear Arthur. She could see that all her talk of having no one had saddened him, and she could not allow that. Sir Lancelot had enough sorrow of his own to bear. Seeking to cheer him, Rosalind rallied behind a bright smile. Of course, I'm not entirely alone, she said. I keep forgetting Miranda and Clotilde. You speak of some pets, my lady? Thy dogs, perhaps? No, my late husband's maiden aunts. I live with them now. Although, she grimaced, it's not always proved the happiest of arrangements. Lancelot frowned. They are cruel to thee, my lady? Oh, no. They're very worthy women, but they have strict ideas of how a widow should behave. Rosalind flushed guiltily as she confessed. They have no idea of why I really took this journey. They think I've gone off very properly to visit one of my husband's elderly cousins residing in Conway, which I shall do presently. I've only taken a slight detour en route. Thy secret is quite safe with me, my lady, Sir Lancelot assured her solemnly, but his eyes twinkled. Thank you. Rosalind's mouth twisted into a rueful smile. Otherwise I might find myself summoned back to Kent to resume knitting socks and distributing jars of calves' foot jelly to the deserving poor. And I make such dreadful jelly. You've no notion how fast the poor folk in our village have learned to run when they see me coming with my basket. Lancelot chuckled, the sound deep and warm, as charming as his smile. He needed to laugh. Rosalind felt certain of that. She was delighted to have amused him, but worried that she might have given the wrong impression. It's not that I dislike helping the poor, she hastened to add, only I should prefer to do something more useful than poisoning people with my jelly. I don't want you to think that I'm callous or hard-hearted. As if I ever would, my lady. He continued to smile, but his eyes rested tenderly on her. I know full well thou could never be aught but kind. Rosalind blushed, feeling absurdly pleased by the compliment. You've only just met me, she protested. You couldn't possibly know if I'm kind. Could I not? He quoted softly. Is she kind as she is fair? For beauty lives with kindness. Love doth to her eyes repair to help him of his blindness and being helped inhabits there. 
That's lovely, Rosalind said, though she wasn't certain if she meant the verse or the rich timbre of his voice. It drifted over her warm as a caress, leaving her oddly breathless. That's from Shakespeare, isn't it? I recognize... She broke off, confusion flooding her. But Shakespeare wasn't even born until long after you... you... How could you possibly know his work? The question appeared to discompose Lancelot for a moment. Then he said, Oh, I... I have drifted through many places and times since my death. I missed the troubadours of Camelot so greatly that I frequently hovered near the globe, absorbing the poetry of this bard you call Shakespeare. Then you've not always... Rosalind hesitated, fearing he might be offended by the word haunted. You've not always lingered in Cornwall? Ah, no, my lady. I fear I have ever been a most restless spirit, just a lost soul doomed to rove the earth forever. His words troubled her, filled her mind with images of him wandering through the ages, heart sore, weary, never able to find peace. Doomed? she asked. But why? As atonement for my sins, I suppose. You were the bravest of Arthur's knights. I can't believe you did anything that would merit a punishment as dreadful as this. What sin did you commit? Far too many. The worst being that I fell in love with the wrong woman. Oh. He had to mean Guinevere, his ill-fated passion for King Arthur's beautiful queen. It was the most romantic and tragic tale Rosalind had ever heard. She'd poured over the story many times, had wondered what it would be like to be swept away by such tempestuous emotion. Of course, she'd loved her own husband, loved Arthur for as long as she could remember. But that wasn't exactly the same as falling in love, tumbling head over ears at first sight. To know a passion such as that, she mused aloud, so powerful and strong it burns bright throughout the ages. How could such a love ever be wrong? Very easily, Lancelot said bitterly. When such passion is purchased at the price of one's honor, the betrayal of another man by bedding his wife. But you were a man in love. Surely your reason was overcome. I was an adulterer. And that's the plain, ugly truth of the matter. The harshness of his voice caused Rosalind to flinch from him. He added more quietly, A man always has a choice, my lady, and when he makes the wrong one, he must suffer the consequences. Unfortunately, the innocent suffer along with him. And that is the true sin that condemns him forever. His words left Rosalind a little bewildered, with only one thing clear to her, the degree of pain she saw buried in his eyes. Whatever sins he spoke of, no judgment of heaven could condemn him more cruelly than Sir Lancelot condemned himself. He fell silent, lost in his own black thoughts. He seemed to forget she was there. Rosalind stood aside, not knowing what to say by way of comfort, acutely feeling her ignorance. Sin, passion, the torment of regret. She had no more experience of such things than if she'd been a novitiate at a convent. Lancelot said darkly, And as if I had not committed enough folly for one lifetime, now I needs must lose that infernal sword. Rosalind had been trying to remain unobtrusive, but her ears pricked up at this last remark. A sword, she repeated in astonishment. Then you truly are looking for one? You were not jesting about that? No. How I wish to God I were. 
there was only one fabled sword that Rosalind had ever heard tell of. Surely you can't be speaking of Excalibur. She pronounced the very name with awe. What? Oh, uh, yes, Excalibur, he replied distractedly. But I thought when King Arthur died, the sword was returned to the waters of the lake. I wish that's where the thing was. Maybe if the blade was sunk back to the bottom, I would finally know some peace. But there will be precious little rest for me until I find that blasted sword. Rosalind pressed her hand to her brow, feeling as though all of this was beginning to get a bit much, even for her to absorb. I don't understand at all, she said. What were you doing with Excalibur? I am supposed to be the guardian of the sword. Until, until the day my liege returns. But I allowed myself to be set upon by a thief. Now the sword has fallen into the hands of who knows what sort of villain. And I have to get it back. This was an aspect of the legend Rosalind had never come across. But before she could question him further, Sir Lancelot's attention focused sharply elsewhere. He stared in the direction of the window, an expression of horror chasing across his features. Damnation, he said. What is it? Rosalind asked uneasily, glancing that way herself. But she remarked nothing beyond the fact that the sky had begun to lighten with the first streaks of dawn. He twisted back to her, apologizing for having cursed in her presence. I must leave thee, fair lady. Oh, no, she cried. There is still so much I need to ask you. Must you go so soon? I fear I must. The sun has nigh arisen, and it could be dangerous for me to be drifting abroad in the daylight. Even fatal. Fatal? Rosalind blinked in astonishment. How much more fatal could it be? The man was already dead. But all thought of that was swept aside as he hovered near the window, preparing to depart. I thank thee for thy kindness. I would beg to salute thee properly, my lady. He smiled sadly. All I can do is bid thee farewell. Rosalind darted forward anxiously. Oh, please, wait. You must at least tell me. Will I ever... But he was already fading, dissolving through the window, his eyes shimmering with regret. Ever see you again? Rosalind finished in a small voice. She walked toward the window and peered out for a last glimpse of him. Her heart quickened as she thought she detected a movement, a passing shadow set against the pearl-grey sky. But it turned out to be no more than a flock of gulls wheeling seaward. Sir Lancelot was gone. She would likely never see him again. The thought brought a curious ache to her heart. But as the sun broke over the horizon, dispelling night and all its mystery, Rosalind could not help but doubt her own senses. Perhaps she had only been dreaming, walking abroad in her sleep, or her too vivid imagination had once more regained command of her. The rich fantasy life she had led as a child had often worried her parents, even Papa. For him, the study of the Arthurian legends had been an intellectual exercise. But to Rosalind... Tonight was not the first time she had entertained a vision of Sir Lancelot. She'd frequently laid out her miniature cups and saucers in the garden, serving up tea to Lancelot, Sir Bedivere and Sir Gawain, her favourites among the round table knights, sharing her cake with them on Tuesdays. Wednesdays the fairies came calling, and Fridays had always been reserved for the little family of gnomes that lived beneath the hedgerows. Rosalind smiled regretfully at the memory. She dallied too much, perhaps, in the realms of her own fancy. But what else was a little girl supposed to do? She'd no one to play with, often retreating into her imagination out of sheer loneliness. Was that what she'd done tonight? 
felt so desperately alone that she had once more resurrected Sir Lancelot to keep her company. But he was far different from the knight of her childhood. A vague figure, tall and noble, more like a charming older brother. The being that she had recently conjured up was not likely to arouse sisterly feelings in any woman's breast. Not with those handsome features, broad shoulders and sinewy arms. The generous mouth, sensual and sensitive. The changeable dark eyes, one moment bold with laughter, the next soft with regret. The deep timbered voice that both teased and caressed. Could even her imagination be that good? Rosalind reflected. And besides, Jenny had seen him too. Jenny! Oh, dear Lord! Rosalind murmured as remembrance shafted through her. She had left the girl alone all this time, waiting for her. If Rosalind did not want to be caught up in a welter of cumbersome explanations, she'd better get below stairs post-haste. Whirling about, Rosalind darted away from the window only to strike her bare toes up against something hard. She stifled a gasp of pain and stumbled, hopping about on one foot until she found a chair to sag down upon. Raising up her foot, she examined the throbbing member, gingerly wiggling her big toe. It didn't appear broken, but she wagered it would be black and blue by the morrow. She glanced reproachfully down at the object that had tripped her. A floorboard, so loose it had actually come dislodged. She really ought to have a discussion with Mr. Braggs about the sad condition of his storeroom. But then that would involve an awkward accounting of what she'd been doing here in the first place. Rosalind knelt to replace the board when the gleam of something beneath caught her eye. She squinted closer, discovering that the entire board shifted rather easily, exposing a space beneath the floor, a hiding place for... Rosalind's breath snagged in her throat. She rocked back on her heels, staring, dazed by the object she had uncovered. A sword of unsurpassed beauty, with a hilt of finely wrought gold, a dazzling crystal mounted into the pummel, for long moments she knelt there, not daring even to touch the weapon. With shaking fingers, Rosalind reached for the hilt and tugged the sword from its place of concealment. Not an easy task, for the blade was heavy, a magnificent length of steel forged from fables and dreams. In a time long ago, and a place far away. Rosalind raised the weapon to the light, the brilliance of the crystal almost blinding her, sparking a rainbow shower across the dark wood walls. Her heart thundered with a feeling of awe and triumph. She was now certain she hadn't imagined one moment of this magical night, not one precious second she'd spent in the company of Sir Lancelot du Lac. It had all been wondrously real. She had seen him, and she was fully confident she would see him again, because she had found it. She had found what he was looking for. Excalibur. Chapter Two Lance was in trouble. The realization shot through Val St. Ledger like a blaze of gunfire, startling him awake. He sat bolt upright in his bed, heart pounding, caught somewhere in the shadowy world between consciousness and sleep. With trembling fingers, he raked back his dark curling hair from eyes creased with pain and care that went well beyond his twenty-seven years. Staring about him, he sought to make sense of his situation, sprawled on top of the counterpane, sweating with fear, clad in his breeches and shirt. His bleary-eyed gaze fell upon a trail of papers and books scattered from bed to carpet to nightstand, where the remains of a burned-out candle pooled over a silver holder in a congealed lump of wax. He'd done it again, Val realized. 
stayed up too late poring over his studies until he'd fallen asleep, only to be awakened by a nightmare? No, more of an alarming sense that Lance was in some kind of danger. An irrational thought, because he had no reason to suppose that Lance was not burrowed deep beneath his sheets, sleeping off whatever excesses he'd indulged at the Midsummer's Eve fair. By all rights, Val should have gone with his brother, but he didn't particularly care for the company Lance chose to keep these days. He knew Lance had likely been carousing with that Rafe Mortmain again. The thought alone was enough to render Val uneasy. Somehow he feared that Lance wasn't back safe in his bed. It was only a feeling, but he was too much of a St. Ledger to ignore it. His intuitions regarding his twin had never been wrong before. Swinging his legs over the side of the bed, he winced at the stab of pain behind his right knee. He groped for his cane and hobbled off a few steps, trying to work some of the stiffness out of the joint before he limped from the room. The hall beyond his chamber appeared grey and misty in the early morning stillness. None of the household were even up yet and stirring. Val heard nothing beyond the soft click of his cane and the anxious hitch of his own breathing as he made his way toward the bedchamber of his older brother. Older only in the sense that he and Lance were separated by the span of a day. Lance had charged into the world seconds before the stroke of midnight, while Val had lingered, not putting in his appearance until the next morning. Lance had often tormented him about that, suggesting that Val was so busy daydreaming, even in their mother's womb, that he couldn't manage to be born on time. But that had been back in the days when there had been a great deal of jesting between him and his brother, Val reflected sadly. Back before Lance's restless urges had taken him so far from Castle Ledger, before the injury that had left Val crippled in one leg. Now his cane, light and slender as it was, seemed to cast a long shadow between them. Leaning heavily on the ivory-handled walking stick, Val knocked on Lance's door. When there was no response, he rapped again. Louder this time. Lance, he called, praying to be rewarded with a curse. Lance's growl to get the devil away and let him sleep. But there was nothing, only the silence that sharpened Val's intuition that something was wrong, driving it deeper into his heart. He reached for the doorknob, knowing that Lance would not welcome either his concern or his intrusion. The thought hurt worse than his throbbing knee, but it did not deter him. Shoving open the door, he crept inside. Morning didn't seem to have reached Lance's room yet, the heavy crimson and gold draperies shutting out most of the light. Adjusting his eyes to the semi-darkness, he looked about for any sign that his brother had come home last night, anything that would reassure him. But all the evidence he needed lay waiting on the four-poster bed, and the sight was far from reassuring. Val's breath caught in his throat as he shuffled forward to peer down at the figure stretched out on the mattress. Lance's dark hair fanned across the pillow, his arms folded across his chest, his body encased in what appeared to be a black tunic and a shirt of chain mail. But it wasn't the strangeness of his brother's attire that caused Val's heart to still. It was the way Lance lay there, so cursed pale, not moving, not breathing, looking for all the world like a stone effigy carved upon some medieval knight's tomb, looking exactly like he was, dead. This wasn't the first time he'd ever seen his brother in this trance-like state, but it never failed to alarm him. Val had done extensive studies on the St. Ledger family, the supernatural talents that had cropped up generation after generation, a strange history of diviners, fortune-tellers, mind-readers, and even unusually gifted healers like Val himself. But Val had never come across any power that awed or terrified him more than this one of Lance's, this ability to separate body from soul, to send the spirit soaring out into the night while flesh, bone and sinew remained behind. Night drifting, Lance had always called it. Dangerous was Val's term for it because no one knew how long Lance could safely maintain such a separation, or even what would happen if Lance was ever caught with his spirit abroad in the full light of day. Hoping that the morning was not as advanced as he supposed, Val stumped to the window. Twitching aside the curtains, he saw the sun hovering just below the horizon, 
the first rays of light beginning to streak across the garden below. His heart sickened with dread. Val limped back to his brother's bedside. Bending down, he caught up one of Lance's hands. Sweet Lord, the fingers already felt stiff and cold, colder than Val had ever known any living flesh to be. He couldn't begin to guess how long Lance had been gone this time. Too long, Val feared, judging from the chilled feel of his skin. Damn it, Lance, not even you can be this reckless. Get back here, now, Val muttered, chafing his brother's hand, trying to infuse some of his own heat into those icy fingers. He glanced about him, desperate for something to do. More blankets, perhaps. If he piled enough on Lance, maybe he could retain what warmth remained in his brother's body until he returned. And if he did not? Val refused even to consider that possibility. Moving over to the wardrobe, he began to rummage for a heavy cloak or anything that he could find. Caught up in his task, he never noticed the curtains stir, as though shifted by a light breeze, or the ghost-like form that shimmered into the room. For one brief moment, Lance St. Ledger hovered over his bed, experiencing the eerie sensation of staring down at his own body. He hesitated, bracing himself. The rejoining was never pleasant, but he had a strong presentiment it was going to be worse than usual this time. He was right. As he cast himself downward, it felt like striking a sheet of ice, his body rigid and unwelcoming. He strained with all the force of his will until the ice cracked, plunging him into a chilling river of darkness. He remained mercifully numb for several seconds before he became aware of his hands and his feet, snapping around him like manacles, holding his restless spirit fast. The sensation spread up his legs, over his thighs, along his arms, across his shoulders, each limb binding him ever tighter, until he felt entombed. There was no air. He couldn't breathe. Panic clawed at Lance, and he writhed, struggling against the suffocating confines of his own flesh. His heart, which had been barely beating, kicked into motion with a furious thud. His entire body jerked spasmodically as his lungs filled with air. He sank back against the mattress, drawing in grateful breaths. Slowly his heart resumed its steady rhythm, returning warmth to his chilled frame. Damn, that had been a narrow escape. But he was back, safe in his own skin. Although it was a mixed blessing, as Lance became aware of sensations he'd escaped when he had shed his all-too-human flesh hours before. The sour smell of his own sweat the sore muscles protesting the weight of the blasted armour, the dull headache left from that blow he'd taken down on the beach. He tried to hold himself very still, not wanting to move, to even think. An impossibility, because he couldn't help reflecting on the night he'd just passed. A strange one, even by St. Ledger standards, getting attacked and robbed near his own village, drifting all over in search of the culprit, trying to recover that wretched sword and to top it all off, being mistaken for the ghost of Sir Lancelot du Lac. That last memory was the only one he found pleasant enough to dwell upon. His meeting with the Lady Rosalind. Between the two of them, he questioned who had been the more startled by their encounter. He had been, he believed. She'd appeared to glide out of a ring of candlelight, walking straight through him with a sense of innocence and wonder, such as he had not felt for a long time. And he had felt it. He, who never felt any sort of physical sensation when he was in this drifting state. He could hardly be blamed for the first thought that had popped into his head, that he'd stumbled upon a spirit himself. For what kind of mortal woman went prowling about a strange inn in the dead of night, looking for ghosts? One that was either amazingly brave or completely mad. He'd come to the conclusion that Rosalind Carlyon must be a bit of both. After she'd blundered into him, she hadn't run off shrieking as any sane person would. No, she'd lingered until dawn, engaging him in the most earnest conversation. Quite mad. But if the lady was, then what did that make him? He had lingered as well, and at the peril of his own life, quite forgetting the time. 
that he should have spent those last precious moments of darkness searching for the sword. It was as though the woman had cast a spell upon him, softening the hard edges of his soul. He'd felt unusually gentle toward her, moved by the hint of sadness behind her smile, the plight of one widowed far too young. A mere slip of a girl in her white linen nightgown and bare feet. She'd seemed badly in need of a champion, and he'd enjoyed playing the hero for her. Too much, perhaps. It had all started out as a mere expedient, a way to avoid awkward explanations for who and what he was. But he'd gotten a trifle carried away. Lance winced at the memory of the nonsense he'd spun out for Rosalind, about being doomed to wander the earth in atonement for his sins, the great wrong he'd done by loving another man's wife, damaging his honour beyond all repair. Nonsense that had skimmed uncomfortably close to truth, until he was no longer certain whom he'd been talking about. Lancelot du Lac or Lance St. Ledger? He'd talked a great deal too much, raking up memories he was determined to forget. Now, safely back in his own bed, he had no idea what the devil had come over him. Maybe it was doubly dangerous going night drifting after he'd taken such a whack to the head. All he wanted to do with his aching muscles and throbbing skull was lie there and die quietly. But that privilege was clearly going to be denied him, for he realized he was not alone in the room. A floorboard creaked by his bed. Someone, someone was actually tucking him in, dragging some heavy garment over him all the way up to his chin, forcing his eyes to half-mast. Lance squinted through the thickness of his lashes, at the person bending over him. He focused on a face not identical, but similar to his own. The same hawk-like nose, only straighter, the same deep brown eyes, only gentler, the same square jaw, except for the faint indentation in the chin, a leaner, more careworn version of himself. Val. Lance had thought it could not be possible for him to feel any more wretched than he already did. He was wrong. With his brother's presence, any hope of keeping the folly of this latest escapade to himself faded to nothing. Suppressing a groan, Lance shut his eyes tight. The movement, slight as it was, must have been enough to draw his brother's attention, for Val leaned closer, whispering, Lance, are you there? Lance, answer me. Lance popped his eyes open, wincing at the full stab of daylight. Yes, I'm here, he growled. There's no damn need to shout. Val's pale features flooded with relief. Thank God you made it back. You're all right. That was entirely a matter of opinion, Lance thought dourly. He started to demand what Val was doing, creeping about his room at such an hour, but the answer was all too evident from the rumpled state of Val's clothing, the haggard look on his face. His brother had obviously been sitting up with him for half the night, maintaining a sleepless vigil over Lance while he drifted. How the blazes did Val even know he had gone? Another stupid question. Lance gave a disgruntled sigh. Of course Val knew when he was in any kind of trouble. He always did. Trembling from the force of his relief... Val dragged a shaky hand back through his mass of wavy black hair. I thought you'd really done it this time. Turned yourself into a permanent ghost. For one awful moment, I really feared you were... were... dead? Lance supplied, when his brother couldn't bring himself to say the word. He struggled up onto one elbow, shoving aside the fur-trimmed greatcoat Val had draped over him. So what were you planning to do with this? Lay me out in it? I would have preferred my black riding cloak. It would go better with the armour, don't you think? Don't jest, Lance. This is nothing to laugh about. Do I look as though I'm laughing? Lance hauled himself into a sitting position and swung his legs over the side of the bed, grimacing at the fresh pain that shot up his spine. Lord, he felt like he'd been sleeping on a bed of nails. Pressing one hand to the small of his back, he grumbled, Remind me next time I put myself into a trance not to do it wearing chainmail. Why did you do it at all? Wear the chainmail? 
If you'd bothered to attend the fair, you would have known there was supposed to be this mock tournament. Blast it, Lance. A look of reproach flashed in Val's eyes. You know what I meant. Why were you drifting? You weren't even careful to get back before daybreak. Do you have any idea how close you cut it this time? He limped to the window and flung the curtain open wider. Lance cursed, flinging up one hand to shield his eyes from the burst of light. A little disturbed himself to see how far the sunrise had advanced. Damn, he murmured. I really did linger too long talking to my Lady of the Lake. What? The Lady of the Lake, he repeated, smiling in spite of his misery. Rosalind's memory dancing across his mind. A most wondrous enchantress, with hair spun from a braid of moonlight and eyes the colour of heaven. She cast a spell on me. His voice softened. His expression must have undergone some odd change as well, for Val stared at him as though he'd lost his mind. His brother stumped anxiously toward him. Lance, maybe you'd better lie back down. You don't seem quite yourself. I'm fine, Lance said, rubbing his brow. Just a little dizzy from sitting up too fast. When Val continued to hover over him with an expression of deep concern, Lance sought to explain Rosalind in more rational terms, perhaps to himself as well. There was this pretty young widow stopping over at the dragon's fire. When I was out drifting, we sort of bumped into each other. An outsider? Caught you night drifting? Yes, but it's all right. She thought I was the ghost of Sir Lancelot du Lac. Why would she think a thing like that? Most likely because I told her I was. Val's frown deepened. The idea of lying for any reason was incomprehensible to Lance's honest brother. So you were using your power to woo this woman? He asked in a troubled tone. What a delicate way of putting it, Lance mocked. Do you mean, was I planning to seduce her? He paused, considering the possibility himself. It would certainly go a long way to explain the depth of his attraction. And yet the thought of bed games and his lady Rosalind, it almost seemed profane. No, Lance admitted at last. I wasn't seeking some clever ploy to lure her between the sheets. She wasn't that sort of lady. She was more your kind. Mine, Val echoed. Yes, the maiden fair that you ride out to slay dragons for and return to, kneel in homage at her feet. Lance was amused to see a hint of red creep across his solemn brother's high cheekbones. And most certainly, the kind of lady who should be kept far away from a lying rogue like me, Lance concluded. Which she will be. The lovely widow will continue on her journey today, none the worse for my little jest, and I shall never see her again. The thought sent an unexpected pang through him, but Lance was quick to thrust the emotion aside. He dragged himself to his feet and was heartened to discover that he could stand without pitching forward onto his face. Brushing past Val, he fought his way out of the chainmail, an arduous and painful process, but when the heavy shirt dropped to the carpet, Lance issued a groan of pure relief. Even his headache had subsided to a faint throb, and he began to feel as though he might want to live after all. If he could only get rid of Val. But his brother threatened to become a permanent fixture in his bedchamber. Rooted to the spot, resting both hands on his cane, Val studied him with a thoughtful intensity Lance found damned uncomfortable. And that was your only reason for drifting again? he asked. To play a jest on this poor, unsuspecting lady? What other reason could there possibly be? Lance replied, but he could tell from Val's grave expression he wasn't fooled. Val knew perfectly well that something else was wrong. Lance had always been good at dissembling, evading, handing out bags of moonshine with a charming smile. But it never worked with Val, and he wondered why he even bothered to try. That was the trouble with a man who knew you literally from the womb, Lance thought, as he sank back down on the edge of the bed to tug off his boots. He managed to get one off. Val simply stood there, silent, patient, waiting. Lance flung the boot to the carpet with a resigned sigh. Fine. If you must know, I went drifting because it seemed the best way to search for something I lost. What could you possibly have lost that would be worth risking your life for? 
the St. Ledger's sword. Val's mouth fell open. Not, not the Prospero sword, he faltered. The one with the crystal in the hilt. The very one. As Val sagged down into the nearest chair he could find, Lance proceeded to relate the circumstances of the entire evening. Not sparing himself in the process, his own stupidity in using the valuable weapon as a costume prop, flashing it about the village square as though the age's old sword were some tinker's trinket, drinking far too much ale at the Dragon's Fire Inn, weaving his way alone down the darkened beach, allowing himself to be surprised and taken down without even putting up a fight. He told his story in a flat, indifferent tone, all the while reflecting that he'd been trying for years to destroy his brother's persistent faith in him. This should finally do it, for there was no one more steeped in the legends and history of the St. Ledger family than Val was. He set a far higher value on that sword than Lance ever could. And yet, as he concluded his tale, Lance read no sign of condemnation in Val's features. My God, Lance, he breathed, you could have been killed. He had lost the St. Ledger sword, and that was all Val was worried about? Lance scowled at his brother, torn between annoyance and amazement. That would have been no great loss, I assure you, he said. Then you could have inherited Castle Ledger. I don't want to inherit Castle Ledger, Val replied quietly. What a coincidence, neither do I. Lance removed his other boot with a savage tug and slammed it down. Ever since he'd regained consciousness to find that sword gone, he'd been calling himself every kind of blockhead imaginable. It would have been a relief to have someone else take up the task. But his brother was not about to oblige him. Val didn't even look angry. You said you didn't get a good look at the man who attacked you, he asked. No, I was too drunk, Lance said bluntly. I would have been lucky to recognize my own hand if I'd held it in front of my face. Do you think it could have been one of those smugglers that have been operating off the coast of late? Smugglers don't usually ply their trade under a full moon, and with a fair going on within shouting distance. No, this was nothing but a common footpad. Footpads in our village, Val mused, with a doleful shake of his head. Thieves operating within the boundary of St. Ledger lands. We never had anything like that happen before, before... Val hesitated with an uneasy glance in Lance's direction, but Lance was sure he understood his brother well enough. Before father went away, he finished, with a hard edge to his voice, before I was left in charge here. No, I didn't mean anything like that, but I'm afraid what I did mean you will like even less. He fretted with his cane handle before continuing. I was going to say that we'd never seemed to have much trouble here before. Before Rafe Mortmain's return. Lance stared at his brother, dumbfounded. Rafe? What's Rafe got to do with any of this? Nothing, I hope. I just can't help wondering, where was he when all of this was going on last night? I don't know. We parted company early in the evening. Rafe had to ride out on patrol. He received some sort of tip that... Lance broke off, frowning at the implications of his brother's question. You can't think that Rafe had anything to do with the attack on me. Good Lord, the man is a customs officer, charged with protecting the coast. Still, Rafe's involvement is a possibility that has to be considered, Val returned gravely. I'll be damned if it does. What the devil would Rafe Mortmain want with my sword? Everyone knows the St. Ledger sword is invested with some sort of unusual power. And power is something the Mortmains have always coveted. Bloody nonsense, Lance growled. He shot to his feet, slapping his thigh with a gesture of pure disgust. We're not going to play this game, Val. What game? his brother asked, clearly bewildered. The favourite St. Ledger pastime for generations. When something goes wrong, let's find a Mortmain to blame it on. There is a good reason for that. If you'd ever studied the history between our two families, as I have, I've no interest in ancient history. Not so ancient, Val reminded him. Rafe's own mother once plotted to murder both our parents. And the woman paid for it with her life, Lance said impatiently. That all happened long before either of us was even born, and Rafe was only a child himself. 
I'm sure he feels no great love for Evelyn Mortmain either. The woman abandoned him in Paris. Or so he says, Val murmured. And, Lance went on, tersely ignoring the interruption, I don't believe either of our parents ever perceived Rafe as a threat. They allowed him to live with us that one summer he was sixteen. Until you almost drowned in the Maiden Lake. That was an accident, Lance said. How many times do I have to tell people that? I recall quite clearly that it was my own fault that I slipped and fell in. It was Rafe who pulled me back to safety. He saved my life that day. It seemed to me that he only dived in to do so when father and I rode into sight. Then your memory is greatly at fault, like everyone else's round here, too blasted ready to suspect the man of any crime simply because of his family's reputation. Bad cess to all Mortmains, Lance sneered out the St. Ledger family toast for generations. Well, excuse me if I don't raise my glass. I have only ever known one Mortmain, and he happens to be my friend. Friends shouldn't bring out the worst in each other. Val persisted. And exactly what the devil is that supposed to mean? Val examined the tip of his cane, looking sad and thoughtful. Only that I have observed there is a darkness in Rafe Mortmain, and he seems to bring that darkness out in others. I can scarce explain it, but you are different in his company somehow. More hardened, more cynical, more reckless. Lance shook his head, finding his brother completely unbelievable. When are you going to get it through that hard head of yours? He demanded harshly. No one influences me. If I act like an irresponsible rake when I'm with Rafe, it's because that's what I bloody well am. Striding over to his wardrobe, Lance tore off the remains of his sweat-stained costume, the chill morning air in his room cooling his bared flesh, but not his temper. As he wrenched open the wardrobe door, flinging garments about until he found his dressing gown. He wasn't entirely sure why he was so blasted angry, because Val was attempting to put doubts in his mind about a man he liked and admired, or because he'd offered Val proof time and time again of his own worthlessness, and yet his brother was still at it. Always determined to forgive him, make excuses for him, find someone else to blame his folly on. Lance shrugged himself into the robe, knotting the belt with a savage tug. Behind him, he heard Val struggle to his feet. I'm sorry, Lance, he said quietly. Oh, great. Now, as usual, Val was apologizing for him. Lance gritted his teeth. You are right, of course, Val continued. I should be ashamed of suspecting a man merely because of the misdeeds of his ancestors. I'm sure there are many far more likely suspects we should be questioning. Lance whipped round to glare at his brother. What do you mean, we? Naturally, I assumed... You assumed wrong, Lance interrupted, slamming the wardrobe door shut with a brutal kick. Every time I get myself into some sort of trouble, I don't need you charging to the rescue. I'm not. I only... Nor do I need you wearing yourself to a shadow, mounting sleepless vigils at my bedside like some overprotective nursemaid. I didn't, Val protested. Lance, I only wanted to help. I think you've helped me more than enough for one lifetime, brother, don't you? He dropped his gaze significantly toward Val's injured leg. Val flinched. He limped over to the window, but not swiftly enough to conceal the flash of hurt in his eyes. Then again, it was so easy to hurt Val. There was practically no art to it. As his brother gazed down at the garden below, the sunlight played across Val's tired countenance, exposing every pain-etched furrow that marred his youthful features. Lance thought he could almost count every one of those lines he was responsible for. Damn near all of them. A man always has a choice, my lady, and when he makes the wrong one... He must suffer the consequences. Unfortunately, the innocent suffer along with him. The words Lance had spoken to Rosalind came back to haunt him. He told her he had to wander the earth to pay for his sins. But in reality, he didn't have to wander very far. Merely being around Val was like being forced to wear a hair shirt. 
Lance's anger melted away, the all-too-familiar guilt taking its place, chafing him raw. He wondered for perhaps the millionth time what had ever possessed him to come back here. Perhaps because after the victory at Waterloo, the final defeat of Bonaparte, Lance had simply run out of excuses for remaining with the army and staying away from home. As the oldest son and heir, it had been more than time for Lance to cease his rambling, to settle at Castle Ledger and learn to assume the responsibilities that would one day be his, to become the kind of man his entire family presumed him to be, not the kind of man that he was. And there was such a damnably wide gulf between the two. He stalked over to the pitcher and basin perched on the washstand, pouring out some cold water to dash against his face, as though he could somehow cleanse his guilt away and his ill humour along with it. The icy liquid stung his bare skin awake, and he felt better for it, until he caught a glimpse of himself in the small mirror mounted above the washstand. Lance grimaced, wondering what his Lady of the Lake would think if she could see her bold Sir Lancelot now, in his all-too-human form, badly in want of a bath and a shave, his hair a disordered tangle, dark shadows beneath his eyes, that hard, ugly set to his mouth. A dishonoured knight. He didn't know why such a foolish phrase should pop into his head, but it suited him amazingly well. He toweled his face dry, slicking the damp ends of his hair back before coming about to deal with his brother. He still wanted nothing so much as to tell Val to get out and leave him alone. Instead, he heard himself saying gruffly, Look, Val, don't worry about the sword. I'll find the damn thing, even if I have to ride to hell and back. Val gave a sad smile. I know you will. So you don't need to exhaust yourself worrying about it, or me. You should go back to bed, try to get some sleep. You look worse than I do, which is saying a lot. Yes, it is, Val agreed with a weak laugh. But I want you to understand one thing. I didn't wear myself to a shadow, as you put it, keeping watch over you while you drifted. I only came into your room a short while ago. There was another reason I was up most of the night. Lance was relieved to hear it. It eased a little of the guilt, he felt. Although he groused, Not your infernal books again. I know Mamma always hoped to make at least one of us a scholar. But she wouldn't want you killing yourself over some musty old volume, either. I know that. But it's so aggravating. I've been working so hard to compile a complete history of our family, hoping to have it done before father and mother return. Val limped off a few steps, the movement conveying his frustration. He waxed passionate on few subjects, but this was one of them. I've gone through every archive, every record, every history of Cornwall I can find, and yet... He checked himself, casting an apologetic look at Lance. Well, I know you're not interested. That's never stopped you before. Val gave a sheepish laugh. No, I suppose it hasn't. He sighed and continued. It's that blasted Prospero. How can I complete a history of the St. Ledgers when I can find so little information about the man who supposedly founded our family? It's as though practically every mention of him has been deliberately erased. It probably has been, Lance shrugged. A knight who was rumoured to have been a sorcerer, reckless, making ill use of his power, seducing every woman within sight. Hell fire, he sounds a lot like me. They'll likely expunge my name after I'm dead, too. Not if I can help it, Val retorted. Seriously, Lance, don't you ever wonder what kind of man could have spawned a family as unusual as ours? What was his life really like? Was he happy? He was burnt at the stake. That would tend to make a man damned unhappy. I mean before that. For all the intelligence, all the power he was supposed to have possessed, was he content? Out of all those women he was said to have had, was there never one that meant more to him than the others? If only Mamma hadn't driven his spirit away, I could have asked him. That was but another of his family's many legends, Lance thought wryly. That Prospero's ghost had once haunted the old keep. He had supposedly been exorcised, not by Lance's formidable father, but by his petite, flame-haired mother, Madeline St. Ledger, 
was a practical woman, holding firm sway over one fierce husband and five unruly children. She wasn't the sort to tolerate the peace of her home being disrupted by the spirit of a mischievous sorcerer. Lance folded his arms across his chest, regarding his earnest brother with amusement. Even if Prospero's ghost was still hanging about, what do you think he'd do? Invite you to crack a bottle of port while he discussed his amours with you? I suppose not, Val conceded, but it would please me to know that he eventually found someone, that he didn't end up dying embittered alone. Lance couldn't begin to imagine why Val should even care, that this was a side of his brother he'd never fully understood. You're an incurable romantic. That's what comes of a man being born on St. Valentine's Day. Perhaps it is. I fear I've been thinking too much lately about matters such as... Val's eyes skittered away from Lance, staring fixedly down at the carpet in a way that aroused Lance's curiosity. It wasn't like Val to be evasive or secretive about anything. Thinking about matters such as what? he prodded. Oh, about being alone, being in love. He avoided looking at Lance, toying with the tip of his cane for so long it began to work on Lance's nerves. He was on the verge of closing his hand over Val's to still his infernal fidgeting when Val finally confessed, It's not the books that have been keeping me awake at night, Lance. It's something else. I think my time has come. Your time for what? Val flushed bright red. To take a wife. Lance stared at him, always so absorbed with his books, his writings, the medical studies he was engaged in with the local doctor, Marius St. Ledger. Val had never even evinced any interest in the ladies. Not in that way. In fact, there were even times when Lance wondered if his saintly brother might not still be a virgin. Squirming with embarrassment, Val went on. You remember the discussion Father had with us that one autumn day in his study about marriage and... and women? Vaguely, since I already knew all about the fairer sex, I fear I paid little attention. I did. And I remember well what he said about how a St. Ledger male knows when his time has come to mate. The sleepless nights, the fire in the blood, the restlessness, the almost unbearable feeling of longing. I have all those symptoms, Lance. Lance rolled his eyes. From the misery in his face, Val might have been speaking of some fatal disease. And as for these so-called symptoms of his, they weren't any different from what Lance himself had lately. Lance stiffened, oddly disquieted by the unexpected comparison. He was quick to dismiss it, resting his hand on Val's shoulder with a condescending smile. Listen, little brother, all you need is a quick trip down the beach. I know this delectable fisherman's daughter. That's not what I need, Lance, Val said tersely. I need a proper bride. All right! Lance flung up his hands, backing off. For all his gentleness... Val could be cursed stubborn when he took a notion into his head. What lady do you have in mind? Lance asked. Val looked shocked that he could even ask such a thing. You know that isn't for me to decide. If not you, then who? Lance stopped as he gazed deep into his brother's earnest eyes, realizing his meaning. Lance cringed. Oh, no, he said. Val, please, please tell me you're not thinking of consulting the bride finder. I already have. When Lance groaned, Val bristled defensively. You know I have no other choice, Lance. This is one aspect of our family traditions. Even you have to understand. Oh, yes, I'm familiar enough with the legend, Lance muttered, then began to recite in mock imitation of a schoolboy reeling off his lesson. All St. Ledgers are considered too odd or too stupid to be entrusted with the task of finding their own mate. If any St. Ledger attempts to do so, he will meet with nothing but disaster. But if he entrusts the mystical being appointed as bride finder to fetch him a wife, he will find true love that will last through all eternity. I indeed, Val cried, and I don't see how you can sneer about it when we have our own parents for an example. 
Lance couldn't argue with Bell on that score. It was true there could not possibly be any more devoted husband and wife than Madeline and Anatole St. Ledger. But he scowled, pointing out to his brother, Our parents were of another generation. Look who they had for their matchmaker, an elderly clergyman who was noted for his learning and wisdom. But when he passed on, who succeeded to his power? Who is supposed to be our bride finder, Val? Val fidgeted beneath Lance's hard stare, but at last admitted unhappily, Effie, Effie Fitzledger. That's right, Elfrida Fitzledger, a woman so scatterbrained she has trouble choosing what colour feathers to put on her own bonnet, let alone select a wife for anyone. But she has made some successful matches. Look at our cousin Caleb St. Ledger and his wife. They fight like a pair of bad-tempered alley cats. I know, but they actually seem to enjoy it, especially the mending part that comes after the quarrel. But is that really what you want, Val? Lance asked. A wife who will throw china at your head when she's angry? No. Effie will find a bride that's more suited to me. Lance rubbed the bridge of his nose in sheer frustration. He knew it was really none of his concern what Val decided to do, but he couldn't help making one last effort to reason with his brother. Don't you think you'd do far better simply relying on your own heart? But, but isn't... Val hesitated, then went on diffidently. Forgive me, Lance, but isn't that what you tried to do? His brother's question left Lance momentarily thunderstruck, for he couldn't deny it. His own wayward eye and hot-blooded passions had certainly led him to fix his heart upon Adele Montroy, his commanding officer's wife. Yes, I was a fool, Lance admitted reluctantly. I always assumed you had better judgment, Val. But if you feel you need to rely on the services of some so-called bride finder, that's your decision. You don't need my approval. No, but I could use your help. Help with what? You know what Effie is like. She's always been very reluctant to perform her bride-finding duties. I've been to see her almost every afternoon for a fortnight, and she keeps putting me off. So what do you expect me to do about it? You could talk to her, persuade her. People listen to you, Lance. You command their attention and their obedience. You're like father in that respect. No, that was his chief problem, Lance thought. He was nothing like the legendary Anatole St. Ledger. And he already had enough difficulties with that blasted sword gone missing. The last thing he needed was to get involved in any bride-finding nonsense with Elfrida Fitzledger. He wanted to refuse Val's request, but one look into his brother's pleading dark eyes, another glance toward that damned cane, and of course he was unable to do so. All right, he said grudgingly. I'll talk to the ridiculous woman. I'm sure I owe you at least that much. I would rather you did it just because you are my brother, Val said sadly. But thank you. His eyes brightened with a gratitude that only rendered Lance more uncomfortable because he knew he'd done nothing to deserve it. But Val beamed at him. You'll never know how much I appreciate this, Lance. I'll be sure to christen my firstborn son after you. Good God, no! Lance exclaimed in sheer horror. As if it wasn't bad enough our father allowed mother to saddle us with such ridiculous names. Saint Valentine... Sir Lancelot. There had been a time in their youth when adding these teasing titles to the names they already both hated would have resulted in a mock fierce exchange of blows, descending into an all-out wrestling match. Lance almost forgot himself for a moment, was about to deliver a playful buffet to Val's shoulder when he caught himself, remembering his brother's crippled frame just in time. He let his hand drop awkwardly back to his side. Val, too, appeared extremely self-conscious. With a taut smile, he excused himself on the grounds of having already taken up enough of Lance's time. As he moved to leave, 
Lance rushed ahead to get the door for him. Head bent, Val hobbled from the room, holding the door slightly ajar. Lance watched him through the crack. Observing his brother's progress down the hall, he feared that for once in his life, Val might have been less than truthful. That his leg was bothering him seemed a far more likely explanation for his sleeplessness than any St. Ledger mating urge. His brother's limp was more pronounced this morning, and it made Lance all the more aware of his own limbs, so straight and strong beneath him. Absent of any pain, of the injury that should have rightfully been his, if not for Val's interference. Closing the door with a dull click, Lance wondered, as he often did, whether he loved his brother or hated him more. But not nearly as much as Lance St. Ledger hated himself. Chapter 3 Miss Elfrida Fitzledger poured out more tea for her afternoon caller, her brassy gold ringlets bobbing round sharp features well past the first blush of maidenhood. Crow's feet stalked the corners of her hazel eyes, greatly at odds with her youthful manner of dressing her hair and the girlish simplicity of her white muslin gown. Despite the fact that she would never see her thirtieth birthday again, Miss Fitzledger simpered at her visitor like a young miss on the brink of her coming out as she maintained a constant flow of chatter. Afternoon callers, especially such genteel ones from the vast world outside of Torakum, were a scarce commodity, and like a merry spider with a reluctant guest caught in her web, Effie was determined not to let this one get away. Rosalind stifled a yawn behind her gloved hand, appalled by her own rudeness. She felt nigh overcome between having so little sleep the night before and the closeness of Miss Fitzledger's parlour. Despite the warm summer afternoon, all the windows were shut and a blazing fire crackled on the hearth. Rosalind perched uncomfortably on a stiff chaise. Her black gown wilted to her body, her damp curls clinging to her forehead, perspiring beneath the layers of her lace-trimmed cap and dark crepe bonnet. She marvelled that the heat appeared to have no effect whatsoever on her hostess. Miss Fitzledger had even draped a shawl about her own thin shoulders. When Miss Fitzledger attempted to press upon Rosalind yet another cup of tea, her eyes strayed longingly toward the door. "'Oh, no, thank you, ma'am,' she said. "'I fear I have trespassed upon your kindness long enough.' "'I declare!' the woman exclaimed. You've only just arrived. One half hour ago, Rosalind had counted out every sweltering minute with the aid of the clocks in the room, and there seemed to be dozens of them, ticking incessantly. It was very good of you to receive me at all, Rosalind murmured, attempting to rise. Arriving on your doorstep, unannounced, with no claim upon your acquaintance. No claim indeed, Miss Fitzledger interrupted, thrusting Rosalind back into her seat. Were you not acquainted with my own dear departed grandpapa? And I am an excellent judge of character. All my admirers say so. Mr. Josiah Gramble said just the other day, Miss Effie, he calls me Effie, she paused to giggle, for the vicar, he's such a cheeky rogue. He says, Miss Effie, you are as perceptive as you are lovely. And it is true, I am blessed with a remarkable degree of intuition. I saw at once you were a respectable woman. And besides, any old friend of my grandpapa is a friend of mine. Rosalind sighed. She had tried in all honesty to explain to Miss Fitzledger that her acquaintance with the late Mr. Fitzledger had been a brief one, but it was as useless as trying to avoid the tea that her hostess forced into her hands. Dearest grandpapa, Miss Fitzledger went on, stirring her own tea with a sentimental expression on her face. He would have been so glad to see you, too. What a pity you were not able to come sooner. Yes, Rosalind agreed sadly. She took a sip of the tepid liquid and tried not to choke. The tea seemed to be the only thing in the place that wasn't hot. Is Mr. Fitzledger's demise a recent one? Oh, Lord bless you, no. The dear man's been gone these ten years and more, and I still miss him dreadfully. Miss Fitzledger batted her lashes in a coy manner. 
but the tears she suppressed seemed quite genuine enough. I was quite his favourite grandchild, you know. He raised me himself after my mamma died in childbirth. I was his sole heiress. Then you inherited this cottage from Mr. Fitzledger? I inherited a great deal too much from him. The tartness of the remark surprised Rosalind, as well as the bitter look that momentarily hardened the spinster's features. But it was buried in a flash behind another of Effie's simpering smiles. She swiftly changed the subject to her gentlemen admirers, and according to Miss Fitzledger, she possessed a great number of them. She went rattling away, and Rosalind despaired of making her escape for at least another quarter hour. She set her teacup aside on a pie-crust table, and her gaze fell upon yet another of Miss Fitzledger's collection of timepieces. This was a plain gold pocket watch, sealed beneath a glass dome, but it triggered for Rosalind a flood of memories of a sunny afternoon in her childhood, when the watch hadn't been a knick-knack, gathering dust, but an old man's treasured possession, one that he had permitted an old little girl to examine with her chubby fingers. It hadn't surprised Rosalind to learn of the good vicar's demise, but she was astonished by the depth of loss she felt. She'd only known Mr. Fitzledger for the space of a few hours, and yet she retained an impression of him as one of the wisest men she had ever met. And she could have used a bit of wisdom just now, Rosalind thought ruefully. The adventurous madcap who had pranced about the inn in her nightgown, hunting for ghosts, was long gone. In her place was the all-too-familiar, timid and uncertain young widow, a widow with a stolen sword tucked beneath the mattress of her bed. Rosalind had felt nothing but triumph when she had managed to successfully spirit the heavy weapon back to her bedchamber without being detected, but in the ensuing hours she'd been left with too much time to reflect upon what she had done. Whatever villain had been bold enough to lay hands upon Excalibur would not be pleased when he discovered his prize missing from its hiding place. The thief surely had to be someone staying at the inn. And if this desperate rogue should discover that Rosalind had been the one to thwart him, she suppressed a shudder. According to the gossip Jenny had gleaned, the dragon's fire was full of despicable characters. From the sly-faced Mr. Braggs to a customs officer who maintained permanent lodgings at the inn. A sinfully handsome man, but extremely dangerous by all accounts. One of those mort mains, my lady, Jenny had informed her in a hushed whisper. And you can't imagine what murderous scoundrels everyone in the village says they are. Unfortunately, Rosalind could imagine, and did enough so that she almost considered turning the sword over to the nearest magistrate. But she could just hear herself trying to explain to some stern-faced official, "'This sword is Excalibur, the property of its rightful guardian, Sir Lancelot du Lac. I found it at the inn, and have been trying to keep it safe until it can be restored to him.' Rosalind would be fortunate if she didn't end up being mistaken for a thief herself. Even if she didn't land in the nearest jail, Bedlam would be her final destination for sure.' She was beginning to wonder herself if that was not where she belonged. It had all seemed so different this morning, when her hands had first closed upon the hilt of that wondrous sword, the soft light of dawn playing over the gleaming blade. She'd felt stronger somehow, braver, capable of dealing with anything, ghosts, villains, legendary swords. A far cry from the shy girl who had been so pampered and protected all her life. But now... All she felt was frightened and confused. The safest thing she could do was simply put that sword right back beneath the floorboard and forget she'd ever found it. But even as the thought occurred to her, she knew she couldn't do that. Because of him, Sir Lancelot du Lac. The gallant knight who had knelt so humbly at her feet, a haunted soul with weary eyes and a gentle smile, condemned to an eternal search for forgiveness, his own redemption. In those dreamlike moments she had spent in his company, she had obtained a glimpse of the man behind the legend, with his all-too-human regrets. He'd become more real to her than many a living person she'd known. Despite the desperation of his quest, he had taken the time to offer a sympathetic smile, a kind word to a young widow who felt as though she had become somewhat of a lonely traveller herself. 
Was she then to repay such chivalry with cowardice? Tamely return the sword to the enemy who had robbed him of it? No. Such an ignoble course was not even to be thought of. Rosalind firmed her lips, silently vowing that she would sit up in that storeroom every night for the rest of her life if she had to, waiting for Lancelot, until she could place Excalibur safely back in his keeping. It would have been comforting if he had at least left her with some hint of his eventual return, but his parting had seemed distressingly final. She thought she would never forget the sorrow in his eyes, that deep note of regret in his voice. I would beg to salute thee properly, my lady, but all I can do is bid thee farewell. Salute thee. Such an elegant, old-fashioned way of speaking. The mere sound of the words had so charmed her, she'd scarce given thought to their meaning. But now she puzzled over the phrase, trying to recollect its place among the Arthurian legends she'd read. Bold knights frequently asked that question of their ladies fair. May I salute thee, demoiselle? They'd always been begging for the favour of... of a kiss. Rosalind stiffened as the import of Lancelot's parting words struck her at last. If it had been possible, he would have asked to kiss her goodbye. And would she have granted his request? She touched one finger hesitantly to her lips as she considered the possibility. The mere notion of such a thing seemed disloyal to the memory of her late husband, almost as though she were betraying Arthur with Sir Lancelot. The irony of that was not lost on her, and Rosalind's mouth formed into a wry half-smile. But she couldn't stop herself from thinking about Lancelot's kiss, what it would have been like. Warm and gentle, she was sure, and flavoured with all the romance of one of history's most noble lovers. She could almost feel the tender pressure of his mouth on hers, a heat flooded into her cheeks, that had nothing to do with the temperature of the room, and a delicious shiver worked through her. Is anything the matter, my lady? Miss Fitzledger's voice broke rudely in on Rosalind's imagined embrace. Startled back to her surroundings, she realized that her hostess's amiable flow of gossip had ceased, and the woman was staring at her with an inquiring smile. But Rosalind did not have the least idea what the question had been. Well, I... I... she stammered. Poor dear! A moment ago you shivered, and now your teeth are chattering, Miss Fitzledger cooed. There is a terrible draught in this room. I feel it myself. I'll just throw a few more logs on the fire. Oh, no! Rosalind cried. But her faint protest fell on deaf ears as Miss Fitzledger leapt cheerfully to her feet. Effie heaped more wood upon the inferno that already blazed upon the hearth, but at least the woman's actions helped to snap Rosalind out of her foolish daydreaming about Sir Lancelot and back to the grim reality of her present situation. She stole a glance at the hodgepodge of clocks upon the mantel, and feared she'd already been absent from the inn for too long, leaving her poor maid guarding a most dangerous treasure. When Miss Fitzledger's back was turned, Rosalind stifled an ignoble impulse to snatch up her reticule and dart out the parlour door. She inched to the edge of the chaise, once more trying to marshal her excuses, when Miss Fitzledger startled her with a delighted shriek. I declare, I hear a carriage arriving. The woman beamed from ear to ear. More callers. Rosalind didn't know how Miss Fitzledger could hear anything with the windows closed and the clocks setting up a din, all of them now bonging and chiming out the hour. But as her hostess darted across the room to peer past the draperies, Rosalind shot to her feet, her spirits lifting. With the arrival of fresh victims for Effie, or rather, she should say, visitors, Rosalind amended. She at last saw her golden opportunity for escape. But as Miss Fitzledger stared out the parlour's front window, her look of joyful expectation fled. Merciful heavens, it's him! 
She wrenched the curtains closed, pressing her trembling hands to her thin bosom. Her alarm was so palpable, it communicated itself to Rosalind. Who is it, Miss Fitzledger? she asked anxiously. That dratted Valentine St. Ledger. Effie whipped round and risked another peek through the curtains. She moaned, He's coming to plague the life out of me with his incessant demands, and this time he's even brought his devil of a brother with him, the heartless pair of villains. V the villains? The word set Rosalind on edge, conscious as she was of the sacred sword she had sworn to keep safe. And the name St. Ledger. She was certain she'd heard it before. Jenny had mentioned them. They were the principal landholders hereabouts, a rather infamous family by all accounts, inhabiting a haunted manor bearing the title of Castle Ledger. Rosalind had absorbed the gossip from her maid, with all her usual delight in anything new and curious. But swapping deliciously eerie and frightening legends was one thing. It was quite another to have the object of those dark tales come hammering at the door. Oh dear, oh dear, Effie fretted, alternating between stealing glances through the slit in the curtains and wringing her hands. Rosalind crept to the distraught woman's side. Miss Fitzledger, what do these St. Ledgers want from you? What those infernal St. Ledger men always want. Women! I beg your pardon, Rosalind said faintly. I don't quite understand. I've never understood it either. Effie sniffed. Some sort of moon madness seems to steal over them, and their blood gets all fired up, positively seething until they become quite insatiable. Then I'm given no peace until I go fetch them some wives. Wives? You are their matchmaker, then? What I am is a slave to those St. Ledgers and their passions. It is so exhausting, my dear. First using my magical talent to find the bride, then persuading the lady to marry into a strange family like the St. Ledgers. Often the silly chit doesn't want to be thrust into the arms of some lusty dark lord who can scarce wait to wed and bed her. I should imagine not, Rosalind faltered, her mind filling with images of some wild-eyed Cornishman flinging a terrified lady over his burly shoulder and carrying her off to his castle. She'd heard that people could be a little rough-hewn in this part of the world, a little less than civilised. But surely these are no longer medieval times, she couldn't help protesting to Miss Fitzledger. No woman can be forced into marriage against her will, not in this day and age. <laughs> you don't know these St. Ledgers, my lady. They can be quite ruthless about getting what they want. Only look how they force me to go bride-hunting for them. Why don't they find their own wives and court them in decent, gentlemanly fashion? They can't do that. Not with their peculiar family heritage and customs. They are utterly dependent upon me. I am their one and only true bride-finder. Effie drew herself up with an air of self-importance. At the same time, a bleak expression chased across her face. But you've no idea what it's like to be burdened with such an awful power, Lady Carline. It has quite blighted my life. Rosalind nodded sympathetically, but retreated a weary step. She had no idea what sort of fresh trouble she might have stumbled into here. But it promised to be more than she could handle. Miss Fitzledger apparently believed that she possessed some sort of magic power to find brides and these St. Ledgers were mad enough to agree with her. Lust-ridden young men, ready to pounce upon whomever Effie pointed out to them as a likely wife, be she young, old, rich or poor, a trembling girl, a respectable matron, or, or even a virtuous widow. Rosalind swallowed nervously and inched toward the parlour door, but to her dismay Effie got there first. I'll just command Hurst to deny I'm at home, Effie said. If we're very quiet, they'll never guess we're here. Miss Fitzledger, please, Rosalind began, but with a conspiratorial wink, the woman whisked open the door to summon her housekeeper. Rosalind pressed one hand to her brow, fearing the heat might have addled her wits more than she supposed. 
Surely she must have misunderstood Effie's odd remarks, or the woman had grossly exaggerated. But whatever was going on between her hostess and the St. Ledgers, Rosalind had a sinking feeling she should have made her escape while she still had the chance. His curly-brimmed beaver tipped at a rakish angle. Lance St. Ledger stared at the vine-covered cottage before him, the taut set of his mouth revealing how little he relished the prospect of this visit. He was in no humour to be dealing with a recalcitrant bride-finder, especially when he should have been organising a hunt for the thief who attacked him last night. But it was damned near impossible to mount a proper search when he couldn't even admit to anyone that he'd been robbed of his own sword. Just one more part of the curse of being a St. Ledger, this need to appear infallible in the eyes of the local folk. Lance wondered how his father had managed all these years, probably because Anatole St. Ledger was infallible. He would never have allowed anything like this to happen. That bitter reflection did nothing to ease Lance's black mood. As he reached Effie's front door, he cast a brusque look over his shoulder, annoyed to realise that Val had lagged behind, not having gone much farther than the garden gate. But it was not his brother's bad knee that impeded his progress so much as the scrawny girl that clung to his waist, threatening to topple Val over into a bed of roses. Kate. Effie Fitzledger's ward, another of the woman's foolish whims. When Effie had gone to take the waters at Bath some years back, she had apparently plucked the child from some foundling home and returned, cooing over the prospect of playing Mama. The rambunctious Kate had fast cured Effie of that notion, which was just as well, or they'd have had Effie collecting up children the way she did clocks. Kate clutched at Val with all her strength. She was a regular gypsy with her massive, thick, black, straight hair, dirt-smudged cheeks and flashing dark eyes. No, Val, she cried. Don't do it. Don't. Attempting to maintain his balance, Val said gently, Katie, you know that I must. No, don't you dare do it. Don't ask that damned old Effie to get you a bride. Unable to loosen her grip on him, Val bent and wrapped his arm round her thin shoulders. But neither his remonstrances with Kate, not to swear, or his efforts to reason with her had any effect. The girl's countenance grew stormier by the moment. Lance finally felt compelled to intervene. Striding down the walk, he peeled Kate away from his brother in one swift moment, ignoring both Val's soft protest and the girl's shrill cry. As he dragged her away from Val, she turned on Lance like a fury, punching and kicking. Lance half lifted her off her feet and plunked her down outside the gate. Grasping her wrists in one hand, he subdued her with a bout of strategically placed tickling aimed at her ribcage. Kate collapsed in the lane at his feet, breathless with furious laughter. Damn you, Lance Ledger, she panted. You don't fight fair. Let me go. Not until you behave yourself, Miss Catherine. Go the devil. Very likely I will, Lance agreed amicably. And you with me if you don't mend your ways, Hoyden. She struggled to wrench herself free. When she found herself unable to do so, she glared up at him, her eyes black pools of fury. Lance maintained a firm but careful grip on her wrists, for all her wiry strength, Kate was a rather delicate girl with fine bone structure. Her smallness made it all but impossible to guess her age. The girl herself didn't seem to know what it was. About twelve or thirteen, Lance judged. Although there was that in Kate's gaze that always gave him pause. An expression so old, so world-weary, it pained him to find it in the eyes of one so young. Wherever the orphaned girl had spent the early years of her life, she'd clearly seen and experienced far too much of the misery to be found in this world. Lance returned her fierce stare with a steady regard, not slackening his grasp, until she regained some measure of control over her temper. 
Let me go, she repeated through clenched teeth. Lance cautiously released her. Now what the blazes is all this fuss about, Miss Catherine? Kate stood up, brushing the dust from her elbows. She took a long time about replying, but finally confessed sullenly. I don't want Val marrying some dumb old bride if he finds for him. Why not, babe? Because. Kate ducked her head, disappearing behind the heavy curtain of her gypsy dark hair. I mean to marry Val myself some day. What? Lance tipped up her chin, forcing her to look at him. The girl's expressive eyes were shaded with a hint of defiance and a look so forlorn it curbed in Lance any urge to smile. Don't you think my brother's a little old for you? he asked. Kate vigorously shook her head. I'll catch up to him if he'll only wait for me. That's a rather hard thing to demand, Miss Kate, for poor Val to wait for a bride until you've finished growing. He has to. If he doesn't, I'll never marry anybody. I'll end up an old maid like Effie. Nonsense. You'll have lots of bows, especially if you ever decide to wash your face. Lance pinched her chin playfully. And if you ever get that desperate, you can always marry me. <laughs> Kate gave a dignified sniff. I wouldn't have you. You'd make the very devil of a husband. So I would, Lance chuckled. But he eventually managed to coax a smile from the girl, especially when he slipped several coins into her hand. She trudged off down the lane, only pausing long enough to shake her fist and holler back at his brother. You haven't heard the last of me, Val St. Ledger. Even if Effie does find you a bride, I'll shoot her dead. Lance laughed, but he turned to find Val horrified. The encounter with Kate had done a great deal to restore Lance's good humour, and he strolled back through the gate toward his brother, wickedly arching one brow. Ah, the devastating effect your charms have on the ladies, Valentine. Poor child. Val stared after Kate with a worried frown. I only ever meant to be kind to her. I'd no idea she'd take such an odd notion into her head about marrying me. Merely a childish infatuation. Don't you remember when Leonie insisted she was going to wed that acrobat that came here for the fair one year? Aye, but Kate is a deal more intense in her emotions than our sister ever was. More hot-tempered, you mean? Well, I wouldn't worry over much. I doubt Kate has saved up enough to buy herself a pair of dueling pistols. Yet. More likely she'll just borrow yours, Val said, turning a stern look on Lance. You know the girl runs wild enough without you encouraging her. Me? What the devil do I do? You always tease her, laugh when she curses, fill her apron pockets full of coins... And all she does with it is buy so many sweets she makes herself ill. Lance frowned. He harboured a soft corner in his heart for the fierce orphan, alternately overindulged or neglected, according to Effie's moods. But it had never occurred to him that he might be doing Kate more harm than good with his careless generosity. I fear I have little understanding of children, he said ruefully. You'll learn fast enough after you've fathered a few of your own. Never intend to, Valentine, Lance drawled. I leave it entirely up to you to fill the cradle of Castle Ledger with heirs. Val looked disturbed, as he always did when Lance made remarks like that. But Lance's words appeared to recall him to some sense of his mission. As they traced their way down the walk, together this time, Lance was amused to observe Val's nervousness. His absent-minded brother usually so careless of his appearance, alternately fidgeted with his cravat and shifted the low-crowned beaver perched atop his disorderly waves of hair. "'You don't need to look so blasted tense,' Lance said. "'It's not as though I'm going to be able to make Effie fetch you a bride out of her closet this very afternoon.' But, despite his teasing, Lance paused himself on the front step to help Val straighten his cravat. His own claret-coloured frock coat immaculate, Lance could never understand how Val always contrived to appear as if he dressed himself in the dark. Hold still, Lance growled, wrestling with the haphazardly tied linen. Val sighed but obeyed, 
submitting patiently to Lance's ministrations. It struck Lance that this was one of those moments when his twin seemed a great deal younger than he, strands of dark hair drooping stubbornly over Val's brow, his soft eyes dream-ridden with notions of love eternal and all those happily ever afters Lance had long since ceased to believe in. His brother's hopeful face aroused in Lance an embarrassing surge of protectiveness. There, that'll have to do, he said gruffly, giving Val's appearance one last critical appraisal. But before Effie does produce this wife of yours, remind me to send my own man to give your hair a trim. Your bride might object to wedding someone who resembles a spaniel caught in a windstorm. Yes, thank you. I will remind you. Val smiled, but a shadow fell across his gentle features. Do you think my bride will will object to this? His gaze dropped to the ivory-handled cane he clutched in his right hand. Val rarely ever revealed that he minded himself about the injury that had left him permanently crippled. But for a brief moment there was a wistfulness in his eyes, a vulnerability he could not quite disguise, and it left Lance pierced clean through. He forced a hard laugh, saying, "'No, I'm sure your bride will be suitably impressed, "'especially after you explained to her how nobly you acquired your wound, "'saving your worthless brother. "'Ladies are always thrilled by such heroics.' "'Lance,' Val began with a pained look. "'But Lance had already turned away, "'his brief spate of brotherly feeling curtailed "'by the far more familiar one of guilt.' Seizing Effie's brass door knocker, he wrapped it with more force than necessary, eager to have this damn foolish business over and done with. His first summons went unanswered, likewise his second. Swearing under his breath, Lance started to resort to his fist when the door finally swung open a crack. Effie's housekeeper peeked out, wiping one meaty fist in the folds of her apron. What do you want? Be so good as to inform Miss Fitzleger that my brother and I desire... Mistress, be not at home. The door Miss Hurst moved to slam the door in his face, but Lance prevented her. Behind him he heard Val heave a disappointed sigh, preparing to go away. But Lance was not so easily deterred. My dear Hurst, he said, in a voice of deceptively soft patience, Perhaps you had best check again. When I rode up just now, I saw Miss Fitzledger at one of the windows. Hurst glared at him, wisps of her grey hair straggling from beneath her mop cap. The mistress be not a don't callers, which any gentleman would understand. When I find one, I'll be sure to tell him. Lance forced his way into the house, leaving Val with no choice but to follow. Hands propped on her ample hips, Miss Hurst hissed like a furious cat, but Lance ignored the woman. Sweeping off his hat, he tossed it onto the nearest chair, his gaze tracking round the hall, whose walls were cluttered with more of Effie's endless timepiece collection, two long case clocks guarding the foot of the stairs like a pair of solemn sentinels. So, where has Effie gone to ground this time? he demanded. The breakfast room? The parlour? The sullen housekeeper compressed her lips, but a furtive glance of her small, tight eyes told Lance all he needed to know. Ah, the parlour, then. Over Hurst's vociferous protest, Lance stalked in that direction, but before he'd taken many steps, Effie burst out of the room, slamming the door closed behind her. Splaying both hands against Lance's chest, she drove him back with a shrill cry, Go away, both of you! Lance paused, momentarily startled, finding this agitated greeting rather extreme, even for Effie. "'I did my best to keep him out, ma'am,' the housekeeper said. "'But this here impertinent rogue... that'll do, Hurst.' Lance cut her off in a tone he rarely used, but one of the most brash privates in his regiment had never been foolhardy enough to disobey. He dismissed the woman with a curt nod. The housekeeper glowered at him, but slunk away. Turning back to Effie, Lance summoned up his most charming smile. 
Now, Effie, is this any way to address your most ardent admirer? He caught one of her hands, carrying it to his lips in a practised gesture. How can you be so cruel as to send me away? Effie pouted, but she said in mollified tones, I'm always glad to see you, Lance. You make no unreasonable demands upon a poor woman, but I won't have him. She levelled an accusing finger at his brother. But Effie, Val said, coming forward, hat in hand, only yesterday you told me to come back tomorrow. This wasn't the tomorrow I meant. I'm already occupied entertaining a lady, a friend of mine from out of town. And I'm sure she'll be pleased to make our acquaintance, Lance said silkily. Indeed she won't. She's not the least interested in either one of you. Isn't she, by God? Lance murmured. Behind Effie, he could see the parlour door move the barest fraction, assuring him that Effie's uninterested caller was likely eavesdropping for all she was worth. A mischievous smile hovering at the corner of his mouth, Lance slipped round Effie in one fluid motion and wrenched the door open. With a tiny gasp, the woman staggered out into the hall, tumbling into Lance's arms. His hands shot out to steady her. "'Good afternoon,' he grinned. "'I've never had a lady fling herself at my feet before, "'but I dare say I could grow accustomed to.' "'His words trailed off as the woman raised startled eyes to his. "'Underneath the lace trim of a grim black bonnet, "'Lance found his lady of the lake. "'His hands froze on her shoulders.' and for a moment even Effie's infernal clocks seemed to go still. He stared with disbelief at features that already seemed achingly familiar to him, the soft bow-shaped mouth, the pert nose, the gold-fringed lashes, framing impossibly blue eyes. Rosalind! Rosalind Carlion! What the blazes was she doing here? She should have been far away by now continuing her journey through Cornwall to find King Arthur's birthplace or the ruins of Camelot or whatever the deuce she was looking for. But she wasn't. She was right here, hardly more than a heartbeat from falling straight into his arms. And he felt inexplicably glad of the fact. Scarce thinking what he did, he started to pull her closer. Only a small, frightened cry from the lady snapped him back to his senses. All the colour drained from Rosalind's cheeks. She stared up at him as though she were looking at... at a ghost. Which she likely thought she was. Lance winced. He let his hands fall away from her, dimly aware that Effie was performing some sort of disgruntled introduction. But Lance barely heard a word of it as he racked his brain for some glib excuse, some clever explanation as to why he was the image of the phantom Sir Lancelot du Lac. He was usually so good at talking his way out of any kind of awkward situation. But as he gazed deep into Rosalind's stricken eyes, for the first time in his life, Lance and Ledger had run out of moonshine. Lady Carlyon. Rosalind, he faltered. I... I can explain... Hell, no, he couldn't. But it hardly mattered, for Rosalind didn't seem to be listening to him anyway. She looked like she'd fallen into a state of shock, her breath coming quick and shallow. Raising trembling fingers, she reached toward him, as though she expected her hand to go clean through him. When her palm collided with his chest... A soft moan escaped her. And the lady who had scarce turned a hair at finding a ghost prowling through the dragon's fire in fainted dead away into Lance's arms. Lance caught her with a startled oath, sweeping her off her feet. She wasn't so much a slip of a girl as he'd supposed last night. As he cradled her high in his arms, he was disturbingly aware that the soft curves pressed tight against him were those of a woman. A tangle of confused emotions raced through him, but the one that surfaced uppermost was alarm. Lance had seen ladies burst into hysterics or temper tantrums, had had china and curses flung at his head. There'd even been a fiery opera dancer who'd tried to shoot him. 
but never once had a woman actually swooned on him. What he clearly needed right now was another lady, a practical one like his mother, with her reticule stuffed full of smelling salts. But it was Lance's ill luck to have only Effie Fitzledger at hand, and the flighty creature showed signs of going off herself. No, oh, I declare, I declare, I declare, Effie moaned, pressing her hands to her mouth as she swayed back and forth, staring at Lance and Rosalind. Shifting the inert lady in his arms, Lance appealed to his brother for assistance. Val! But to Lance's dismay, Val appeared in little better case. Usually so quick to react in any sort of medical crisis, Val simply stood there, gaping at Rosalind with a dazed expression on his face. Val! Lance snapped. The sharpness of his tone jarred Val out of his trance. With a concerned frown, he hastened forward, only to be stopped by Effie groaning and clutching at his arm for support. Oh! Oh! Oh, it's her! Why didn't I feel it before? Effie, this is no time for hysterics, Lance said. Will you please do something useful? Summon Hurst to fetch some water or... or... But it's her, I tell you, Effie cried, giving Val's arm a vehement shake. Your chosen bride! Effie's words left even Lance stunned for a moment. As for Val, he dropped his cane, the ivory-tipped walking stick clattering to the floor. He looked at Rosalind, and an expression stole over his solemn features, such as Lance had never seen on his brother's face before. Or tenderness and a dawning joy that made Val's eyes glisten fever-bright. His injured leg unheeded, his limp barely perceptible, he walked toward Lance with his arms outstretched, for all the world like he'd turned into some god-cursed prince out of a fairy tale, preparing to swoop up the lady and revive her with a kiss. Lance's Lady of the Lake. His arms tightened involuntarily around Rosalind, a sense of unreasonable possessiveness coursing through him. He backed away from Val, his lips starting to curl into something resembling a snarl, when Lance blinked, catching himself. What the devil was he doing? He reminded himself sharply that this is exactly what he'd come for, to force Effie to use her powers to find Val a bride. He just hadn't expected that it would happen so soon. Or that the bride would turn out to be Rosalind. But why the blazes should that matter to him? Reluctantly, Lance prepared to surrender Rosalind into Val's eager arms when Effie shrieked out again. No! What are you doing? she demanded. Lance glowered at the woman. You said Lady Carline is to be Val's wife. Not Valentine's chosen bride, you impossibly stupid man, Effie cried, stomping her foot at Lance. Yours! What? Lance came damn close to dropping Rosalind. He shifted her to a more secure position in his arms, her head lolling against his shoulder as if she belonged there. He gazed down at her pale face, experiencing a quickening in his veins, a rush to his heart that felt strangely like tenderness. He was swift to quell the disturbing sensation. Here, Lance thrust Rosalind toward his brother, as though the lady had suddenly turned into an armful of hot coals. But Val's arms fell back to his side, the light dying from his eyes. No, Lance, he said quietly. She's not my bride. She's yours. <clears throat> what the woman is, is unconscious, Lance sputtered. As far as I'm concerned, if you just take her and revive her, you can have her. But Val retreated with a sad shake of his head. You heard what Effie said. I did, and as usual, the blasted woman's quite mistaken. I am not, Effie wailed indignantly. I never make mistakes. No? What about when... Lance began, then broke off unable to believe that he was engaging in such a ridiculous argument while he stood with a swooning woman in his arms. Since he appeared to be the only person left with any degree of sense, it was clearly up to him to deal with Rosalind. Brushing past Effie, he strode through the parlour door, 
looking for some comfortable place to lay the lady down. He eased Rosalind gently onto a backless chaise that more resembled something to be found in a Roman emperor's palace than an English woman's drawing room. As he did so, the stifling heat of the room assailed him in one great wave. That fool Effie actually had a roaring fire going in here, and all the windows closed in the dead of summer. Damnation, Lance muttered. No wonder his lady of the lake had fainted. Hearing someone enter the parlour behind him, he assumed it was his brother, and called out, Well, go open the windows, or I'll be passing out myself in a moment. But it was Effie's aggrieved voice who answered him. Valentine isn't here. I told him to go away. What the deuce did you do that for? Lance snapped. Effie hovered at his shoulder, craning her neck to peer down at Rosalind with a wounded sniff. But well, one can hardly expect me to find any more brides today. I am so done in. I have no idea when my power may ever function again. I declare, I believe I may faint myself. If you do, I swear I'll cart you out of the garden and dump you in the fish pond. Now stop acting like a blasted fool and help me with this woman. No, oh, Effie wailed. Of all the ungrateful wretches, and after I've found you a wife, I don't want a wife. "'Then you shouldn't have come barging in here, should you?' "'Effie regarded him with reproachful, tear-filled eyes. "'But it's too late now. "'So you just get that woman out of here and marry her, "'and don't you St. Ledger's even think of asking me to be b b bridesmaid again?' "'Bursting into sobs, she rushed out of the room. "'Lance let her go, far too exasperated to try to stop her. Storming to his feet, he charged across the parlour to shove aside the curtains and open the windows himself. As he fought with the casement, he caught a glimpse of his brother trudging down the lane back toward the inn where they'd left their horses. Shoulders slumped, Val hobbled along, looking as though whatever castle in the clouds he'd woven in those few seconds he'd thought Rosalind was his had crashed down around his ears. Lance watched him go, nonplussed, He'd never known Val to turn his back on anyone who needed help before. He could scarcely imagine how badly disappointed, how hurt his brother must be to have done so. And Lance felt that once again he was somehow to blame. He wanted to go after Val, make things right for him. But with Effie off somewhere, having the vapours, and his Lady of the Lake still out cold, what the devil was he supposed to do? Forcing open the rest of the windows... He charged back into the hall, bellowing for one of the servants, but, as usual in Effie's feckless household, there was no one to be found, even the formidable Miss Hurst, inexplicably absent. Hurrying back to the parlour, Lance glanced distractedly around for a fan, smelling salts, some brandy, anything that might help. In sheer desperation, he flung a bouquet of wilted roses out of a serve vase, and used the water he found at the bottom to dampen his handkerchief. Perching beside Rosalind on the chaise, he fumbled with the ribbons of her bonnet, tugging it off and her lace cap along with it. Tendrils of her golden hair escaped from her tight chignon, straggling across her eyes. Lance brushed them aside, regarding her anxiously. So pale. She still showed no signs of coming round. Likely it was the fault of all those blasted layers of clothing women insisted upon burying themselves in. Val would have shrunk from such ungentlemanly behaviour. But Lance stripped away the gauzy scarf that served as her modesty piece without a second thought. Shifting her to her side, he undid the buttons of her bodice and unlaced the corset he found beneath. As he exposed the dainty lace of Rosalind's chemise, he thought she seemed to breathe easier. Easing her onto her back, he felt for her pulse. To his relief, he found it faint but steady. He made a heroic effort to keep his eyes averted, but assessing a woman's charms came as naturally to him as breathing, and Rosalind Carlyon had charms aplenty. His gaze dipped down, taking in a glimpse of delicate collarbone, a tantalizing beauty mark just above the swell of her breasts, the sweat-dampened linen of her chemise outlining round, perfect globes, 
the dusky shadows of her nipples. Disgusted with himself, Lance wrenched his eyes back to her face. Using some of the water in the glass, he dampened his handkerchief and pressed it to Rosalind's brow, trying to keep his movements brisk and businesslike. But his fingers gentled in spite of himself as he studied her face. She was no beauty, not by the classical standards that were the fashion now. Her nose was too snub, her chin too decided, her cheeks dusted with a hint of freckles. And yet there was a sweetness and harmony in her countenance any man would find captivating. It was a gentle face, a face fresh as springtime flowers, a face spun from fairy tales and long-ago days, of golden-haired maidens who waited in rose-covered bowers, humming and dreaming of the prince who would come for her on his white charger. It was the face of the kind of woman who, who could cause a man a great deal of trouble, if he wasn't careful, Lance grimaced. And hadn't this one managed to do so already, taking him by surprise at the inn last night, walking straight through his very soul, distracting him from his search for the sword? And now, with F. if it's ledger declaring Rosalind to be his chosen bride, Lance might have little respect for Effie's powers as bride finder, but he knew his family would not agree with him. If word of Effie's latest pronouncement leaked out, he'd have the entire St. Ledger clan swooping down upon him, demanding a wedding. And that, Lance reflected grimly, would be the last thing he bloody well needed. His only hope was to convince Effie she'd made a mistake this time, which Lance was blasted sure she had. Rosalind was a gentle lady who would require a gentle lover, a knight whose soul shone as brightly as his armour. Someone noble, honest and true. Someone exactly like his brother, Val. As he chafed her wrists and called her name, she began to stir at last. Rosalind whimpered softly. Her head shifted and her eyes fluttered open. Her bewildered gaze roved about the room, finally coming to rest on Lance's face, and her eyes lit up with such undisguised joy it sent an odd pang straight to his heart. Never could he recall any woman looking at him in such a way as though he truly were some valiant hero come to answer all her prayers. Her lips curved, a hint of colour stealing back into her pale cheeks. When she smiled, she made him feel like a blind man first beholding the radiance of the sun. So much wonder and delight, so many dreams to be found shimmering in one pair of blue eyes. She really ought to be Val's bride. She was perfect for him. But even as that stubborn thought crossed Lance's mind, he found himself drawn forward. Scarce realising himself what he was about to do, he brushed Rosalind's mouth with his kiss. Chapter 4 Sir Lancelot's kiss was warm and tender, just as she'd imagined it would be. Rosalind sighed, still feeling as though she groped her way through a swirling haze. Her mind remained clouded, uncertain where she was or how she'd got there. But it didn't matter, because she was no longer alone. He had returned to her, Sir Lancelot du Lac. He wore a beleaguered expression, as though he'd fought his way back to her side through an army of hostile knights, a score of fire-breathing dragons. But as she peered up at him, his features relaxed into a look of profound relief. Rosalind, he murmured, thank God. Her name sounded so sweet on his lips. Rosalind issued a soft sigh. Every morning since Arthur had died, she'd been roused from her sleep to a heavy feeling of being all alone in the world, sorrow pressing like a weight upon her heart. 
This was the first time that she'd opened her eyes in a long while to a far different sensation. Something so light and fluttery. It took her a moment to remember what it was. Happiness. It rushed to her heart, leaving her giddy with the sensation. She gazed up at Sir Lancelot, whispering in joyous disbelief. You've come back to me. Have I? He smiled. I thought it was the other way round. She returned his smile, her fingers trembling as she threaded them through his dark, silky lengths of hair. She'd never imagined a man's hair could be so cool and soft, in marked contrast to the rugged warmth of his skin. She continued her dazed exploration, stroking the curve of his cheek and the iron-willed jaw with its hint of roughness that she doubted any razor could ever entirely tame. He appeared surprised by her touch at first. Then something in his eyes darkened. He caught her hand and pressed his lips to her palm in a kiss that was bold, passionate, searing. The tremor of heat unleashed through her body shocked her fully back to her senses and the realization that something was terribly wrong. The man bending over her was no ghost of some long-ago hero. The hand that imprisoned hers was gentle enough, but beneath that gentleness she could feel the heat, the strength, the pulsing vitality. Her eyes roved over him, taking in details she should have noted from the first. No armor, no tunic, his hair neatly arranged to rest against his collar, or at least it had been, until she had disturbed the dark waves. The intricate folds of a cravat cascaded like snow down a crisp shirt front, a silk-striped waistcoat. His frock coat strained over his powerful shoulders to the bursting point, while his breeches... Rosalind's stunned gaze dipped down, then quickly back. His breeches molded to his muscular thighs like a second skin. This, this wasn't Sir Lancelot. This man with his languid smile, smouldering gaze and overly bold mouth. The warm glow faded, replaced by such an aching disappointment she wanted to cry. It was like being rudely awakened from the most beautiful dream she'd ever known. Rosalind's gaze roved bleakly around the room as she strained to recollect where she was, how she'd got there, exactly what she'd been doing. She... she was lying on her chaise in Effie Fitzledger's parlour. She remembered having tea with the woman, and then someone else had arrived that Miss Fitzledger had seemed determined to avoid. Visitors whose description had alarmed Rosalind. The St. Ledger's. Men with their passions out of control, who apparently ranged around the countryside, demanding brides like those hot-blooded Romans who'd carried off the unfortunate Sabine women. And this particular St. Ledger had already taken possession of her hand like he never meant to let her go. Rosalind stirred up at him, her pulse taking a frightened leap. But he didn't look like some uncivilized marauder. The cut of his clothes, too sophisticated for a simple country village proclaimed him to be every inch the gentleman. Yet the danger was there, inherent in the sensual curve of his mouth, in those impossibly dark eyes, eyes that seemed to devour her with a look that could have melted a candle into nothing more than a pool of molten wax and scorched wick. And there was no sign of Effie Fitzledger, or even one of the servants. She'd obviously been left quite alone with this man, and for what reason Rosalind was too frightened to think. Wriggling her fingers free of his strong grip, she struggled to a sitting position. When he would have stroked her cheek, she shrank back, crying, Don't touch me! Please! His brows rose in astonishment, and she trembled, hardly knowing what she would do if he didn't heed her frantic command. But to her relief, he drew his hand away. All right, he said with a hint of roguish smile. Although I do feel compelled to point out you were also touching me, and I didn't object. To her deep mortification, 
Rosalind realized that was true. Touch him? She'd even allowed him to kiss her, a perfect stranger, and all because he bore such an uncanny resemblance to her phantom Sir Lancelot. Now that she realized he wasn't, that kiss no longer seemed so sweet or innocent. I... I, th I thought you were someone else, she faltered. Oh? And who would that be? He framed his question with the most polite interest, but there was an intensity in his gaze she found unnerving. No one you'd know. A friend, she said sadly. A gallant friend that she wished were with her now. To shield her from this man's alarming attention. He leaned closer, his physical presence overwhelming, the broad shoulders, the long arms, the powerful hands. His scent filled her nostrils, bay rum mingling with something darker, more masculine. I wish you would also regard me as a friend, he murmured. Him, a man whose very voice was calculated to intimidate, whiskey warm with seduction. She inched farther away. I, I know who you are. You're one of those dreadful St. Ledgers. My reputation precedes me, but, yes, I am Lance St. Ledger. Lance? As, as in Lancelot? Unfortunately, yes. Even his name was the same? She found such a coincidence bewildering. Disturbing, even rather cruel. She pressed her hand to her brow, trying to clear away the webs of confusion. When her fingers struck up against damp tendrils of hair, escaping her chignon, she frowned, becoming aware that her bonnet was missing, likewise her lace cap. But that realization paled by a discovery far more alarming. Her scarf was also gone. She peered down, dismayed to discover her gown and corset half falling to her waist, exposing the swell of her breasts, thrusting against the thin fabric of her chemise. Merciful heavens! The St. Ledger had unlaced her to assess her charms as a prospective bride, or even worse, to sample them. You still look very shaken, sweet. Perhaps you'd better lie back down, he said. Why? so that he could finish what he'd started while she was unconscious. When he reached for her to ease her down, a wave of pure panic swept over her. She struck his hands away and scrambled off to the side of the chaise, finding her feet. She heard his startled oath, but never paused to look back. Heart pounding, she bolted for the door. But she'd scarce taken more than a few steps when her head swam. She would have tumbled headlong, but he was already there, springing after her with all the speed of a pouncing wolf, catching her hard against him. Rosalind, his voice rasped in her ear, what the devil do you think you're doing? She struggled feebly, attempting to fight off her own weakness, attempting to fight off him. Let me go! To do what? Fall on the floor? He was right, she realized with dismay. He was supporting her as much as restraining her, her body melting against his, absorbing the full impact of his heat and strength. The sensitive tips of her breasts pressing hard against him, veiled only by a whisper of lawn, so shockingly intimate as though she were on the verge of becoming his lover. Her eyes locked with his, and something strange seemed to flash between them, something dark and hot and heavy. And Lance and Ledger no longer looked the least bit civilized, but fully capable of sweeping a woman ruthlessly off her feet and to his bed. With one wild frantic movement, Rosalind managed to jerk free and staggered back, bracing herself against the fireplace mantel. When he stalked toward her, she panted, If you touch me again, sir, I will scream loud enough to bring the entire village. I wouldn't advise you to do that, my lady. Why not? because I know of only one way to stop a woman from screaming, and that would be to kiss you again. Oh. Rosalind gave a frightened gasp and groped for something to fend him off. She seized the fireplace poker, but he closed in on her, easily forcing it from her grasp before she could even lift it. 
damnation, Rosalind, he growled. I was only teasing you. You take things even more seriously than my brother does. His brother? Rosalind remembered there'd been another man in the hall, a quiet-looking one with a cane, but he too seemed to have vanished. She would have far preferred his sombre presence to this St. Ledger's more overpowering one. His hands, gripping her shoulders, Lance forced her back toward a chair. Sit down, he commanded. She had no choice but to comply, sinking down onto the tapestry-covered seat. Her legs were trembling. She was trembling. He towered over her, hands placed on the flat of his hips, regarding her with a frown. Now, what the blazes has come over you, woman? Rosalind clutched the loosened corset and bodice tight to her bosom and huddled further down in the chair. Nothing much, sir. Merely the small matter that while I was fainted, you tried to undress me. Purely for medicinal purposes. He didn't even have the grace to look abashed. I had no other choice. You did swoon in my arms, remember? She remembered, but not the way he made it sound. Intimate yet arrogant. He described it as though she'd been overcome by his physical charms. But where is Miss Fitzledger? she demanded. Why didn't she attend me? Because she's up in her room, very likely swooning herself. She can't bear to be outdone in anything by another woman. And as for that housekeeper of hers, I'll be hanged if I could find the wench. I doubt you tried very hard. Rosalind dragged the ends of fabric higher over her exposed décolletage. You should be ashamed of yourself. Very likely I should be, most of the time. But for once, my intentions were perfectly honourable. The scoundrel actually had the nerve to sound aggrieved. Rosalind quivered with outrage. You call it honourable to undo a lady's corset? No, I call it reviving her. When any of the silly young clunches in my regiment locked up their knees while at attention and keeled over, loosening their collars was always one of the first things I did. Indeed. And then did you kiss them too? A red flush stained his high cheekbones, but it appeared to be more from annoyance than embarrassment. I don't know why I kissed you, he said, out of relief, most likely, that you'd finally come round. It was only the slightest peck, nothing for you to get so distressed about. Surely you don't think I was preparing to ravish you, or... He broke off, peering down at her. My God, that's exactly what you thought. To Rosalind's indignation, the depraved wretch actually laughed. She bristled defensively. Well, what else was there? What could I think? My dear girl, he chuckled. Ravish you beside the tea table, in broad daylight, in Effie Fitzledger's parlour, with all the village passing by in the lane outside the window? Well, I... I... When he put it that way, it did sound ridiculous. If I was going to have my wicked way with you, I'd at least have you carted off to a bedchamber and revived you. It would be very interesting, ravishing a woman who's like a dead weight in your arms. And besides that... His voice lowered to that intimate, suggestive timbre she found so disconcerting. I would never ravish any woman. I don't have to. Rosalind didn't know what was worse, his arrogance or the amused way he glanced down at her, making her feel inexperienced and foolish. Perhaps she had overreacted, but she was not accustomed to dealing with such things as casual kisses and a man undoing her laces for any reason. Even her own dear Arthur had never undressed her. His conjugal visits to her bedchamber had always been conducted with the utmost modesty and decorum. Just a discreet lifting of her nightgown. She longed to heap reproaches upon Lance and Ledger, inform him that he could have found a more gentlemanly way of handling this situation. Sir Lancelot du Lac would certainly have done so. He would never have behaved so unchivalrously if she'd fainted in his arms. He would have found some way to spare her embarrassment, some way that was gentle and considerate. The reflection brought an unexpected stinging of tears to her eyes, and she ducked her head to hide them blinking furiously. It only made matters worse when Lance and Ledger made a belated effort to be kind to her. He hunkered down in front of her, reaching for her hand. Rosalind, my dear. Lady Carlion. She flinched away from him. I never give you leave to use my name, sir. 
a foolish quibble, perhaps, considering the liberties he'd already taken. Apparently he thought so, too, for he rolled his eyes. Lady Carlyle, then. I am sorry if I have offended you. You are obviously suffering from a great shock. Now, if you will just sit here like a good girl, I'll go fetch something to help you feel better. Rosalind found the way he patted her shoulder almost as insufferable as his patronizing tone of voice. As he straightened and strode from the room, she would have given all she possessed to have fled from this place. But she still didn't trust the steadiness of her own legs. It would only mean further mortification if he was obliged to catch her again, and she could scarce leave the house in her current stage of undress. She spent the time of his absence straining to redo laces and buttons, reflecting upon how much she detested the man. Lance and Ledger was exactly the sort of rakish male who'd always rendered her most uncomfortable. Too handsome for any lady's good, insufferably arrogant, far too sure of himself. Under the protection of Arthur's wing, Rosalind had often observed men of Lance's stamp from a safe distance, dancing and flirting, flattering and teasing, bringing laughter and blushes to other ladies' cheeks. But let such a man once turn his wicked, assessing gaze in her direction, and Rosalind had always longed to dive under the nearest table. It was exactly what she wished she could do now, when Lance returned to her, far too soon. Her corset was barely tied, but if she could get her bodice adjusted, hopefully it would conceal the deficiency. Observing her struggles, Lance murmured wickedly, Do you need any help? No. Rosalind shot him a fierce glower. Although she could not reach the last few buttons, she would have died before allowing him to touch her again. Sauntering across the room, he held out a tumbler of some amber-coloured liquid. Here, he said, drink this. Rosalind accepted the glass and sniffed it suspiciously. She recoiled from the potent odour. Oh, no, I never drink brandy. It will make you feel better. A thread of impatience crept into his voice. It's not drugged if that's what you're afraid of. So come along now and drink up. He wasn't the sort of man to brook refusal. Closing his hand over hers, he guided the glass to her lips, compelling her to sip. Rosalind did so resentfully, thinking that her Sir Lancelot would never have forced spirits down a lady's throat. The fiery liquid almost caused her to choke, but as Lance compelled her to take another swallow, the brandy began to have its effect, sending a reviving warmth coursing through her veins. Better? he demanded. Rosalind hated to admit it, but if she did not, the brute would likely oblige her to consume an entire bottle of the hateful stuff. She nodded grudgingly, pushing the glass away, wishing she could thrust him away as well. He hovered far too close. As he set the glass down on the tea table, he said, Here, you're probably going to want this as well. Rosalind glanced up and was appalled to see her scarf dangling from his fingers. You wouldn't want to go about exposing your um, beauty mark, he said with a teasing smile. Her cheeks flaming, she snatched the gauzy fabric from him. You looked at me when you undressed me? You're a lovely woman. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. But from the gleam in his eye, Rosalind didn't think he was remorseful at all. She struggled to her feet, and this time was relieved to discover she could remain upright. Taking several tentative steps away, she turned her back on him and arranged the scarf round her neck, tucking the ends firmly down inside her bodice, all the while thinking furiously, Sir Lancelot never would have looked. Whipping round, Rosalind demanded to know what Lance had done with her bonnet. He looked around the scrolled legs of the chaise for it and eventually produced the missing apparel, but he seemed unable to locate the lace cap. You don't need it he handed over the bonnet. It didn't become you anyway. You're far too young to be going about attired in such matronly caps. Rosalind shot him a blistering look and half started to argue with him, but saw it was pointless. She had plenty of other lace caps, and all she wanted to do was get out of here as quickly as possible. Jamming the bonnet on her head, she jerked the ribbons into a haphazard bow beneath her chin. 
Sir Lancelot would never have misplaced her cap. He would not be so discourteous as to criticize her mode of apparel. Drawing herself up with as much composure as she could muster, Rosalind prepared to take her leave. Will you please convey my regrets to Miss Fitzledger, and tell her I shall call to inquire after her health in a day or two, when I'm feeling more myself? A day or two? How long do you intend to remain in Torakum? he demanded. I fail to see how that concerns you, sir. Good day. She dropped a stiff curtsy and flounced toward the door. But the icy dignity of her exit was interrupted as he caught hold of her arm. "'I shall escort you back to the inn,' he said, with one of his hateful, insinuating smiles. "'I'm certain you don't travel alone. Perhaps one of your servants will be far more obliging about answering my question.' "'How, how dare you, sir?' Rosalind huffed. But her fierce glower barely concealed her alarm at the thought of this man pursuing her to the inn. Though she hated being bullied, she realized she had little choice but to give him some sort of an answer. My stay in Torakum is of an indefinite nature, sir. Perhaps a week or only a few days. However long it took her to figure out what to do with the legendary sword, Rosalind wondered why the length of her stay should even matter to Lance and Ledger. But it clearly it did. He released her a faint crease forming between his brows. A few days, he muttered. Damn, that would be long enough. Long enough for what? she asked fearfully. Long enough for you to hear every blasted rumour floating round this village if Effie is stubborn enough to... He broke off, subjecting her face to a disquieting inspection through narrowed eyes. Perhaps you already have heard a deal too much about me and my family, he asked, stalking a step closer. No, I've heard nothing, Rosalind stammered, ducking her head and retreating from him. But she'd never been a good liar. Lance pursued, cornering her against the wall, trapping her in place by bracing one sinewy arm on either side of her. Earlier you referred to me as one of those dreadful St. Ledger's, Exactly what have you heard? Rosalind shook her head in denial, but Lance only leaned in closer. He crooked his fingers beneath her chin, forcing her to look up at him. Effie must have told you something, he insisted. What was it? Rosalind squirmed, thinking Lance and Ledger would have made an excellent Grand Inquisitor. Those eyes that offered no quarter, that voice so silken soft, yet able to convey a great deal of menace. Miss Fitzledger only told me a good amount of nonsense I didn't properly understand, Rosalind said. Something odd about you and your brother needing wives when the moon was full and you got this overwhelming urge to marry. And, and then Miss Fitzledger seems to think she possesses this magic power to find you a bride, and when she does, it hardly matters if the lady she designates is willing or not. You, St. Ledgers, just... Just seize the poor girl by the hair and drag her to the altar? Yes, Rosalind cringed. Some of the tension seemed to melt out of Lance and Ledger. He gave her chin a playful pinch and released her. My dear Lady Carlion, St. Ledger brides are always willing. I have never heard tell of a single St. Ledger who ever had to take a wife by force. Usually our women wax so passionate, the poor bridegroom is hard-pressed to keep the lady from diving into his bed before the ceremony can be performed. A hot blush seared Rosalind's cheeks. Sir Lancelot du Lac could certainly have taught this St. Ledger a thing or two about the virtue of humility. And to refrain from making such bawdy comments in the presence of a lady... So then, Effie did not fully explain to you about the legend, he persisted. Rosalind contemplated the possibility of ducking beneath his arm, making a bolt for the door, but her attention was arrested, dragged back to him by a single, tantalizing word. Legend. Although she despised herself for showing interest in anything this arrogant man might have to say, 
She couldn't seem to help herself. Legend? she asked. What legend? The one that has plagued my family for generations. The blasted notion that for each St. Ledger there exists one perfect mate, the partner of the soul, the ideal love that will last for all eternity. Oh, Rosalind breathed. That does not sound like much of a plague. It's wonderfully romantic. You may not think so when I'll tell you the rest of it, he replied grimly. According to the legend, we St. Ledgers must not attempt to find this perfect love for ourselves. We have to rely on the services of a person blessed with a special gift for locating our mates. Our bride finder. And currently, God help us, our bride finder is Effie Fitzledger. Then Effie did not exaggerate what she told me. You truly are obliged to marry whoever she chooses? Yes, unless we want to bring the ancient curse crashing down upon our heads. There was a curse as well. A delicious quiver worked through Rosalind, and she almost forgot how much she disliked Lance St. Ledger as she hung upon his every word. In the past, Lance continued, it seems that any St. Ledger who chose to ignore the power of the bride finder and seek out his own mate met with nothing but disaster. What kind of disaster? Rosalind asked eagerly. My brother could probably tell you better. He's made a study of our family history. But I do recollect one poor lady, Deidre St. Ledger, who lived during the time of Cromwell. Lance frowned as though in effort of memory. She refused to marry the man who was chosen for her and insisted upon taking another lover instead. And what happened to her? Apparently she met with some manner of hideous death. All that was left of her was her heart, which was bedded beneath the church floor. Rosalind pressed her hands to the region of her own heart, a dark shiver coursing through her. It was as thrilling a legend as any she'd ever heard. It only amazed her to be hearing it from the lips of a man like Lance and Ledger. Nothing of the dreamer about him, fast grounded in his own time and place from the gleaming tips of his boots to the starch in his cravat. Not at all the kind of person to go about relating fairy tales. In fact, he sounded impatient and more than a little annoyed with the entire story. Forgive my asking, Mr. St. Ledger, Rosalind said timidly, but do you actually put any faith in this legend? He shrugged, then admitted, not a great deal. Then why have you bothered telling it to me? For once, Lance's bold eyes seemed incapable of meeting her own. Because if you insist upon staying in Torakum, I thought you should be warned before word spreads through the entire village. Word of what? Rosalind asked wearily. That Effie's power has been at work again, that she believes she has found me the perfect bride. And, and who would that be? Rosalind's heart squeezed with dread. She knew the answer even before Lance and Ledger pinned her with a single dark look. You, he said softly. Oh, no, she cried. Never. I'd sooner wed the devil himself. Thank you, the devil replied dryly. Rosalind winced. She'd been far too blunt, although it was little more than he deserved. Still, she had a strong presentiment that it might be less than wise to anger a St. Ledger. I am sorry, she said, scooting her back along the wall, nearly bumping her head against the weight dangling from one of Effie's clocks as she evaded the trap formed by Lance's powerful body. It's just that I'm a widow, a recent one, and I was very devoted to my late husband. Lord Arthur Carlion was the best and most kind man in the entire world. Arthur? This paragon's name was Arthur, Lance muttered more to himself than to her. Of course, it would be. So, you see, I'm not at all interested in being married again. Not now. Not ever. Rosalind risked a dread-filled glance up at him, Effie Fitzledger's words returning to haunt her. You don't know these St. Ledgers, my lady. They can be quite ruthless about getting what they want. But Lance seemed to take her rejection calmly enough. There's no need for you to distress yourself, my dear. I quite understand. 
He levered himself away from her, much to her vast relief, until he added with a tiny sigh, I'm sure I shall grow accustomed to being doomed. Doomed? Rosalind said. Oh, Lord, she'd entirely forgotten about the curse. But surely you don't really think that... that... that I shall meet with some hideous disaster if you don't wed me? Who knows? Lance made a valiant effort to smile. At the very least, I shall be condemned to a lifetime, nay, an eternity of drifting through the world all alone. His voice sounded light enough, but there was that in his eyes that reminded Rosalind, poignantly, of Lancelot du Lac. Something a little wistful, a little lost, a little sad. Scarce thinking what she did, she impulsively held out her hand to Lance. Oh, no, you can marry someone else. It is only a legend, after all. And you don't believe in legends? Well, yes, but only ones like Camelot or the Fall of Troy. Ah, I see. You only believe in legends when they are long ago and far away. How very convenient. And safe. No, I didn't mean... I... I... Rosalind trailed off dismayed at how easily Lance and Ledger could get her flustered and confused. He'd taken possession of her hand again, and the things he was doing to it with his mouth. Warm kisses, soft kisses, just the whisper of his lips against each fingertip, sending her nerve endings a jangle like chimes caught in the wind. She wondered why she didn't simply pull away from him. But his very gentleness took her by surprise, somehow disarmed her. I am sure there is nothing to this legend of the chosen bride. I am sure you'll be all right, she said breathlessly, the brush of his mouth against her wrist, causing her heart to pound faster. And suddenly she didn't feel sure of much of anything. She regarded Lance with deep distress. If only you hadn't come here today. If only you hadn't tempted the curse by asking Effie to find you a bride. I didn't. But you said, no, I didn't. Actually, it was my brother Val who came to consult Effie's power. I only bore him company. I'm not the least bit interested in acquiring a wife. Rosalind stared at him, stunned. Still bending over her hand, he peered at her through the thickness of his dark lashes. She saw the glint and realized how wickedly he'd taken advantage of her concern, how easily he'd made a fool of her again. She snatched her hand away. You, you villain! Legends, curses, she sputtered. You never believed a word of this chosen bride story. I dare say you made up this whole thing just to tease me. Do you take nothing seriously? No, I fear I don't, he drawled. And you'd do well to remember that, lady. I don't need to remember anything, because I never want to set eyes on you again. She felt her face flame with humiliation, and choked. To think I ever fancied you could be in the least like him, even for a moment. Like him? Lance looked confused. Then his eyes lit up. Ah, that mysterious friend of yours that I resemble. His lips twitched with an odd smile. He must be a devilishly handsome fellow. He is far more handsome than you. Lance blinked in astonishment. The more I look at you, the more I realize there is no likeness at all, Rosalind went on, her words propelled by a mixture of fury and wounded pride. He is by far taller than you and broader through the shoulders. His brow is more noble, his hair darker and more lustrous, his chin far stronger and more manly. And as for his eyes... They are at least a dozen times finer and more expressive than yours. Lance swiveled toward the oval mirror that hung near the door. He rubbed one hand along the line of his jaw, studying his own reflection, with a startled look on his face, as though it came as quite a shock to the conceited man to hear that there might exist someone better looking than himself. Rosalind wagered that it wasn't often anyone could give the arrogant Lance and Ledger such a set-down, let alone a lady usually as shy as herself. She continued with a savage sense of satisfaction. 
And as for manners, my friends are far superior. So kind and courteous, and he recites poetry. Poetry? Lance pulled one more wry face at himself, then wrenched his gaze from the mirror. This fellow actually minced about spouting verses at you. He sounds like an incredible ass. Well, he's not, Rosalind snapped. He's courageous and brave, yet so gentle. He would never pounce upon a half-conscious lady and steal a kiss. He would never embrace her at all without asking. This fool goes about asking women for kisses? Lance's eyes danced with a mocking amusement. Yes, and in the most tender way possible. Despite her anger with Lance, Rosalind's voice softened at the memory of her gallant knight. He would say something romantic like, I beg the honour of saluting you, lady. She fixed Lance with a scornful glare. That is the proper way to go about it. That is the gentlemanly way. So, let me get this clear. If I were only to ask you for a kiss, you would give it to me? Certainly not. Rosalind thrust her chin high into the air. Not even if you begged. Having dealt him this final crushing blow, she prepared to sweep triumphantly from the room. But she should have known it wouldn't be so easy to quell Lance and Ledger. She'd scarce taken a step when his arm lashed round her waist, drawing her back to him. There's only one problem with that, my lady, he murmured, his eyes glimmering dangerously. I never ask. Before she could even draw breath, he bent her back over his arm, setting her off balance. A startled cry escaped Rosalind, but he smothered it with his lips, his mouth taking hers in a hard, fierce kiss. Frightened, furious, she struggled in his embrace, flailing her fists against his back, helpless against the iron strength of his arms, the insistent pressure of his lips. If Lance and Ledger had determined to terrify her, alarm her into fleeing the village, he could not have been more ruthless. His mouth bruised, plundered, ravaged hers, rendering her so giddy she whimpered in protest. If it had been at all possible to have summoned Sir Lancelot from his grave to defend her, she would have done so. But all she could do was submit, trembling in Lance's arms. Just as she feared she might faint all over again, he suddenly broke the contact, hauling her upright. He regarded her with a strange frown, and when she returned his stare reproachfully, she was surprised to see a hint of regret in his eyes, but not enough to stop him from holding her fast in his arms, preparing to kiss her again. Please don't, she begged, trying to insinuate her hands between them, hold him off. But he caught her wrists, sweeping her arms behind her back, crushing her breasts against the wall of his chest. She cast him a pleading look, only to shut her eyes tight as his mouth claimed hers again. Not quite so ruthlessly this time. He was more gentle, more coaxing. His lips slanted over hers, tasting, exploring the texture of her mouth, forcing her to taste of his. A taste that was hot, strangely sweet. She tried to hold herself rigid, feel nothing but the ice of her outrage, but it was impossible as his kiss waxed more seductive. To her dismay, she felt her body quicken with involuntary response, something stirring deep within her. Perhaps she had gone too long unkissed. Perhaps she had never been kissed quite this way before. His lips teased hers apart, his tongue slipping into the hollows of her mouth, filling her with a moist, secret heat, unleashing hungers she never knew herself capable of, flinging open dark corridors of her heart she had never dared peer into before, arousing her, awakening her, frightening her. When he finally drew back, her breath was coming quick and fast. But then, so was his. Rosalind, he murmured her name in a husky whisper. 
His dark eyes glowed with unexpected tenderness, passion and desire, and the triumph of a man who knew exactly what he'd done to her. Her heat became the flush of shame, and she jerked to one side, desperate to free herself. Her frantic movement caught him off guard, and she wrenched one wrist out of his grip. She struck out blindly at his face, pain spiking up her fist. He staggered back with a muffled roar, clutching his nose, his eyes flying wide with astonishment. Rosalind whirled and fled from the parlour, running as though her very soul depended on it. Val limped up Effie's cobblestone walk. So troubled by remorse, he didn't even register the fact that her front door stood wide open. He could scarce believe what he'd done, abandoning Lance that way, turning his back upon a lady who required his assistance, a lady who for several heart-stopping moments he'd thought was to be his. But when he'd realized his mistake, heard Effie declare she was to be Lance's bride, Lance, who didn't even want a wife, who seemed incapable of appreciating such blessed fortune. It had aroused such a dark bitterness in Val, such a savage jealousy of his brother. He'd been deeply shaken by it. He'd had to trudge several times around the village before he'd been able to subdue his demons and return. But now he was prepared, he hoped, to do the decent and honourable thing and wish his brother every happiness. As he stumped through Effie's foyer, it did occur to Val that the house had fallen unusually silent. The parlour door stood ajar, and he approached hesitantly, not wanting to blunder in on any lover's embrace. The passion between us and Ledger and his chosen bride was supposed to come on rather swiftly, an instant reckoning of hearts. As soon as Lance experienced it, Val doubted his brother would waste much time. He poked his head cautiously inside the parlour door. There was no sign of Lady Carlion, but Lance stood by the tea-table, his back to Val. Clutching one hand to the side of his head, he appeared to be draining a tumbler of brandy. Lance? Val called. What the devil do you want? Lance's voice was oddly muffled. Val stole farther into the room, a feeling of foreboding creeping over him. Something had gone terribly wrong here. Where is Lady Carlyne? he asked anxiously. Am I not to wish you joy? Wish me joy! Lance's snort turned into a smothered oath. He whirled, and Val gasped at the sight of the bloodied handkerchief Lance pressed to his face. His dark eyes glared at Val from above a swelling nose. Frankly, he said, I don't envision much joy with a woman who likes me a great deal better as a ghost. Chapter 5 Ominous clouds lowered over the village during the week that followed, turning the sea cold and grey, rough with white caps. Thunder occasionally grumbled in the distance, threatening but never delivering the promised storm, producing an unbearable tension in the air. And no one felt it more keenly than Lance and Ledger. Irritable and brooding by turns, he sought an outlet for his pent-up emotion by crossing swords with Rafe Mortmain. Stalking a brief distance up the beach from the Dragon's Fire Inn, the two men stripped down to their shirt sleeves and drew out a magnificent matched set of dueling foils from Rafe's velvet-lined case. Boots braced against the rocky shingle of beach, they faced each other, saluting briefly before striking a pose. Then steel hissed against steel. It was only a lark the sort of friendly rivalry Lance and Rafe frequently engaged in. But any folk peering down from the nearby village might have been pardoned for fearing that the St. Ledger-Mortmain feud had broken out all over again. Rafe dueled with a feral grace, his aquiline features cool and collected. 
his dark hair cropped after the fashion of a Roman soldier, his moustache neatly trimmed. A tall man, he had the advantage of Lance both in inches and in the steely precision of his movements. Lance fought with his usual recklessness, venting all of his recent frustration in every lunge and parry he made. Frustration of nearly a week spent riding out every day, pursuing futile leads, and still no trace of his ancestral sword. And frustration of a far different sort, brought on by a memory he could not seem to shake. The memory of a stolen kiss. His gaze flickered past Rafe to the distant outline of the inn, the row of mullioned windows on the upper floor. Even now, Rosalind might be peering out at him. Oof, Lance grunted as the tip of Rafe's foil slipped past his guard and rammed hard against his shoulder. A hit, Rafe sang out softly. Damnation, Mortmain, Lance growled, flexing his bruised shoulder. If you'd hit me any harder, I think you'd have run me through even with the end blunted. Then stop mooning over your lady love and pay attention. Lance started to blurt out a hot denial, only to check himself. Insisting he hadn't been thinking about Rosalind would only confirm the fact. Besides, he knew race tactics too well. The man wielded his tongue as sharply as he did his sword. Too often he'd won these little contests between them simply by goading Lance into losing his temper. But not this time, Lance vowed. Not this time. Assuming a defensive stance, he braced himself for Rafe's next onslaught. Rafe circled him with all the loose-limbed grace of a wolf, stalking his prey. Lady Carlion is still there, residing at the inn, he purred. If that is what you are fretting about... I saw her myself only this morning. As if Lance needed Rafe to inform him of that, he was all too keenly aware that Lady Carlion had not left Torricum, had spent far too many sleepless nights this past week, tossing and turning, thinking of Rosalind at the dragon's fire, alone in her bed. Lance attacked, getting in several fierce strokes, which Rafe easily parried. I don't give a damn about Lady Carlion. Of course you don't, Rafe soothed. No doubt that is why you've been avoiding drinking with me in the taproom all week. It might be awkward running into a lady one is uh, so indifferent to. Lance gritted his teeth, trying to ignore Rafe's silken voice. He pressed in harder with a series of reckless slashes, all of which Rafe deftly blocked. Never known you to run from a woman before. Not that I blame you. With all that talk Effie has been spreading about Lady Carline being your chosen bride. Will you just shut your mouth and fight? Lance snapped. Before you know where you are at, you could end up leg shackled. Especially if you get overcome by one of those strange St. Ledger urges I've heard tell of. The only urge I'm getting is to throttle you, Mortmain. Lance struck out savagely, but Rafe leapt nimbly back with an infuriating smile. I'll tell you what, Sir Lancelot, just in case your lady might be watching us from one of yon windows. I could let you win, just this once. Lance cursed and made a wild rush at Rafe. In one skilled movement, Rafe knocked the sword from his grasp. Lance tripped over a piece of driftwood, only to sprawl ignominiously on his back. Lance struggled up to his elbows, fighting to regain his breath, disgusted. Despite his best resolve, he'd done it again, allowed Rafe to goad him into losing his temper. Surrender, St. Ledger, Rafe said, with a dramatic flourish, lowering the tip of his sword until it pointed directly at Lance's throat. Lance glowered up at him. Go to the devil, Mordmain! Rafe merely smiled. The clouds shifted across the sky, casting a strange shadow over his face, his eyes glittering with a wolf-like intensity. Lance experienced a frisson of inexplicable unease, as though for a moment they'd both forgotten that the tip of Rafe's foil was blunted, and this was only a game, one they had played many times before. Then Rafe lowered the sword, the odd expression dissolving into a hearty laugh. 
He reached down one hand to Lance and hauled him to his feet. Feeling more disgruntled than angry, Lance dusted sand off the seat of his breeches while Rafe consulted his pocket watch. Seventeen minutes, Rafe pronounced with a mock sigh. Usually I can manage to get you disarmed within ten. I must be losing my touch. Perhaps those eight years you have on me are beginning to take their toll, old man, Lance shot back. One of these days I might actually manage to get the better of you. Perhaps, assuming you live long enough to see the day, Rafe said softly. Anyone else might have taken the remark, and the look that accompanied it, to have sinister overtones. But Lance had discovered, early on in his friendship with Rafe Mortmain, that the man enjoyed nothing so much as unsettling people. Lance returned the comment with a rude gesture, moving to retrieve his sword from where it had fallen. As he did so, he couldn't resist sneaking another glance back toward the windows of the inn, and he cursed under his breath. He couldn't seem to go five minutes without his thoughts straying back to Rosalind Carlyon. Why the devil was the woman still lingering here in Torricombe anyway? She'd scarce set foot out of her room this past week, but her mere presence in the village had been enough to cause Lance no end of trouble. That and Effie's wagging tongue, boasting to anyone who would listen that she had found Lance and Ledger's chosen bride. The word had gotten out just as Lance had feared, He'd been besieged by a horde of St. Ledger's, distant relatives Lance hadn't clapped eyes on for years, all calling in at Castle Ledger, demanding to know when the wedding would be. And the worst by far was Lance's own brother. Val simply could not understand what could have possibly gone wrong, why Rosalind hadn't immediately surrendered her heart to Lance. Lance was not about to enlighten him, to confess that instead of wooing his destined bride... Lance had done his utmost to frighten her into fleeing his side forever. At least, that's what he had started out to do. But at what point had he forgotten his only intention had been to terrify her? Perhaps as soon as their lips had met. Such a rush of desire had coursed through him, sweet and hot and almost overpowering. Not so surprising a reaction, since Rosalind was a lovely woman. What had been surprising and disturbing were the other emotions that had stirred inside him, the unexpected wonder and pleasure of feeling her response. His kiss had aroused Rosalind, whether she'd wanted it to or not. He'd been able to taste the longing on her lips, see it in her eyes, somewhere beyond the Lady of the Lake, beyond the prim and proper widow, was a woman... Rosalind herself had yet to discover, a woman warm, vibrant, and passionate. And somehow he couldn't stop wondering what it would be like to help Rosalind find her. Take care, Sir Lancelot, Rafe's amused voice broke in on Lance's wayward thoughts, dragging his attention back to the windswept beach. He was startled to find Rafe at his elbow, reaching for the dueling foil that Lance held in a careless grip. Perhaps you'd better give me that before you do yourself harm. I'm not sure dueling was such a good idea. You seem a trifle... Rafe paused to direct a significant smile in the direction of the inn. A trifle, shall we say, distracted? Lance scowled at him, and he thrust the foil into Rafe's grasp, but he was more annoyed with himself than with his friend, irritated that he'd allowed Rosalind to invade his mind again. Deliberately turning his back on the dragon's fire, he growled at Rafe, If I am distracted, you know damn well why, and it has nothing to do with any woman. I shouldn't be here playing games. I should be out looking... Rafe cut him off with a low groan. Oh, please, can we not go one afternoon without mentioning that damned crystal sword? No, I can't. I should be searching. Lance, we have searched. Every rock and cranny between here and Penrith. Between the two of us, we've covered the entire coast, tracked down every tinker and farmer who attended the fair that night. We've simply run out of places to look. So then what am I supposed to do, Rafe? Simply forget about it? Rafe didn't answer, 
he gathered up both foils and hunkered down, taking his time about placing them back in the case. At last he said, Is that sword really so important, Lance? You St. Ledgers have so many other treasures. Oh, I'll admit it is a magnificent blade. I admired it myself. But when all's said and done, it's nothing more than an old sword, isn't it? Unless you believe all that superstition about the crystal possessing some strange power. Rafe cast him a sharp, searching glance. You don't, do you? Lance shrugged. What I believe doesn't matter. But to my family, that sword is magic, tradition, honour, everything the St. Ledger name is supposed to represent. My father especially. If I don't find the bloody thing before he returns, I don't know how I'll face him. Rafe slowly straightened, arching one dark brow. What? Afraid of a tongue lashing from Papa? It is not his temper I dread, but his disappointment. The fact that once again I... Lance broke off, flushing under Rafe's sardonic smile. It isn't always easy being the son of a legend. You couldn't possibly understand. Rafe's smile faded. No, I don't suppose I could, he replied coldly, since I don't have the least notion who my father was. Damn it, Rafe, you know I didn't mean... Lance said. But Rafe was already turning away, stalking up the beach to where he'd left his naval coat, his back assuming that familiar, rigid line. Rafe was usually the most unruffled of men. Only on one subject was he unusually sensitive, the circumstances of his birth. Lance stalked after him. Rafe, I'm sorry, Lance began awkwardly, but Rafe cut him off. What for? Rafe scooped up his coat, slinging it over one shoulder in a stance that was a shade too careless. It's scarcely your fault that my mother was a sometime actress and a full-time whore, and a cursed mortmain to boot. According to everyone in the village, you should not even be my friend. Don't be ridiculous, and I am sure your brother, the saintly Valentine, tells you the same. You know how little heed I pay to what Val says, Lance said impatiently, especially when he starts nattering on about the Mortmain St. Ledger feud. All those tales about how an argument over land led to the Mortmains attacking the St. Ledgers and the St. Ledgers returning the favour, a pack of old nonsense. My mother apparently didn't think so, Rafe replied tersely. She plotted to destroy your entire family. She didn't succeed, and anyway, that all happened before I was born. Lance had always felt uncomfortable discussing the past with Rafe. Evelyn Mortmain had been a murderess and a madwoman, but she still had been Rafe's mother. However, since Rafe had been the one to broach the subject, Lance couldn't help asking. You were only about eight years old when your mother died. D do you remember much about her? Only that she could be wildly affectionate one minute and boxing my ears the next. Rafe's jaw hardened, and that she abandoned me in France while she pursued her crazed schemes of vengeance against your family. I'm sure she would have returned for you if... if... if Evelyn Mortmain hadn't been killed herself in her attempt to murder Lance's own parents. Lance faltered to silence, and a dark, brooding expression settled over Rafe's handsome features. They were both treading too near matters that might have rendered their friendship awkward, and, as usual, Lance was swift to shy away from it. Rifling through the pocket of his own discarded waistcoat, Lance produced a small flask, which he extended to Rafe. Rafe took a grateful swallow, only to draw back, squinting down at the bottle with a suspicious frown. This is some damn fine French brandy you've got here, St. Ledger. It ought to be, Lance said. It's yours. Rafe shot him an indignant look, which Lance returned with a grin. You dropped the flask last night when we were out searching for my sword. How good of you to eventually remember to return it to me. 
But Rafe's feigned umbrage vanished in the wake of a quick laugh. As he passed the bottle back to Lance, any tension between them seemed to dissolve. Lance took a pull at the flask, the amber liquid sliding smoothly over his tongue. He remarked teasingly, This is excellent brandy, enough to make me wonder if instead of pursuing those smugglers of yours, you've been purchasing their wares. I might as well join them, Rafe said, for all the more luck I've had in apprehending anyone. Rafe's grumbling sounded more light than serious, but Lance's conscience still pricked him. He knew better than anyone how much Rafe despised his post as a riding officer, the assignment that had brought him to this isolated stretch of Cornwall. Rafe's heart had ever belonged to the sea, glorying in the command he'd once had of a custom vessel. But with the end of the war against France, so many of those sloops had been retired, including Rafe's. Rafe was now landlocked, and he hated it. If Rafe managed to bring a halt to the smuggling activity that had plagued this stretch of coast lately, he might once more have a chance of a better position in the customs department. Lance felt a stab of guilt for all the nights he'd involved Rafe in the fruitless quest for the missing sword, all the time Rafe had spent away from his official duties. He attempted to apologize, to express some of his gratitude for Rafe's help, but as usual Rafe would have none of it, and Lance was forced to subside. They stood sharing the flask of brandy, both of them staring out toward the churning waters. A companionable silence settled between them. Lance was seldom given to reflect upon such things, but he couldn't help marvelling at the ease of his friendship with Rafe Mortmain, not because of the ancient feud, but more because of how little he really knew about the man. They'd spent the one summer together as boys. When Rafe had turned sixteen, he'd finally managed to make his way to Cornwall, looking for his heritage. He had led a hard life, from what little Lance knew of it. Abandoned in Paris by Evelyn Mortmain during the terrors of the French Revolution, Rafe had somehow survived, only to discover his mother long dead. Evelyn had been the last of the Mortmains, and Rafe had no other kin. Despite the bad blood between their families, the orphaned boy had briefly been taken in by Lance's own father and mother, and Lance had recalled trailing after the brooding youth like an adoring puppy. But that had all ended abruptly after the accident in which Lance had almost lost his life, and Rafe had run off to sea without even saying goodbye. Lance had eventually pursued his own career in the army, and their paths hadn't crossed again until recently, when Lance had returned to Cornwall. Yet, despite the passage of time, Lance had been amazed at how easily they'd resumed their friendship. Why was that? Lance wondered. Because he could relax when he was with Rafe? Be himself? No reminders of his failings? No expectations? No disappointment? Or was it simply the restlessness that often consumed both of them? Drifters, the pair of them. Lance was aware that even now they both regarded the far horizon with the same hungry gaze. Lance nudged Rafe's arm, pointing to a stretch of beach that was now all but obscured by the foam-capped sea nipping greedily at the land. Remember when we were boys... How we used to race along there when the tide was out. You raced, Rafe said. As I recall, I was simply trying to get away from you, infernal little pest, always trailing after me on that pony you so optimistically named Charger. Charger! Lance mused with a soft smile. I'd have forgotten him. He was a noble steed. He was a fat slug. Good enough to keep pace with you, Mortmain. Unless you weren't riding away as fast as you pretended. Besides, you couldn't have loathed my company as much as you claim. You did save my life out at the Maiden Lake that day. Lance always took great pleasure in reminding Rafe of that fact. Damned puppy, Rafe snorted. I warned you if you tried swimming in that stagnant pond, you would get tangled in the reeds. 
Lord, how you cursed when you had to wade in and cut me free. I ruined the new pair of boots your mother had given me. I should have let you drown. Can't think why I didn't. But Rafe's mouth twitched into a reluctant smile. Different from his usual smirk, it eased the hardness from his sharp, chiseled features, softening his cold grey eyes. It was a rare glimpse of the warmth that Rafe was capable of, and Lance feared he was the only one ever to see it, which was a pity. If Rafe could occasionally let down his guard with the folk in the village, it would have made him better liked, might even have been enough to make people forget he bore the cursed surname of Mortmain. But Rafe was already fidgeting with the end of his moustache, retreating behind his customary urbane mask. Well, St. Ledger, he drawled, as charming as I find your company, I fear I must tear myself away. Since I am not likely to inherit a castle from anyone, I must be about my work. Ignoring Rafe's jibe about his inheritance, Lance said scornfully, What? Hunting smugglers in broad daylight? Small wonder you haven't caught them. It so happens that a paid informant has given me a tip. There's a farmer hereabouts who might know more about the local smuggling trade than he's telling. The devil, you say? Who would that be? Andrew Taylor. Andrew Taylor? Lance exclaimed. No, surely not. He's one of my tenants, and too honest to even take a sip of smuggled brandy. I've always found him completely trustworthy. Ah, but then you have a lamentable tendency to trust everyone, Sir Lancelot, Rafe mocked. He shrugged into his frock coat, navy with brass buttons. It was part of the official uniform of the captain who commanded customs vessels, and Rafe was no longer truly entitled to wear it. Lance watched with a troubled frown as Rafe lovingly smoothed down the sleeve. He said hesitantly, Rafe, you will take care, won't you? Yours is not the most popular occupation. Riding officers have been known to meet with... with unexpected accidents. And you make a damn fine target riding out through the countryside attired in that coat. Rafe merely smiled at his warning. If I'm ever found lying face down with a bullet in my back, it will not be because of my profession, but more likely because I am a scurvy mortmain. Sometimes I think I would have been better off if I'd given over trying to be respectable and simply pursued the trade I always dreamed of when we were young. What was that? I was going to be a pirate, remember? Oh, I. Lance laughed. And in your more mellow moments, you even promised me I could be your cabin boy. The offer is still open. Thank you, Lance said dryly. When my father returns home and discovers I've lost the St. Ledger's sword, I may have to take you up on that. Although Rafe continued to smile, he turned away, gathering up the case that held his dueling foils. When he came about again, Lance saw that Rafe's amusement had vanished, his grey eyes suddenly intent and serious. Don't fret over that damn sword, Lance, he growled. I, I will help you recover the blasted thing somehow. Before Lance could reply, Rafe pivoted on his heel and stalked away, back up the beach, heading toward the Dragon's Fire Inn. Lance watched him go, suppressing his smile, not in the least disconcerted by Rafe's abrupt departure. Rafe had always had trouble revealing the more tender side of his nature. Lance was both amused and touched by Rafe's gruff concern. His offer to help Lance keep searching for the sword even though he obviously thought the quest futile. Lance himself was beginning to despair of recovering the weapon, at least through conventional means. But, considering who he was, there was always another way. The St. Ledger way. Lance had hoped to keep his unusual family out of this affair, but the time had come, he thought grimly, he no longer had any choice.
Chapter 6 Castle Ledger perched high atop the rugged cliffs, the medieval aspect of the old keep with its soaring towers shadowing the more modern wing of the manor. But even in the newer portion of the house, the walls seemed to bear down upon Lance, steeped in ancient tradition, reminding him of promises he'd failed to keep. Avoiding the servants, he barricaded himself in the library. The chamber lined floor to ceiling with shelves of books, most of which he'd never been able to sit still long enough to read. He only retreated there now because he knew it would be one of the last places anyone would think to look for him, and he might be able to complete his task uninterrupted. A grim task that he did not at all relish. The gloom-ridden afternoon already necessitated the lighting of candles, and Lance moved the candelabrum to the massive desk that dominated one corner of the room. The soft light spilled over the paper, ink and quill that awaited. Only one item on the desk appeared incongruous in this peaceful setting, like a warrior attempting to hunker down uncomfortably in a schoolroom, the empty scabbard perched precariously on the edge of the desk. The scabbard, that should have been heavier by the weight of a sword, the very symbol of Lance's failure. He fingered the leather sheath wearily, wistfully, knowing that Rafe was right in what he'd said. They had searched everywhere. It was as though the thief had appeared in a puff of sea mist and vanished the same way, taking the St. Ledger's sword along with him. The weapon would never be recovered by ordinary means. As much as it chafed him to do so, Lance was going to have to ask for help. There was a distant cousin, a daughter of Hadrian St. Ledger, who'd emigrated to Ireland after she'd married her chosen lord. Maeve O'Donnell was said to possess a power very similar to one Lance's own grandfather had had, the ability to divine the whereabouts of lost things. Maeve's gift might well be Lance's only remaining hope, though it would involve confessing his own folly in losing the sword. Word of it would surely spread through the other St. Ledger's, the tale eventually bound to reach his father's ears. Lance felt himself sicken with shame at the thought, though he hardly knew why it should continue to matter. It wasn't as though Anatole St. Ledger had ever been led to expect any better from his oldest son. Sighing, Lance settled behind the desk and reached for a blank sheet of vellum. This was undoubtedly the hardest letter he'd ever had to write, his own fierce pride battling against him with every stroke of the pen. He dipped his quill into the inkwell, forcing himself to begin. My dear Maeve, after all these years you will scarce remember me as more than the annoying little cousin who once slipped a snake into your reticule, but... The library door, crashing open, startled Lance, nearly causing him to smear ink down the length of the page. He glanced up in annoyance to see his brother charge into the room. Damn it, Val! Lance growled. Haven't you ever heard of knocking first? But Val took no heed of his complaint. He hadn't even bothered to shed his mud-spattered boots or his travel-stained tan riding cape. Closing the door behind him, he marched straight up to Lance, his determined stride little impeded by his injured leg. Val leaned across the desk and announced without preamble, I've just come back from the village, Lance. She's ordered up her horses. She's planning to leave tomorrow. Lance tensed, not even having to ask which she Val meant. Rosalind leaving. It was tidings Lance should have been glad to hear, but an odd sensation passed through him, as though cold fingers wrapped around his heart and squeezed. He ignored it and went on with his letter. Blast it, Lance, did you hear me? Val demanded. I said that Lady Carlion is leaving, Lance interrupted, never lifting his eyes from the paper. So what do you want me to do about it? Send her some flowers and wish her Godspeed? No, damn it! Val slapped his palm down on the table so hard he nearly overset the inkpot. I want you to go see her now, before it's too late. Too late for what? Lance asked, moving the ink safely beyond Val's reach. 
for the infernal woman to have another chance to break my nose. She nearly succeeded the last time. And I am quite sure you deserved it. Very likely I did. Lance forced an unconcerned shrug. You know what I'm like with women. I do well. You tease, you flirt, you torment, you attempt to seduce. But somehow I thought you might be different with Rosalind. Lance kept on with his letter, but inwardly he squirmed beneath Val's reproachful gaze. For somehow he had thought he might be different with Rosalind too. His sweet and gentle maiden. His lady of the lake. But it hardly mattered, for she was finally going, and Lance was relieved. It was only the fact that Val had taken to pacing in front of the table that was making Lance feel so damned tense. For the love of heaven, Val said, you can't just sit there and allow this woman to slip away from you, your chosen bride, the lady you were born to love. According to Effie Fitzledger, Lance reminded his brother, according to your own heart... St. Ledgers are always supposed to know when they've found their one true love. Are you going to tell me you felt nothing when you were with Rosalind? Lance crinkled his nose. Yes, I felt pain, a great deal of it. And the overwhelming need to touch her, to go on touching her. Frowning with annoyance, Lance went back to his letter. He congratulated himself on having completed the arduous task, despite all of Val's haranguing until he glanced down at the bottom of the page. There, he discovered that where his own signature should have been scrawled, he had distractedly inked in another name. Rosalind. Swearing savagely, Lance crumpled the letter into a ball. He shoved to his feet and stormed over to the fireplace, consigning his ruined effort to the fire that had been lit to take some of the dampness out of the room. To his complete aggravation, Val trailed after him, like an annoying burr stuck to his coattails. Why won't you even go to see her, Lance, and at least apologize for whatever you did to upset her? What are you afraid of? The unexpected question took Lance aback for a moment, but he made a quick recovery. I'm not afraid of anything, he said, snatching up the poker and jabbing it at the half-hearted flames. Rosalind Carlyle might swing a mean fist, but I think I could defend myself against the woman. Especially since you always manage to keep your heart well out of the action. Are you so afraid Effie's wrong? Is that what it is? No, I'm dead certain she is. Lance shot his brother an exasperated look. Rosalind doesn't even want me. She wants some, some damned fool knight in shining armour. Sir Lancelot du Lac. Lance attempted to sneer, but found he couldn't quite manage it. Strange that it should still rankle so much. Rosalind's obvious preference for the ghostly legend he had created for her. You should have heard her flaming description of her great hero. By the time she was done, I wasn't even sure it was me she met that night. Then go tell her the truth. That shows all the more you know about women, St. Valentine, Lance replied acidly, jamming the poker back into its iron boot. They don't want the truth, they want fairy tales, and I don't have time for such God-cursed nonsense. I have more important matters on my mind. What could be more important than the woman you are meant to love for all eternity? How about the sword I was sworn to protect for a slightly shorter duration? Lance seized the empty scabbard, and shook it under his brother's nose. Or have you entirely forgotten about that? Even with Rafe's help, I haven't... Rafe? Rafe Mortmain? Val interrupted. You've been allowing him to help you look for the sword? Yes, what of it? Lance asked, glaring. Mm, nothing, Val said. Although a worried frown creased his brow. He made a quick recovery, however, returning to the subject of Rosalind. Lance, if you lose your chosen bride, you'll have no use for the sword. I don't have any bloody use for it now. Lance slammed the scabbard back on the table, his brother's persistence fraying at already raw nerves. I didn't come to Castle Ledger to fall prey to some infernal legend. 
Then why did you come back? The devil if I know! Lance paced over to the desk, grinding his teeth when Val followed. And what about the curse, Lance? His brother continued to argue. You know what sort of terrible things happen to St. Ledger's who turn away from their chosen mates. Remember the story of Lady Deidre? Aye, she ended up with her heart buried beneath the church floor. I hardly think I need worry about that. I don't have a heart. Lance all but flung himself back into the chair, dragging another sheet of vellum toward him. If he could have but five minutes of peace, he could redo the letter. But it was an all but impossible task, with Val hovering over him. Then you're determined to let the greatest miracle any St. Ledger could ever know just vanish from your life? He asked in disbelief. You won't lift one finger to stop Rosalind? No, Lance snapped. If you think the woman's such a blasted miracle, go, go court her yourself. Val paled. You don't know how much I wish... How often I... Don't tempt me, Lance, he said hoarsely. You've taken such a dislike to Rosalind, then? Good God, no, she's an angel. What makes you even ask such a thing? Because I reckon you must detest the unfortunate lady a great deal, Lance said, to be wishing her wed to a bastard like me. You know I'm never serious with any woman. I've never been faithful to a single one of them. Not since Adele Montreuil, Val began, but Lance cut him off with a dark look. Leave it alone, Val, he warned softly. Leave me alone. Val stared at him for a long moment, his eyes seething with the frustration of all the things he clearly wanted to say, but he compressed his lips together and stumped toward the door. He only paused on the threshold to add in accents of rare bitterness, I'll never understand you, Lance. You've always been blessed with so much, yet I've never seen any man so determined to throw it all away. He let himself out, the sharp click of the door somehow more of a reproof than if he'd slammed it. Lance clenched his jaw, going back to his letter, trying to put Val's intrusion out of his mind. But the peace he had so craved seemed to have turned deafening that he could scarce string two words together. Lance flung down his pen with a frustrated oath and dropped his head into his hands. It had to be one of the greatest ironies of his existence, he thought. He'd spent most of his life trying to provoke his brother, doing his best to make Val think ill of him, and yet there was no one whose disapproval could disturb him more. Damn St. Valentine, anyway. He couldn't really have expected Lance to up and marry Rosalind Carlyon because of some family legend. Just go see the woman. Tell her the truth, Lance muttered, mimicking his brother's tone. Sweep her up on some white charger and live happily ever after. If only it were that blasted simple. It would have been for Val, with all his earnest beliefs and romantic illusions. But for someone who'd grown as cynical and jaded as Lance... He was actually doing Rosalind Carlyle a favour by staying away from her. Frowning, he shifted and groped in the pocket of the frock coat he'd left draped over the back of the chair. He found the object he sought and dragged it out, keeping it clutched in his fists. Cautiously, Lance opened his hands and smoothed out what he held, a lady's white linen cap. He stole a furtive glance toward the door, half fearing Val might decide to barge back in on him. That would be all he'd need for his brother to realise Lance had been carrying Rosalind Carlyon's cap around in his pocket all this week. Like some idiotic knight, cherishing a token of his lady fair. He didn't know what had induced him to hide the cap from her in the first place. One of his devil's pranks, he supposed. He'd hated seeing her wear the damn thing, covering up every last wisp of her glorious moonspun hair, his Lady of the Lake transforming herself into a starched and proper matron. Those widow's weeds of hers were bad enough, all those yards of black hiding her willowy charms. 
She was far too young to go about buried in mourning for some blasted noble idiot named Arthur. But Lance was not the man to remedy the situation. His knight-errant days had been ended a long time ago, ended by his disastrous affair with Adele Montreuil, along with all his stupid boyish dreams of love and glory. He'd been in and out of too many women's beds since then, fought in too many meaningless battles, bouts of lust and reckless carousing interspersed with the blaze of cannon fire and the screams of dying men. Not the career of any valiant hero, only that of a common soldier, a little more jaded than most. It wouldn't even have mattered if Effie was right about Rosalind Carlyon being destined to be Lance's bride. The Lady of the Lake had come looking for her shining Sir Lancelot years too late. With a sigh of something close to regret, Lance finished folding the cap and tucked it away, intending to see it return to Rosalind first thing in the morning. As for the missing sword, if he ever did manage to find it, the best thing he could do was surrender it to his brother, along with his birthright, and ride away again. Once he had longed for nothing more than that, to escape from Castle Ledger. But now the thought left him strangely dispirited. He was tired, that was all, Lance told himself. Sweeping paper, pen and ink aside, he braced his head upon his forearms, resting them on the table, intending to close his eyes for only a few moments. In less than that, Lance had fallen asleep. But not a restful repose, one clouded with disturbing dreams of himself mounted upon a white charger, racing frantically through the village toward the spires of St. Gothian's Church. He was late, damn it, late for his own wedding. He galloped through the throngs of cheering villagers, tossing flowers, and all but hurled himself from the back of his horse, trying to run. But he was weighed down by the armour he wore, heavy plates of gleaming metal. Each dragging step he took seemed to bring him no closer, and yet, when he glanced up, she was waiting for him on the steps of the church. Rosalind, his lady of the lake, clad in her flowing white nightgown, a wreath of lilies of the valley entwined in her golden hair. He stumbled forward at last to kneel at her feet. She beamed down upon him, her blue eyes shining, and he groped for the sword at his side to offer it up to her, along with his heart and soul, forever. But as he drew forth the St. Ledger sword, he was horrified to discover the magnificent blade broken and tarnished. The crystal cracked. Rosalind shrank away from him, her face clouding with disappointment. No, my lady, Lance cried. Wait, I beg you. She merely cast him a sorrowful look, enshrouding herself in a cloak of midnight. Pulling up the hood, she drifted across the churchyard, becoming lost to him in the gathering mist. Rosalind, please, don't go! Lance thrashed wildly, fighting the heavy armour. In his efforts to struggle to his feet, he all but fell off the library chair, snapping himself abruptly awake. He clutched at the edge of the oak desk and blinked, feeling disoriented for a moment. Then he released a long breath. A dream. It had only been a damn ridiculous dream. And yet, why did there still seem to be mist shifting like wisps of smoke before his eyes? His heart gave a sudden lurch. Mere yards away, a figure, cloaked all in black, stood silhouetted by the far wall, examining one of the books. Rosalind, Lance called uncertainly, trying to sort out the confusion of his dream from the reality posed before his eyes. The cloaked figure replaced the volume on the shelf and turned, enough for Lance to realise this was not his Lady of the Lake, but a man, tall and powerfully built, his features shadowed by a hood pulled far forward over his face. The last vestige of sleep dashed from his brain. Lance shot to his feet. Who are you? he demanded. How the devil did you get in here? You're a St. Ledger, 
a deep voice purred from the concealing depths of the hood. You figure it out. Lance stalked around the table, muscles tensing, bracing himself for any sudden attack. Stand still and put your hands where I can see them. Then I'll give you five seconds to answer my question before I... The menacing figure cut him off with a silky laugh. Jaw clenched. Lance rushed him, intending to wrench back the hood himself. His hands closed on nothing but air. Scowling, Lance seized the intruder by the shoulder, but the black cloak seemed to melt between his fingers. A prickle of unease iced up Lance's spine. He pulled back his fist more in experiment than in anger. He swung as hard as he could. As he'd feared, his arm passed right through the cloaked figure, setting Lance off balance. A chill rippled through his veins as cold as the grave. Lance staggered away from the man, his jaw dropping open in amazement. The stranger did not appear in the least phased by Lance's efforts. He simply stood there, arms folded. Are you quite through? he intoned. Lance nodded, managing to close his mouth. By God, he breathed. You're a ghost. A young man of infinite perception. A pair of strong, elegant hands shifted from beneath the cloak to fling back the hood, affording Lance his first clear view of his visitor's face. He had a swarthy complexion, not the pallor Lance would have expected from such a spectral presence, but a countenance full of life and vigour, dominated by a hawk-like nose and lips with a wicked, sensual curve. Ebony hair flowed down past his neck, his neatly trimmed beard equally as black and lustrous. But most compelling were the eyes, dark, mesmerising, with a slightly exotic slant. Beneath the cloak, Lance caught the flash of a scarlet tunic, the woollen hose and soft-pointed shoes fashioned for a man who'd stepped out of another age, exactly like the portrait that hung in the old keep and had fascinated Lance and his siblings since childhood. The painting of the strange man who had founded the St. Ledger family, the dreaded knight who'd been rumoured to be more sorcerer than warrior. Well, Lancelot St. Ledger, the ghost said softly, do you know me now? Prospero. Lance pronounced the name with awe. Very good. Those exotic, dark eyes took on a sardonic glint. It is always so flattering to be recognized by one's own descendants. Of course I recognize you, Lance said. When we were children, Val and Lenny and I used to hide for nights on end in your tower hoping for a glimpse of you, terrifying each other by whispering the most blood-curdling stories of your sorcery. I know, Prospero said dryly. I heard you, infernal little nuisances. You heard us? But you were supposed to be gone. My mother exorcised you. The lovely Madeline has many charming abilities, but the power of exorcism is not one of them. We struck a bargain twixt us, she and I, as long as matters at Castle Ledger remained well in hand. I agreed to stay away. But where have you been all these years? That hardly matters. I am here now. Aye, so you are, Lance said, unable to stop staring. Even as a boy, he'd only half believed in the tales of Prospero's ghost. But my father told me you were always confined to the old hall and not allowed to venture into this part of the house. Your father frequently harbours mistaken notions. I'll be damned if he does. Lance bridled at this slighting reference to his sire. You were never permitted beyond the castle keep. I never chose to go beyond the doors of the old keep. Now, if we are entirely through debating the rules of my existence... Prospero arched one thin black brow. Oh, uh, yes, of course, Lance stammered. 
A ripple of excitement coursed through him, such as he'd not experienced for a long time, making him almost feel like a boy again. "'Damn!' he said. "'Val! I have to go tell my brother. I can scarce wait to see the look on St. Valentine's face!' His quarrel with his brother forgotten, Lance darted eagerly for the door. But as he opened it, Prospero made a sweeping gesture with his hand. The door slammed shut, as though propelled by a gale-force wind. Lance leapt back with a startled oath. "'You will tell no one,' Prospero said. "'You have no need to be afraid of me.' "'I'm not afraid. I only wanted you to meet my brother. "'You've no idea how anxious Val—' "'I have no interest in Valentine at the moment. "'It is you I am here to see.' Me. Lance's brief spurt of excitement faded. He regarded his ancestor with a shade more wariness. What the blazes do you want with me? As charmingly direct as ever your noble sire was, I see. Prospero drawled. What do I want? He drifted toward the desk, examining the empty scabbard. Well, to begin with... There is the small matter of what you have done with my sword. I believe it is my sword now. Not if you're going to go about play-acting with it and allow yourself to be robbed on some dark beach. Lance frowned at him. How the devil did you know about that? Prospero did not deign to answer. Instead, he went on. It would also appear you have other problems as well. He pointed toward Lance's frock coat, and the garment fluttered as though caught in a light breeze. To Lance's horror, Rosalind's cap came floating out of the pocket and wafted to Prospero's hand. Problems of the heart? Prospero inquired, with a taunting lift of his brows, dangling the frilled cap by its strings. A hot tide of embarrassment surged into Lance's cheeks. He strode forward and snatched the garment out of Prospero's grasp. "'What have you been doing, spying on me?' he demanded angrily. "'Did my brother Val conjure you up for this?' "'No one conjures me, boy.' "'Well, I wouldn't put it past St. Valentine to start raiding the grave.' Lance drew back, whisking Rosalind's cap almost jealously out of sight, tucking it in the desk drawer. He stirred up every other St. Ledger he could find to harass me about this chosen bride nonsense. Nonsense? What? Prospero regarded him mockingly. You do not believe in your family's most cherished legend. And you call yourself a St. Ledger. I don't know what the devil I believe any more, Lance muttered. But I've already known the pain of having once loved the wrong woman. I'll not be risking such disaster again, merely on the word of Effie Fitzledger. Elfrida Fitzledger may be a very silly woman, but there is nothing wrong with her bride-finding skills. And somewhere, in that obstinate St. Ledger heart of yours, I think you already know that, Lancelot. Lance glowered and turned away. He was beginning to understand why his father had been so glad to have Prospero gone. The ghost was damned annoying. Of course, you understand, there's also a curse involved with refusing one's chosen bride, Prospero went on. Perhaps to be offered such a gift afforded to few mortals, a love that would last for an eternity, and then to fling it away... The heavens themselves might be justified in demanding retribution. I'll take my chances. Are you also prepared to take chances with your Lady of the Lake? Lance's heart clenched, and he whipped round to glare at the sorcerer. Are you threatening Rosalind in some way? No. I'm trying to warn you. Have you never heard the tale of what happened to Marius St. Ledger's chosen bride. Dr. Marius? Lance frowned at this mention of his father's cousin. 
a quiet, reserved man. He's a confirmed bachelor. He never had any bride. Precisely. Because he, too, delayed marrying when his mate was found for him. Too busy with his medical studies, trying to save the world single-handed was our Marius. When he finally did make up his mind to wed, it was too late. His Anne died in his arms. Bah! Lance paced across the room, wanting to refute Prospero's words. He never heard any such story, and yet there always had been this haunting sorrow in Marius St. Ledger's eyes that Lance had been at a loss to account for. He leaned up against the mantel, stubbornly crossing his arms over his chest. I would prove a worse curse to Rosalind Carlyle if I married her. I simply don't deserve her. Ah, well, as to that, Prospero smiled. If every St. Ledger was only to get what he deserved, he would end up being burned at the stake, Lance suggested. Prospero's smile vanished. He shot Lance a dark look. Mind your insolent tongue, boy, unless you'd like to be turned into a frog and spend the rest of your days inhabiting the old moat. Go ahead. It will be a vast improvement, the way my life has been going lately. Just as long as I'm not expected to take charge of any lily pad or go hunting about for a chosen lady frog. The sorcerer's brows crashed together in an ominous line and Lance braced himself, fearing he'd gone too far. But slowly, his ancestor's grim features relaxed, and Prospero gave a reluctant chuckle. I see far too much of myself in you. Is that supposed to be a compliment? No, Prospero said, an odd look sifting through his eyes, no longer so amused, one of infinite sadness. It was gone in a flash to be replaced by a more inscrutable expression. He drifted away from Lance to stare into the gloom-ridden shadows gathering beyond the windows. Despite how irritating Lance was finding the ghost's intrusion into his life, he couldn't help watching Prospero with a certain grudging admiration. He was a magnificent devil, his every movement possessing the grace and arrogance of some medieval king, an aura of magic and mystery, of untold power. Lance began to understand why Val was so obsessed with learning more of this elusive ancestor of theirs. As Prospero continued to gaze out the window, as though peering into some long-lost time only he could see, Lance said, Forgive me, sir, but I have to ask you why you feel so qualified to advise me on the subject of brides. Who was your great forever love? No one has ever found any reference to such a lady or any memorial to her among the family tombs. Prospero wrenched his eyes from the window. The history of my life is none of your concern, boy, as mine is none of yours. Mayhap not. Prospero folded his hands together with a heavy sigh. Now, ah, well, if you will not venture nigh your fair Rosalind out of love, perchance you will seek her to recover your sword. My sword? Lance echoed in astonishment. What on earth does Rosalind Carlyon have to do with my sword? Prospero merely gave him the most aggravating smile and glided over to the bookcase, pulling down a volume, a folio of the Tempest. Ah, Shakespeare, he murmured, leafing through the pages. The fellow didn't even come close to getting my story set down correctly, except for my name. But some of the lines are quite good. Listen to this. This rough magic I hear abjure. He was cut off in mid-sentence as Lance strode across the room and jerked the book from his hands, thrusting it back on the shelf. What do you know about my sword? Lance demanded, not even troubling to hide his anxiety or impatience. You know where it is? Who took it? I've no idea who took it. 
but I do know who has it now. Prospero's eyes shifted slyly toward the desk drawer where Lance had hidden the linen cap. Rosalind Carline? Lance asked in pure disbelief. You are trying to tell me that Rosalind had something to do with the theft of my sword? No, fool. I am merely telling you that she now has it in her possession. How the devil could you know that? How could my sword have possibly fallen into Rosalind's hands? You must go ask the lady yourself, was the sorcerer's infuriating and vague reply. He stalked away from Lance and adjusted his hood over his face. To his anger and consternation, Lance realized the spectre was preparing to take his leave. Damn you, Prospero, he said. Don't you even think of going anywhere until you've given me an answer. But a light mist was issuing from beneath the sorcerer's dark cloak. Prospero's voice already sounded fainter as he gave an annoying laugh. If you want your sword back, Sir Lancelot, he mocked, then you'd best seek out the Lady of the Lake. Blast it all, Prospero! Lance lunged forward as though he could somehow prevent the phantom from fading from his grasp, but he was driven off with a blinding flash. Lance staggered back, swearing and clutching his hands to his eyes. He rubbed at them furiously, and it was several moments before he could clear away the spots of dancing light. When he finally lowered his hands, it was to find the library empty. Prospero was gone, only a wisp of smoke remaining. The great sorcerer vanished in such a way as made Lance's own ability to drift look like a fairground conjurer's paltry trick. Lance released a long, unsteady breath. Finding the whole experience so strange, he wondered if it all might just have been an extension of his dream. But as he gazed down at the library desk, he realised Prospero had amused himself with a parting jest. There, seared into the surface of the wood, was the emblem of the St. Ledger dragon, and the mythical beast seemed to be smirking up at him. Lance sank wearily into the chair behind the desk, what next, he thought. First the missing sword, then the chosen bride he was refusing to marry, and now, thanks to him, the spirit of a centuries-old ghost had returned to plague the St. Ledgers with his damnable sense of humour. I'm not going to have to surrender my inheritance, Lance muttered grimly. When my father returns home, he's going to kill me. He dragged his hand back through his hair, and was annoyed to find his fingers a little less than steady. The encounter with Prospero had unnerved him more than he cared to admit. And he wasn't St. Ledger. He should be well steeled against any such strange goings-on. The experience filled him with a new admiration for Rosalind Carlyle, for the complete aplomb that gentle lady had displayed when she had mistaken Lance for a ghost. But any thought of Rosalind caused his brow to furrow in a deep frown. Could there possibly be any truth to what Prospero had said? That Rosalind did indeed have Lance's sword? What would she be doing with it? And how could Prospero even know such a thing? Lance grimaced. The damned man seemed to know just about everything else, and he clearly was a sorcerer, with more than five centuries to perfect his devilment. Perhaps that's all it was. Devilment. Perhaps Prospero had only made up the tale about Rosalind having the sword in an effort to trick Lance into rushing to her side. Lance had pulled off enough jests of his own to be mighty suspicious. But it hardly mattered if it was a hoax or not. Lance would never be sure unless he went to the Dragon's Fire Inn and checked the sorcerer's story out for himself. He shoved to his feet, his lips pursed in annoyance, realising that Prospero had accomplished what neither Val nor all his St. Leisure relatives could do. He had forced Lance to go pay a call on Rosalind Carlion. But his pulse quickened, and he was disturbed to realise the notion did not displease him 
as much as it should have. Lance's jaw flexed in a hard line as he cantered toward the Dragon's Fire Inn. The overcast day, with its threat of a storm, left the lane all but deserted, but he was keenly aware of window curtains being twitched aside as he passed, heads poking out of cottage doorways. This was an aspect of his visit to Rosalind that Lance had failed to reckon with, the stir that he might cause. The tidings would likely be all over Torakum by nightfall. Lance and Ledger had finally come to woo his chosen bride. No doubt there would be sighs of relief all round, as superstitious as these people were, with their own unshakable beliefs in legends and curses. Unfortunately, they were all doomed to disappointment. Lance wondered how much relief anyone would feel if they realised that far from coming to court his bride, he might actually be forced to clap irons upon the woman. He'd had far too much time to think on the ride over from Castle Ledger. Too much time to consider all the implications if Prospero was correct about Rosalind having the St. Ledger sword. No matter what the sorcerer might claim, Lance could see no other explanation than that she was somehow involved with the brigand who'd robbed him. What did he truly know of the woman, after all? He'd never set eyes upon her above a week ago. Lance prided himself on being toughened beyond any blow a woman might deal him. But the thought that his Lady of the Lake might prove to be a common thief left a hollow, aching sensation within his chest, such as he'd not experienced for years. Not since Adele's betrayal. He remembered too clearly standing on the field of his first battle, tears coursing down his cheeks but not from the acrid whiff of cannon fire. It was because the fighting was done, and after hurling himself so recklessly into the fray, he was still alive and unscathed. All he'd wanted to do was die after he'd discovered the truth about his beloved Adele. But he'd been a fool of eighteen. He hoped that he'd gained some wisdom since then and a better judgment of character. If Rosalind, with her wide, innocent eyes and sweet smile, was a hardened schemer, then she was the most consummate actress Lance had ever met. He'd know the truth soon enough, he thought grimly. He wheeled into the stable yard of the Dragon's Fire Inn and dismounted, tossing off the reins to one of the stable lads. Lance ducked his head as he marched beneath the inn's low-slung door, his eyes straining to adjust to the inn's gloom-ridden interior. Even the candlelight was hard-pressed to drive away the shadows cast by such a sunless day and the dark beams of the original Tudor construction. As Lance entered the taproom, he was dismayed to find the rough-hewn table so crowded. For such a dismal evening, half the St. Ledger tenants and farmhands from the outlying area seemed to be here, bending over their ale and puffing at their pipes. At Lance's entrance, a hush of anticipation fell over the smoke-filled room. Some nodded in respectful greeting, while others hid smiles and nudged their neighbours, causing Lance to grit his teeth. He was grateful to see that Rafe Mortmain was not present. The amusement in his friend's sardonic eyes might have been more than Lance's temper could bear. He felt damnably self-conscious as it was, wending his way through the tables to seek out the inn's landlord. Mr. Braggs whipped himself out from behind the bar counter, wiping his hands upon his apron and greeting Lance with an oily smirk. Lance's lip curled with contempt. He'd never had much of a taste for all of Silas Braggs scraping and bowing. Cutting off the landlord's effusive greeting, Lance inquired after Rosalind in the lowest tones he could manage. But Braggs responded in a booming voice, Lady Carlion? Why, certainly, sir. Shall I have one of the maids fetch her down for you? Just tell me where I may find her, Lance snapped. The first room to the left above stairs. Thank you. Lance cut him off and stalked away before Braggs could even complete the sentence. As he strode out the taproom door and started up the stairs to the gallery on the second floor, he was followed by a tide of hushed voices. Lordy, 
Did you see the look at Master Lance's face? The lad sent let your blood be stirred up at last. You there, Braggs. You best send someone to fetch the vicar in his prayer book, double quick, afore Master Lance gets his bedding and his marrying a trifle backwards. I trow he wouldn't be the first in ledger to do so, Bragg's sneering voice replied. This last remark was greeted with a raucous burst of laughter. His ears burning, Lance paused mid-stairs, seized with a strong urge to go back down and give Bragg's a sharp cuff to the head. But it would only make the situation worse. Perhaps it would have been better to have one of the maids fetch Lady Carlion down to the private dining room at the back of the inn. But Lance felt pushed well past any such proprieties. Doggedly, he kept going until he reached Rosalind's door and wrapped his knuckles against the wood. He shifted from foot to foot, disturbed to discover that the mere thought of seeing Rosalind again was doing something strange to his St. Ledger blood. His heart pumped just a little harder, his pulses quickening with a sensation that was almost primitive and entirely out of his control. A throbbing response that felt as old as time. The anticipation of a man who'd come to claim... nothing. He'd come to claim nothing, except perhaps his sword. Lance fought to suppress the unsettling emotion and knocked harder. It seemed an eternity before there was any response, and Lance prepared to hammer again when the door inched open. The frightened face of Rosalind's maid peeked out. Remembering that Jenny had encountered him once before in his ghostly form, Lance braced himself for a piercing shriek. But the young woman apparently did not recognize him, for all she did was quaver, Yes, sir? I need to see your mistress, Lady Carlion, Lance said. She's not here. Jenny attempted to shut the door, but Lance caught hold of the edge and forced his way into the room, ignoring the girl's alarmed squeak. Rosalind, he called, but a quick glance around the small bedchamber assured him the maid had spoken the truth. Lance saw nothing beyond the room's simple accoutrements, the bed, the washstand, Rosalind's half-open travelling trunk. His jaw knotted with sheer vexation, where? Where would she go at such an hour, the sky heavy with the promise of an oncoming storm? Not to take an idle stroll down the beach, Lance thought grimly, judging from her maid's appearance. Strands of strawberry-coloured hair escaped from beneath Jenny's mop cap, hanging limply about her frazzled countenance, her wrinkled apron looking as if it had been worried nigh to a thread by the wringing of her nervous hands. Stalking back to confront the girl, Lance demanded, Where is your mistress? Jenny cowered near the door, but she tipped up her small pointed chin in a valiant effort. That, that is no concern of yours, sir. Now you, you just get out of here before I summon Mr. Braggs and have you thrown out. I mean you no harm, girl, but it is urgent I speak with Lady Carline at once. Now where the devil is she? Jenny shrank from him. Oh, I'll not tell you. You could be a desperate brigand. Do I look like a desperate brigand? Lance snapped, then grimaced, raking his hand back through his wild, wind-blown hair, realising that perhaps he did. Apparently Jenny thought so, for she swept a shaky finger toward the door. Get out of here, she shrilled, or I, I'll have you taken up before the nearest magistrate. I am the acting magistrate, and if you don't believe me, I'll summon Braggs myself to tell you so. Ooh. Jenny's fair skin turned the colour of ash. Lance planted his hands on his hips and assumed his sternest expression. Now, are you going to tell me what I need to know, or shall I have you arrested? I only want to ask your mistress a few questions regarding a certain missing sword. Jenny pressed trembling fingers to her lips, in a defiance she possessed crumbling completely. She sank down onto the edge of the bed, her eyes filling with tears. Oh, Lordy, I told my lady nothing good could come a-keeping that terrible crystal sword. The night she found that dreadful thing, I said we should turn it over to the constable. Crystal sword? Lance's eyes narrowed. So the old devil Prospero was right. 
Rosalind did have the St. Ledger played, but the sweetest part of Jenny's communication played over again in his mind. The night Rosalind had found that dreadful thing. Found it! He heaved a deep sigh, feeling as though the weight of the world had just rolled off his shoulders. There was still much left unanswered, but Lance had learned the most important thing. His Rosalind was no thief. He focused his attention back on Jenny with a renewed patience, which was just as well, for the girl showed signs of going off into hysterics. Her nerves clearly pushed to the snapping point, she burst into tears. Lance bent over her, offering his handkerchief in place of her much-abused apron. Thank you, sir, she gulped. But it was several moments before she could tell Lance anything more, and then such a garbled account made little sense to him. Something about Rosalind finding a sword hidden beneath the floor, spiriting the stolen weapon away to guard it, hiding it under, under, under the bed? Lance asked in disbelief, attempting to peer into Jenny's tear-streaked countenance. Did you say Lady Carline has been keeping the sword under her bed? Jenny hiccuped and nodded. Neath the mattress. Lance pulled a wry face at the irony of it. For once in his life, he'd avoided a woman's bed, and the object he'd been riding to a hell and back looking for had been tucked safely beneath Rosalind's sheets all this time. His gaze dropped ruefully to the mattress Jenny was perched upon. And is that where the sword is now? She blew her nose gustily into his handkerchief, and shook her head. No. Mistress took... took it with her to... R restore... To restore it to its owner? Lance prompted, when Jenny threatened to be overcome again. No, sir. Jenny's moist eyes widened in surprise. How could she do that when Excalibur's owner is so long dead? Excalibur? Lance exclaimed, dumbfounded. Ay, tis that sword that King Arthur... I know what it is, Lance interrupted. But what the blazes does that have to do with... He broke off, his mouth clamping abruptly shut. Oh, Lord, surely not even Rosalind, with her head stuffed full of so many romantic stories. Surely not even she could be so credulous to believe that she'd found... But one look at Jenny's old face assured him that Rosalind did indeed believe she'd found the legendary Excalibur, and she'd managed to convince her maid as well. Lance rolled his eyes, torn between exasperation and amusement. What could have put such a damned fool notion into Rosalind's head? Perhaps the lies of a certain dishonest rogue? masquerading as the ghost of Lancelot du Lac, filling her head full of nonsense. Lance's amusement faded. He flinched with guilt and said, The sword your mistress found is not, um, um, well, never mind about that right now. Just tell me where Lady Carlion has taken the weapon. Jenny sniffed, taking another wipe at her eyes, well, sir, it was clearly not safe to keep it at the inn any longer. Not with that rogue as what stole the sword prowling about. Lance stiffened. You know who stole the sword? No, sir. But Mistress is fair certain she'd been spied upon the past few days. That the villain must have guessed somehow that she's the one as took Excalibur from its hiding place. Jenny shivered. Once, once when we went out... Just for a breath of air, me lady thinks that someone actually tried to break into our room. After that, neither of us barely got a wink of sleep or dared stir a step out of doors. Lance's brow furrowed into a deep frown. Was this all more of Rosalind's fertile imagination? Or was it possible that his Lady of the Lake had stumbled into a great deal of danger? Highly possible, Lance thought, the more he considered the matter. 
Anyone ruthless and bold enough to have dared attack him as St. Ledger would not easily surrender a prize gained at such risk. And how hard would it have been for his assailant to guess who had thwarted him as soon as he found the sword missing? Not very hard at all, especially since the thief must have free access to the Dragon's Fire Inn, and it would not have taken any great perception to observe that Lady Carline and her maid were behaving strangely. Jenny's nervousness was transparent as glass, and as for Rosalind, Lance winced. His Lady of the Lake did not strike him as a woman overburdened with discretion. Her very furtiveness would have aroused suspicion, caused her every movement to be closely watched. Frowning, he peered out the window. The pale sun was already starting to set upon a day that had been no more than restless shadows. The narrow lane through the village appeared empty and deserted, as most of the rugged countryside hereabouts soon would be. And somewhere out there, in this wild and isolated land of his, Lance reflected anxiously, was Rosalind, alone, unprotected, that dangerous sword clutched to her side, but no more dangerous than the threat that might be melting out of the darkness behind her. Hitching in his breath, he caught Jenny fiercely by the shoulders, his demand taking on an entirely new urgency. Jenny, you have got to tell me. Where the devil has she gone? Chapter 7 Billows of mist drifted across the surface of the lake, the last pale rays of daylight turning the smooth waters into a shield of polished steel. Rosalind huddled on the shore, knee-deep in tangled grasses, the damp seeping through the thin soles of her shoes. She shivered a little at her own reflection in the silvery pool below. She made an eerie figure, swathed in her midnight-coloured cloak, the black veil draped over her bonnet, obscuring her features. The dark wraith of a woman mirrored below her seemed somehow quite in keeping with her lonely surroundings. Rosalind found it hard to remember that she was but a few miles from the snug confines of the village, the land having assumed a wilder, harsher aspect. No sign of any human habitation, no sound to break the twilight, except for the piercing cry of a night jar and the occasional stirring of the reeds. Her guidebook had led her to believe the Maiden Lake would be a friendlier place, sparkling waters of spellbinding blue set in a charming clearing of ancient oaks. But even the trees took on a sinister appearance, the leaves clinging to the gnarled branches with a desperate tenacity. Yet perhaps it was fitting that the spot where a great and noble king was rumoured to have breathed his last should speak more of ghosts than enchantment. A melancholy tale of a kingdom and dreams lost. The young ostler from the Dragon's Fire Inn, who had brought Rosalind out here in his pony cart, had warned her what an isolated place it was. Jem Sparkins had appeared much astonished by her urgent need to visit an old pond in the middle of nowhere at such an hour. But since he'd been venturing in this direction anyway, the good-natured lad had willingly obliged. He had almost insisted upon staying with her, much to her alarm. For what she had come to do here, she needed to be alone. It had taken a great deal of persuading to get him to set her down and be on his way. After she had alighted from the cart, he'd driven off with a perplexed frown on his face, promising to fetch her on his way back to the village. But it was abundantly plain he thought her quite mad. And perhaps she was. Rosalind reflected as she lifted her veil and gazed out over the gloom-ridden waters. But it was a madness born out of sheer desperation. She had spent a nerve-wracking week doing her best to keep the sword Excalibur safe, praying that Sir Lancelot would come back to relieve her of the dreadful burden. Night after night she had kept her vigil, sometimes staring out her window at an indifferent and empty sky, sometimes creeping back to that storeroom, pacing in her bare feet until she became chilled with the wee hours of the morning. 
but he hadn't returned. Her ghostly hero, with the haunting eyes and gentle smile, and she'd finally despaired of his ever doing so. Worn to the point of exhaustion, she'd taken to starting at her own shadow, jumping at any sudden noise, plagued by the feeling that her comings and goings were being spied upon by someone at the inn. She scarce knew what frightened her most, the terror that some savage thief might eventually track down his stolen prize and attack her to reclaim it, or another meeting with the ruthless libertine, Lance St. Ledger. Ever since she had fled from Effie's, Rosalind had dreaded that Lance might come after her to exact some dark retribution for the way she'd rebuffed him. But to her vast relief, he appeared to have forgotten all about her, despite the fact that everyone from the local vicar to the bootblack at the inn buzzed with the tidings that Effie Fitzledger had declared her to be Lance St. Ledger's destined bride. Ordinarily, Rosalind would have been fascinated by it, an entire village that believed heart and soul in a legend as romantic as the St. Ledger's and their bride finder. But it was distressing and embarrassing to have everyone thinking Rosalind would actually marry the despicable Rakehell. She'd kept to her room most of the time, not wanting to risk even a chance encounter with Lance, knowing she would be mortified by his mocking smile, unable to look him in the eye for the man was in possession of her most shameful secret. He knew that she had responded to his heated kiss, knew that she was not as virtuous as she pretended to be. Rosalind had spent many hours fretting over it, trying to find excuses for herself. She'd been in a state of great distress and confusion. She'd been lonely and vulnerable, missing her late husband, missing the intimacies of marriage. But had she ever returned Arthur's gentle kisses with such sharp stirrings of desire, such naked longing? The distressing answer was no, but she had reacted wantonly to the embrace of a man she didn't even admire or like. Perhaps, perhaps it was the fault of this strange land itself, so wild and rough, it somehow got into one's blood, aroused primitive impulses one would never feel elsewhere. Long ago, Mr. Fitzledger had told her his distant county by the sea harboured its own unique kind of magic. Perhaps he had failed to warn her that some of that magic could be of a darker kind. Whatever spell had come over her that day, it was not important, Rosalind assured herself. Tomorrow morning, she and Jenny would climb into the hired chaise and be gone from this place, abandoning memories of disturbing rogues and their even more disturbing kisses, leaving bride finders and curses, sword stealing brigands, and St. Ledger's all behind them. But before she could go, she had one more legend to lay to rest. Parting the folds of her cloak, she reached for the sword that felt so awkward and unwieldy strapped to her side. Jenny had fashioned a makeshift belt for the mighty weapon, and it took Rosalind a moment to disentangle the heavy blade. She drew Excalibur forth into the waning light. As she clutched the hilt and gazed out across the mist-spun waters, she wondered, was there some sort of ritual for returning a legendary sword to the mystic lake from whence it had sprung? Should she wait for the complete darkness to fall and the moon to rise? All she remembered of the old tale was that, as Arthur lay dying upon the shore, he had consigned Excalibur to Sir Bedivere. That redoubtable knight had then given the weapon a mighty fling into the centre of the lake. Of course, he'd been helped along by the obliging hand that had broken the surface and caught the blade, drawing it down into the fathomless depths. As terrifying as such an apparition would be, she would have welcomed it, reassuring her that she was in the right place, that returning Excalibur to this particular lake was the correct thing to do, that she had not merely taken leave of her senses. She gazed down at the weapon in her hands, caressing the pummel, as though the magnificently wrought blade itself could somehow ease her doubts but the crystal seemed to glint up at her through the gathering darkness like a reproachful eye, 
as though silently rebuking her for abandoning her sacred trust. But I don't know what else to do with you, Rosalind murmured. I was never meant to be the guardian of an ancient treasure. I am no legendary heroine. I am nobody of any great importance. I am only a poor, foolish widow. She traced the gold trim on the hilt, trying to call up the image of Sir Lancelot in her mind, trying to think what he would want her to do. She could almost hear the sad echo of his voice. Mayhap, if the blade was sunk back to the bottom of the lake, I would finally know some peace. Rosalind realized if she went through with this, she would most certainly put an end to any hope that she would ever see Sir Lancelot again. Not that there seemed much hope now. She felt tears start to her eyes, but she blinked them aside. Firming her mouth in a resolute line, she raised the sword. I'll take that, my lady, the harsh voice hissed from the dark line of trees behind her. Rosalind lowered the blade and whirled round, her breath hitching in her throat. She'd heard no one approach, not even the cracking of a twig. The tall shape that advanced upon her seemed to have come from nowhere, melting out of the shadows of a towering oak. Her heart beat wildly with hope, believing for a moment that it was indeed he, Sir Lancelot du Lac, come back to her at last. But that hope turned quickly to fear, as the figure stalked nearer, assuming a more menacing shape. No heroic phantom, his heavy boots crunched the bracken beneath his feet, the need for stealth gone. He was garbed all in black, a silken hood pulled over his face, allowing only narrow slits for his eyes. A faceless terror straight from her worst nightmares. Rosalind froze, so frightened she could scarce move or breathe, she shuddered, wondering how long he'd been lurking there, lying in wait for her. Surely a ridiculous consideration at a moment such as this, but her mind seemed to have gone numb with panic, rendering her unable to think clearly. As he closed in on her, her fingers tightened on the sword. She raised the heavy weapon to hold him at bay. Who are you? she quavered. He came to an abrupt halt, keeping a wary distance from the tip of the blade. I am the owner of that sword. Give it to me. The roughness of his voice matched the cold cruelty of his eyes glittering beneath the mask. Rosalind shrank back a step. She felt the mighty weapon quiver in her hands and fought to keep it steady. No, you're the villain who stole the sword from Lancelot. Aye, so I did, he rasped, and at far too great a risk to be thwarted by the meddling of some infernal woman. Her heart lurched as he attempted to come closer. She flourished the blade at him. K keep back, or I s I'll swear I'll run you through. She wondered if the fear and desperation in her voice were as evident to him as they were to her. Apparently they were, for he gave a guttural chuckle. I have no wish to harm you, lady, but I will have that sword, and all I have to do is wait. You have not the strength to wield that blade against me forever. He was right, Rosalind realized with dismay. She could already feel the strain in her forearms and up her shoulders. As soon as she wavered, she knew he would pounce. And he had all the time in the world. The brigand could not have found a better place to reclaim the sword from her if he'd chosen it himself. What a blasted fool she'd been to come out here by herself, so concerned that if anyone saw what she was about to do, they would think her mad. She should have ordered Jem to stay. She should at least have brought her maid, though what use Jenny would have been she couldn't imagine. The girl would have succumbed to hysterics by now. Rosalind felt like doing so herself, but there was no one to hear her scream. Could she possibly come about fast enough and toss the sword into the lake before he could stop her? Or would such an action only make him furious enough to strangle her on the spot? While she hesitated... The villain had begun to toy with her. Eyes glinting with amusement, he shifted from side to side, attempting to circle round her. She drove him back with short, panicked thrusts that he playfully avoided. And after each thrust, he seemed to loom a little closer. The ache in her arms grew unbearable. She had to grit her teeth to keep her hands from trembling. 
a sob of pure despair caught in her throat. Just as she was certain she couldn't hold out much longer, a miraculous sound reached her ears. Faint at first, then louder. The thud of approaching hooves on the lane just beyond the line of trees, coming this way. Her assailant had it too, for he suddenly stiffened. Rosalind gripped the sword with a renewed burst of strength. There, she said. That would be Jem Sparkins coming back for me. A fierce man, very big, very mean. You, you'd best get out of here. The villain's eyes narrowed, and she had a feeling he was no longer smiling beneath that hood. This tiresome game is over, madam. He drew forth a pistol from his belt and leveled it at her. Give me that sword. Rosalind stared down the gleaming barrel and swallowed hard. The sound of hoofbeats thundered closer. Somehow she found the courage to shake her head. The lane was no more than a narrow track, cutting through a field, but despite the descending darkness, Lance had no difficulty in following it. He had ridden out this way many times in his youth, though it had been a long time since Lance had set a foot near the old King's Wood. It had never been a proper woods at all, more like a thick stand of trees with the pond in the clearing just beyond. As he guided his mount impatiently toward the shadowy cluster of oaks, he wondered if Jenny could not have been mistaken. What woman in her right mind would ask to be brought out here with night coming on and fearing that some desperate thief might be watching her every movement? Only Rosalind, he thought grimly. As soon as he found the infernal woman made certain she was safe, he'd have a great deal to say to her on the subject of... A sharp crack cut through the stillness of the twilight. Lance's horse shied beneath him, Bringing the gelding back under control, Lance scowled. That sounded like... like gunfire coming from the direction of the woods. One thought superseded all others, making his heart constrict with alarm, making him forget every caution. Rosalind. Pulse thudding as hard as the gelding's hoofbeats, Lance urged his mount into the line of trees. The branches closed like a canopy overhead, rendering it darker. But Lance's eyes had adjusted by the time he burst into the clearing, bracing himself for the possibility of ambush, a pistol or rifle aimed at his head. But he saw no sign of any weapon, except the one that was the object of the desperate struggle down by the lake. Two dark figures swayed back and forth, the man cursing, the woman crying out. Some villainous bastard in a black hood was doing his best to wrest something free of Rosalind's clutching fingers. The St. Ledger sword. Lance reined in sharply, then leapt down from the saddle, rushing to his lady's rescue. The brigand snarled at Lance's approach and abruptly released Rosalind, apparently deciding to cut his losses. He plunged into the trees with Lance hard after him. Lance battered aside twigs that threatened his face and tore at his coat, his pursuit hindered by the darkness and low-hanging branches. The rogue was swift, but Lance was closing the distance when his foot caught on a tree root. He fell headlong. Lance scrambled to his feet. He took two steps and was brought up short by a shooting pain in his ankle. It was too late anyway. He could see well enough to tell the fellow had a horse waiting just ahead. He watched, fuming helplessly, as the bastard leapt into the saddle and vanished into the darkness. With a frustrated curse, Lance turned and limped back to the clearing to find Rosalind. To his relief, she appeared unharmed, although much shaken. She leaned up against the trunk of a gnarled oak near the edge of the pond, still clutching the hilt of the St. Ledger sword, as though her life depended upon it. Her bonnet had been knocked askew in the struggle, but as he approached, she lifted her head, and he could see her face, pale, wary. It occurred to him that she didn't look much happier to see him than if he'd been a masked brigand himself. Lance couldn't say as he blamed her, considering the way they had last parted. He pulled up short, still trying to catch his breath. He winced as he tried to work the soreness out of his ankle. It's, it's all over now, Rosalind, he panted. Just, just hand the sword over to me before you end up getting hurt, and everything will be all right. 
He meant to sound reassuring, but somehow he must have said the wrong thing. She gave a horrified gasp and shrank away from him, backing toward the edge of the lake. She whirled about, raising the sword. Before he could even guess what she meant to do, she hurled the weapon with all her remaining strength out over the lake. No! Lance roared, charging forward, hearing a sickening splash. He stopped barely in time to keep falling in himself, seeing nothing but dark ripples where the sword had vanished beyond the reeds. Rosalind's shoulders slumped with a strange air of finality. For a moment, all Lance could do was gape, no words coming. Then he shifted to glare at Rosalind, sputtering, Bloody hell, woman! What did you do that for? I had no choice, she said, in a small voice. It was the only way to keep it safe from both you villains. Safe? At the bottom of the damned pond? That, that's where Excalibur belongs, back in the enchanted lake. Blast it all, woman! That was the St. Ledger sword. It's been in my family for generations. Her eyes widened with a flicker of uncertainty, but then she stubbornly shook her head. No, you're lying. It... it was Excalibur. Lance clenched his jaw, not certain if he was more exasperated with himself or her, for being credulous enough to believe in his absurd masquerade and all this Arthurian nonsense. But now was hardly the time or place to argue with her. The light was nearly gone, and it could only get darker still rendering his task of retrieving the sword that much more difficult. He peered down at the pond with little enthusiasm, knowing from experience how damned cold and murky that water was going to be. Gritting his teeth, he stripped off his riding cape, his coat and waistcoat and cravat quickly following. Rosalind huddled on the bank, watching him roll up his sleeves with wide, troubled eyes. What? What are you going to do? It's a lovely evening. I thought I'd go for a swim, Lance growled. What the blazes do you think I'm going to do? I have to retrieve my damned sword. You can't. The lake is fathomless. Lance shot her an impatient look as he sat down to wrench off his boots and stockings. It's five feet at its deepest point. I ought to know, he muttered. I nearly drowned here as a boy. He shoved to his feet, ignoring Rosalind's soft cry of protest. He waded in, sucking in his breath. The dark pool was every bit as icy as he'd anticipated. He grimaced at the feel of mud oozing between his toes, the water quickly seeping through the calves of his breeches, then up to his knees. Heaving a disgruntled sigh, he supposed he should consider himself lucky. Rosalind hadn't had the strength to heave it very far. Making his best guess where the sword had gone down, he bent and began to grope through the treacherous reeds. It was a messy business, mud and slime and murky cold water. He cursed savagely when he nearly lost his footing, staggering back, soaking the rest of his bridges as well. It was so dark by now, he could scarce see a bloody thing. And as the moments passed and he found nothing, he was no longer even sure he was searching the right spot. Losing patience, he thrashed about in his efforts, splashing chilled droplets up over his shirt, his face, his hair. As one icy trickle cascaded down the back of his neck, he muttered imprecations against all damned legends, cursing King Arthur and his rotten knights along with St. Ledger's and their infernal chosen brides, irritating women who unsettled you by walking through your soul, almost breaking your nose, then heaving your ancestral sword into a god-cursed pond. By the time Lance's fingers finally struck up against the hilt, he was wet through and thoroughly out of temper. He dragged the heavy weapon up out of the water, and he sloshed his way toward the bank, still muttering under his breath. Rosalind greeted his return with a cry of dismay. Clutching a tree trunk for support, she said hoarsely, No, put, put it back. You've no right. I have every right. Lance clambered ashore, dripping like a drenched hound. 
Open your eyes, you little fool. There's no magic lake. Just a slime-ridden pool full of damned cold water. No Excalibur. Just a cursed old sword with a bit of glass shoved in the hilt, he said, all but throwing the weapon at her feet. The moon broke from the cloud cover, enough to reveal the sword's sorry state. Spattered with mud and draped with bracken from the pond, even the luster of the crystal was dimmed. Something seemed to dim in Rosalind's eyes, too. She pressed her hand to her mouth and began to weep softly. Lance flung himself down the bank, groping for his boots and hose. Clenching his jaw, he tried to ignore her as he jammed the garments back on. But he'd never heard any woman weep the way Rosalind did. Loud, inelegant sniffs, sobs she tried heroically to suppress, but couldn't quite. Oh, don't do that, he groaned at last. She turned away from him, burying her face against the trunk of the tree, her bonnet falling back to hang by its strings, its black veil trailing like a streamer, her hair a glint of gold in the darkness. Her shoulders shook with the force of her grief. Look, I'm sorry, he said, levering himself after her. It's just, you don't know what a nuisance that useless old sword has been already. You throwing it into the lake was the final straw. She merely cried harder, as though her very heart would break, her ragged sobs seeming to tear at him, making him feel lower than something that had slithered from the bottom of the pond. Rosalind. Softening his voice, he rested one hand on her shoulder, trying to peer into her face. Please, we can pretend the damned sword is anything you want it to be. Just don't cry any... He broke off, his hand coming away from her, warm, sticky. Frowning, he brought his fingers closer to his face for a better look. Blood! Rosalind, are you hurt? he demanded sharply. Leave me alone, she replied in an unsteady whisper. But he caught her by the forearm, gently yet firmly forcing her to turn round. He drew her close enough to see what he had failed to notice before in the darkness. The damp stains spread across one shoulder, blending with the black of her cloak. My God, what have you done to yourself? N nothing, she hiccuped, attempting to thrust him away. It's none of your concern but he swept both her protests and her hands aside. Peeling back her cloak, his alarm mounted. Her bodice was soaked through as much as his own shirt, but with a darker substance. Without hesitation, he tore open the front of her gown. No, she quavered, slapping weakly at his fingers. Must you always be undressing me? Only for medicinal reasons, remember. He tried to flash her a reassuring grin, but the smile never came. His face stilled as he laid bare the injured shoulder, a sliver of moonlight playing over the ugly wound, the tide of crimson staining her white skin. Lance remembered the sound that had brought him charging into the clearing in the first place, and his gut clenched. My God, Rosalind, you've been shot! She was still trying to wriggle away from him, but she froze. I have? She twisted to peer down at her own shoulder, a soft gasp escaping her. Oh. Rosalind trembled and swayed suddenly, barely giving Lance enough time to catch her. He eased her down to the bank, using her cloak as a cushion as he propped her back against the tree. Before the moon faded behind the clouds, the silvery light illuminated her tear-streaked face, her skin so deathly pale, her eyes dilated with a look Lance had seen before. On the battlefield, dazed men stumbling about, scarce realising they'd had an ear shot off or part of an arm blown away. Rosalind was fairly in a state of shock, and if he hadn't been such a blockhead, he would have noticed that something was wrong far sooner. He tried gently to examine the wound, but when she flinched and cried out, he stopped at once. He had no way of telling how bad it was, but it seemed to him that she had already lost a deal too much blood. The best he could do was contrive a makeshift bandage and get her the devil away from here as swiftly as possible. 
He pawed urgently through the other garments he had discarded earlier, fumbling for his cravat, a handkerchief, anything that he could use to bind the wound. He could hear her quickened breathing as she watched him. It m must have happened when that man with the hood pointed his pistol at me, she murmured. He wanted the sword, but I said no, and I hit the pistol with the tip of the blade, and it went off. There was noise and smoke, and I felt something burn, but... But I didn't think... You silly chit, Lance chided gruffly. Why didn't you just give him the damned sword? C couldn't. After I found it, it was my duty to, to keep it safe. Her duty. Lance felt something thicken in his throat, something vile and bitter that tasted like shame. He swallowed hard. Fool, bloody damned fool, he muttered. But it was himself he cursed as he folded his handkerchief carefully against her shoulder, preparing to use his cravat to hold the linen fast. I'm sorry, but this is going to hurt like the devil. I have to make it tight. She tensed, but nodded bravely at his warning. As he knotted the cravat around her shoulder, he felt her body arc with tension. She sucked in her breath with a tiny moan that Lance found somehow worse than if she had screamed. By the time he finished applying the bandage, Lance was disturbed to discover his hands were shaking. There, he said. That will have to do until I get you to Castle Ledger. When he felt her stiffen with alarm, he hastened to add, Only to turn you over to my brother's care. Val is almost a doctor. Better than one. He'll see that you're set to rights. As he arranged his own frock coat around her shoulders instead of the blood-stained cloak, she disconcerted him yet again by asking, then, then you don't think I'm going to die? Good God, no, don't be a little idiot, he said. But her words struck a chill through him. He scooped his hands beneath her knees, preparing to lift her as carefully as possible. He could tell she didn't want him to, didn't want to be that close to him, hated it, in fact, but her head sagged against his shoulder. Although he fought to block the memory, Prospero's grim voice returned to haunt Lance. The sorcerer whispering of ancient curses and tragedy, the dire fate of Marius St. Ledger's neglected bride. She died in his arms. As he swept Rosalind off her feet, Lance stole one glance down at her pale face and felt a strange constriction in his chest. The soldier who had hazarded his own life in countless battles suddenly remembered what it was to be afraid. Chapter 8 Night settled over Castle Ledger, the sky of such unrelenting blackness, it was as though nothing existed beyond the windows of Lance's bedchamber, except a great dark void. He paced in the shadows by the heavy brocade curtains, feeling as though all the light left in the world centred on the young woman lying amidst a halo of candlelight. Rosalind Carlyon looked swallowed up in the vastness of his four-poster bed, her golden hair spilling across a mound of pillows. She dragged the end of a sheet across her exposed breast to retain some part of modesty while Val examined her. Whatever emotion had so dazed Val the first time he saw Rosalind at Effie's was no longer in evidence. He appeared his usual dependable self when confronted with a medical emergency, that transformation stealing over Val that always amazed Lance whenever he beheld it. The dream-ridden expression that usually clouded his brother's eyes vanished before a look far more firm and steady, his orders handed out with a quiet authority. One of the young housemaids hovered nearby to serve him, moving the candles closer at Val's request, holding the basin as he sponged the wound. The sight of blood apparently in no way discomposed Sally Sparkins, who'd grown up among an entire horde of breakneck brothers, including the feckless Jem. It was Lance who found himself shaken. He'd seen far more gruesome injuries upon the field of battle, but he was obliged to look away from the ugly wound, marring Rosalind's fair skin. 
He focused on her face instead. His valiant lady of the lake seemed to have dwindled back into a child, her eyes huge and frightened, her cheeks gone deadly pale. And all Lance could do was pace, clenching his hands into fists, every muscle knotted with a sense of frustration, of helplessness. When he heard her stifle a cry at Val's gentle probing, Lance nearly bolted across the room, only to bring himself up short, knowing there was nothing he could do, nothing but make matters worse. Rosalind would only shrink from the sight of Lance as she had done before when he'd wanted to hold her hand, offer her what comfort he could, or, failing that, allow her to dig her nails into his flesh, scream and curse at him. But Rosalind had wanted none of those things, choosing to bear her suffering in a stoic silence. She'd turned her head toward Val and begged in a broken whisper that had lodged itself deep in Lance's heart, "'Please, just make him go away.' Val had cast Lance a rueful glance, but jerked his head toward the far corner of the room, and Lance had been left with no choice but to wait and watch from the shadows until he thought he'd run mad. He realized that he was the last person on earth who could offer any aid or comfort to Rosalind Carlyon now. The man who'd already done his best to terrify her into leaving the village who had cursed and raged at her for throwing his sword in the lake, shattering all her romantic illusions, then crowned everything by dragging her back to Castle Ledger against her will. It was a miracle that she was still conscious after what she'd been through. That mad gallop back from the King's Wood would ever remain a nightmare in Lance's mind, his arms straining to hold Rosalind secure in the saddle over the stretches of rough ground, the moon vanishing behind threatening clouds, the rugged landscape becoming no more than a blur, his fear and hers mingling in the dark. Rosalind had wept and pleaded with him to take her back to the inn, to fetch her a doctor in the village. But Lance had been afraid to risk it. Dr. Marius St. Ledger's practice ranged all up and down the coast, one could never be certain of finding the man at home. Ignoring all of Rosalind's pleas, Lance had galloped relentlessly on toward Castle Ledger, sweeping her almost by instinct to the one person he'd always been able to depend upon. No matter how much Lance might resent it, no matter how much it angered and exasperated him, for all his life, whenever he had been in his deepest trouble, there was always Val. He felt as though he'd never needed his brother more than he did tonight. Yet it was the hardest thing Lance had ever done, to surrender Rosalind to Val's care, to stand uselessly aside while his brother sought to work his healing skills. Her continued consciousness no longer seemed like such a great blessing. She finally admitted to Val what she had stubbornly refused to confess to Lance. It, it hurts, she whispered, tears leaking from her eyes. I don't know why men are always eager to be shooting each other. It is most unpleasant. I know. I have never understood it myself, Val replied with a wry smile. But we'll soon have you set to rights. She made a valiant effort to smile back, which Lance found somehow worse than if she'd cried out. Val beckoned to Sally to continue sponging the wound while he rose, wiping his hands on a towel. Unaided by his cane, he crossed the room to Lance, his limp more awkward than usual. The gentle smile Val had worn for Rosalind's benefit faded to an expression far more grave, and Lance felt his gut clench. Well, he demanded sharply, how bad is it? Val murmured, bad enough. The shot passed too high to have hit any fatal spot, but the ball is still lodged in her shoulder, and she's lost a deal of blood. Damnation, Lance groaned. Fortunately, the ball is not in deep. You should not have any difficulty extracting it, Lance. What? Lance stared at his brother. His exclamation caused Rosalind to flinch and glance fearfully in their direction. Lance forced himself to lower his voice. What the devil are you talking about? I'm no doctor. You're the one who's been studying with Marius. Yes, but I've had little experience with gunshot wounds. You've handled far more of this kind of thing than I ever have. Only on the battlefield when surgeons were scarce. 
Lance blustered. Only among poor, wounded bastards, so desperate they didn't care what kind of cow-handed idiot operated on them as long as you poured enough whiskey down their throats. Soldiers accustomed to hazarding life and limb, burly men with hides as thick as his own, who roared and cursed and spat when their wounds were probed and cauterized. But the mere thought of visiting such agony upon his gentle Lady of the Lake turned Lance's veins to ice. I can't do it, Lance rasped. You have to, Val tugged at his sleeve with an urgent whisper. If Marius were here, but he's not, and there's no time to fetch him. Lance glared at his brother. And while I'm torturing her, what the deuce are you going to be doing? I'm going to hold her hand, Val said quietly. Lance had not thought it possible to feel any more horror at this situation than he already did. But the dread resolve he read in Val's eyes showed Lance how much he was mistaken. No, he breathed. When Val's lips folded into that stubborn line Lance recognized all too well, he seized his twin's arm and gave it a rough shake. Are you listening to me, Valentine? I am telling you no. Why else did you bring her to me, then? Val demanded. Not, not for that, damn it. Surely you must have some laudanum or... or... I don't use laudanum to treat my patients any more. Lance regarded his brother aghast. You mean to tell me you're risking using that infernal power of yours all the time now? After... after... Lance swallowed hard, finding himself unable even to speak of that terrible day that had left Val crippled. You're a bloody madman, he finished harshly. No, I've simply learned how much I can risk. Val said, his face calm, with that same sort of fortitude martyrs must have displayed before casting themselves into the flames. I can control myself better now, he insisted, seeking gently to pry Lance's fingers from his arm. You have to trust me, Lance. Nothing will go wrong this time. And if it does, Lance hissed, then I can bear the consequences far better than she can. Val's eyes travelled toward Rosalind with an expression that was at once tender and wistful. You would not want your lady to suffer any more if you could prevent it, would you? No, damn it, but... Then stop arguing with me. We've no time for it. All you're doing is frightening her. Lance started to retort, but he saw that what Val said was true. Rosalind had clearly been trying to follow their conversation. She couldn't possibly hear what was being said... But she must have sensed the tension between them, for her face appeared more white and drawn. Lance reluctantly released him, and Val all but bolted back to the bedside. Lance followed hard after, by no means reconciled to what Val intended to do, but short of using brute force, Lance didn't see how he could prevent him. There was never any stopping St. Valentine, he thought bitterly. Lance hovered near the foot of the bed, feeling torn, desperate, as though he were being asked to choose between the pale young woman on the bed and his own brother. A choice that Lance feared he'd already made just by bringing Rosalind to Val. He watched as Val settled himself on the edge of the bed and gathered Rosalind's hand into his own, murmuring some soft word of reassurance. Lance started to protest, but he looked down at her pain-racked features, and somehow the words stuck in his throat. It was too late, anyway. He saw her eyes flicker in surprise, and he knew she was already starting to sense it, Val's own warm, dark brand of the St. Ledger magic, coursing through the strength of his fingertips to hers. Lance's hand clenched around the bedpost, the scene before him dredging up pain-filled memories, the kind he'd fought so hard to forget, but it was as though he could feel time itself slipping away from him, the bedchamber blurring into a battlefield. And it wasn't Rosalind's hand Val clasped, but his own. Hold on to me, Lance. I'm here, Val urged, his soot-streaked face appearing through the acrid haze of smoke, his gentle voice carrying above the blaze of cannon fire the screams of dying men. No! Lance writhed in his own blood, agony spiralling from the shattered mass of bone and muscle that had once been his right knee. Pain. 
He was nigh out of his mind with it, but not so much that he didn't realise what Val was planning to do. Leave me alone, damn it! Lance, please, lie still. I only want to help you. No! Lance cursed and struggled to pull free. Didn't Val understand? He didn't want to be helped. He merely wanted to die. But he was too weak and Val far too strong. His brother tightened his grip. It's all right, Lance. I can take it. Just keep holding on to me. No, damn you, Val! Let go of me! Lance's breath escaped in a ragged cry of despair. Let me go! Lance? Lance! The urgent sound of Val's voice wrenched Lance back to the present. As he focused on the bed, he saw that Rosalind's eyes had closed, the lines of her face relaxing, her breathing coming light and quick. It was Val's breath that was laboured. He maintained a firm grip on Rosalind's hand, but his face was drained white, beads of perspiration dotting his brow. Nonetheless, he managed to flash Lance a strained smile. There. I'm ready. But would... would appreciate it if you made haste, Lance. Val's pain-clouded eyes travelled toward the young housemaid. All he said was, Sally. But the girl seemed to understand him well enough. She fetched Val's instrument case and somberly held it out to Lance. She'd been in service at Castle Ledger far too long to question or even be surprised by these proceedings. Lance recoiled from the gleaming surgical knives, wanting to curse Val, wanting to refuse, but he couldn't even afford the luxury of hesitation. They were both depending upon him now, Rosalind and Val, indelibly linked by the fragile bond of clasped hands and the strength of Val's terrifying power. Lance tightened his jaw and steadied his fingers. As he grasped the steel handles of the probe, he reflected darkly on the perverseness of fate and Valentine St. Ledger. For the second time in his life, Lance was about to become the instrument of inflicting pain upon his brother. And just as it had happened so long ago, Val had left him damned little choice. The storm that had threatened for so many days had finally broken with flashes of lightning and cannonades of thunder. Wind and rain battered against the house with a kind of fury that could only be hurled landward by an angry sea. But the tempest outside seemed as nothing compared to the one that raged in Lance as he trudged downstairs, a veritable maelstrom of fear, guilt and painful memories. He headed for the library, where a decanter of whiskey had been left waiting for him. Reaching for the bottle, he was disconcerted by how badly his hands were shaking. It was nearly an hour since he had extracted the ball from Rosalind's delicate shoulder, but he was still trembling like a raw recruit staggering back from the terrors of his first battle. By some mercy of God, he hadn't killed either Rosalind or his brother with his clumsy efforts. The lady seemed pale and weak, but no longer in pain. As for Val, he had recovered enough to tend to the cleaning and bandaging of Rosalind's wound himself. As soon as her eyes had fluttered open, Lance had realised his presence at her bedside was no longer welcome or needed. He'd backed off and slipped out of the room to find some place where he could fall apart in private, alone and unobserved. Disgusted by his own weakness, Lance tossed the whisky down his throat and felt somewhat better as the fiery liquid flowed through his veins, enough so that when he poured out his second cup, the lip of the decanter barely rattled against the glass. Clutching his drink, he sank down in the chair behind the desk with a weary sigh. As he did so, his fingers brushed up against something hard resting upon the desk's surface. The St. Ledger sword, polished, to a state of gleaming magnificence. Lance stared at the weapon in bewilderment. The last he'd seen of the blade, it had been coated with mud and discarded on the hall table. One of the footmen must have cleaned it and fetched it in here. Or... He stole an uneasy glance around him. The burst of lightning that cracked outside the window, forcing him to consider another possibility. He peered intently, half expecting Prospero to emerge from the shadows, mocking him. But to his relief, 
he found himself quite alone. Whatever tempest raged outside was clearly the work of nature, and not the further tricks of a long-dead sorcerer. Setting down his glass, Lance touched the sword, as though needing to reassure himself that the ancient weapon truly had been restored to Castle Ledger. Small thanks to him, he thought with self-contempt. Even half swooning from the pistol shot lodged in her shoulder, Rosalind had been the one to remember the blade Lance had abandoned at the pool's edge. He hadn't been thinking of anything but getting Rosalind to Castle Ledger, but she had refused to leave without the sword, even when he'd cursed and railed at her to stop struggling and be still. Afraid that she'd do herself further harm, he'd been forced to pause long enough to tie the blasted weapon to his saddle. Lance fingered the crystal mounted in the pommel. He supposed that he should feel more joy at the sword's recovery, but all he seemed able to think of was how close Rosalind had come to losing her life, fiercely protecting the weapon that should have been his charge. He thrust the sword away from him, only to wince when something sharp jabbed his thumb. Frowning, he bent to examine the hilt more closely for the cause of his injury. The crystal, once so polished, the diamond-like side so smooth, was chipped, a small fragment broken away. When or how it had happened, Lance had no idea, but that seemed of small importance, he thought dourly. It had been his intention to surrender the sword to his father upon Anatole St. Ledger's return, something that would have been difficult enough to do, but now, with the magnificent crystal marred. Hell and the devil confound it, Lance muttered. That blasted sword had descended safely from generation to generation in his family, never sustaining any damage until it had passed through his hands. It was enough to make him start to wonder if he was cursed. But why couldn't he be the one to bear the brunt of it? Why did someone else always have to endure the consequence of his folly? First Rosalind had been horribly wounded, then Val had had to suffer again, and now his family's treasured sword would be forever flawed. But as usual, Lance and Ledger emerged unscathed. Considering what a bastard he was, he seemed to lead a remarkably charmed life. Gulping down the rest of his whiskey in one huge bitter swallow, Lance was distracted from his dark reflections when the library door creaked open. Twisting round to see who it was, Lance forgot all about the sword as Val crept into the room. Lance had seen enough of pistol wounds to know that his Lady of the Lake was by no means out of danger. He leapt to his feet, fearing what his brother might have come to tell him. As haggard and bone-weary as he looked, Val summoned up a reassuring smile. "'Everything's all right, Lance. I've finished bandaging Rosalind's shoulder and given her to cordial. "'And how—' Lance could scarce find the courage to voice the question— how is she? Much better. Enough so that she can sleep. I treated her wound with basilican ointment, and barring the risk of infection, I believe we shall have her up and about by the end of the week. Thank God, Lance murmured, feeling some of the tension melt out of him. But he scrutinized Val's every moment as he limped across the room. Was it his imagination, he wondered anxiously, or was Val now carrying his right shoulder more stiffly? And you? Lance demanded. How are you faring? Oh, I... I am well enough. Lance's doubt must have showed, for Val thrust his shoulder forward. Look, see for yourself. No wound, no blood. If you don't believe me, go ahead. Give me a good hard jab. So you can pretend that it doesn't hurt. No, thank you. Val flushed, a rare hint of irritation creeping into his voice. I may be a trifle tender in that shoulder, that is all. I told you there would be no permanent damage done. No, not much, Lance thought grimly. Only the deep brackets that framed Val's mouth, the lines that feathered his dark brown eyes. It was aging him, this reckless use of his power, this cursed ability of Val's to absorb another person's pain. But he would never stop to count the cost of that. Not St. Valentine. 
Lance felt his chest constrict with the love, anger and frustration his brother had always inspired in him. It occurred to him that he'd never once thanked Val for all that he had done. Not all those years ago. Not tonight. He'd never be grateful for what happened on that battlefield. But what his brother had done for Rosalind was another matter. Lance experienced a strong urge to clasp Val by the hand, to try to express some measure of his gratitude. But that would be tantamount to confessing that he was capable of caring deeply about his brother. And about Rosalind as well. And God forbid that the callous rakehell Lance and Ledger should do a thing like that. He sank back down behind the desk and poured out another whiskey instead, thrusting it into Val's hand. He was a little surprised when his brother took it without protest. Val rarely imbibed anything stronger than claret. But he settled into a wing chair opposite and quaffed the whiskey with a deep sigh. He set the empty glass back on the desk, his grateful smile fading as he studied Lance, as though taking in the details of his sodden breeches and shirt for the first time. My God, Lance, you look like something that crawled from the depths of a stagnant pond. Val sniffed, pulling a face. You smell like it, too. Thank you very much. Perhaps now that Rosalind is taken care of, you wouldn't mind vouchsafing me some sort of explanation? What the blazes have you been doing? Where did you find the sword? And what happened to Rosalind? Lance hunched his shoulders in imitation of his usual careless shrug. You told me to go fetch my bride, didn't you? She wouldn't come, so I had to shoot her. Damn it, Lance. Val began in annoyance then broke off with a reluctant laugh. At least for once, Val seemed to know he was jesting. It was Lance who found it impossible to smile. Maybe I didn't actually shoot her, he said, but I might as well have. The exasperation melted from Val's eyes. Tell me what happened, he said gently. Lance sagged his head back against the top of the chair, feeling loath to recall the evening's events. As usual, the tale would not redound to his credit. But there was no resisting St. Valentine. It was those father-confessor eyes of his, full of such long-suffering wisdom, patience, and compassion. In a flat, expressionless voice, Lance found himself telling Val about all that had happened since that afternoon, finding Rosalind in the clutches of that villain, her extraordinary belief she was protecting Excalibur, how she'd even tossed the sword into the lake to save it. Lance told his brother everything, save for one small detail. Who had sent him seeking Rosalind in the first place? He scarce knew why he was reluctant to speak of Prospero. Perhaps because now that the sword was recovered... Lance hoped never to see his disturbing ancestor again, perhaps because he knew how chagrined Val would be to have missed such an opportunity. And there was enough already in Lance's tale to disappoint. His failure to capture the thief, the damage sustained by the St. Ledger sword, and, most of all, the cavalier way he'd treated Rosalind. I was a perfect bastard to her, he murmured, she was practically in shock, and I didn't even notice. I was too busy cursing at her for throwing the sword in the pond, shouting what a fool she was to believe in Excalibur and enchanted lakes. But then that's something I've always been good at, he added with a bitter twist of his lips, disillusioning people, shattering their dreams. After how fiercely Rosalind fought to protect that sword, I believe your Lady of the Lake is far more resilient than either of us give her credit for. Val said with a slight smile. Not easily daunted, even by you, Lance. I'm sure she will recover. Would she? Lance wondered. From the pistol ball, certainly, but from the far deeper wound he had dealt her. Lance remembered the devastated look in her eyes and wasn't so sure. Anyway, he concluded with a deep sigh, that's about all there is to the story. Or at least all I know of it. I still have no idea how Rosalind became involved in the entire affair or how the sword got damaged. Val reached across the desk and lifted the sword to inspect the crystal for himself. 
His dark brows drew together in a puzzled furrow. It almost looks as though whoever stole the sword deliberately nicked away a shard with all the precision of a gem cutter at work. Why would anyone do a thing like that? I don't know. When you find the thief, you'd best ask him. If I ever find him now. So you still have no idea who this thief might be? Val asked. No, it was too dark, and I was too damned slow to catch up with him. All I know is that he was about my height and build, perhaps a little taller. Val hesitated. About... about Rafe Mortmain's height. When Lance shot him a black skull, he mumbled. Sorry. Val replaced the ancient weapon on the desk, saying, Well, perhaps Rosalind knows something that will help to identify the man. You can ask her tomorrow when you discuss the arrangements for the wedding. Lance scowled, thinking he must not have heard his brother correctly, fearing that he had. "'Whose wedding?' he asked in an ominous tone. "'Yours and Rosalind's.' For a long moment, all Lance could do was stare at Val, not knowing whether he wanted to laugh or strangle his dream-ridden brother. He slowly shook his head in pure disbelief. "'You really are incorrigible, Valentine.' After all that's happened, after all I've said on the subject, to be still harping on that chosen bride legend, still planning my wedding. I'd hoped you were ready to do so yourself. You're the one who fetched Rosalind back here to Castle Ledger. You placed her in your bed. The woman was wounded, remember? What the devil else was I supposed to do with her? We usually treat injuries in the still room off the kitchen, Val reminded him. That place? It's... It's too small and grim. I wasn't dumping her down on some blasted hard oak table. Then there are other beds in this house besides yours. Damn it, Val! What are you getting at? You can't think I brought Rosalind here out of any amorous motives. I was only trying to make her comfortable, keep her safe until you... you could... I know that, Val said gently. But perhaps not everyone else will. What the deuce do you mean? Val sighed then proceeded to explain as patiently as if he were addressing a particularly slow child. Lance, the entire village has been waiting with bated breath for you to fulfil the bride-finder legend by sweeping Rosalind up in your arms and away to your bed, which is exactly what you've done. Because the woman was wounded, damn it! No one could imagine I'd be making love to her with a bullet in her shoulder. What kind of bastard do they think I am? They think you are a St. Ledger, a man whose passions are bound to rage out of control when he finds that one special woman destined to be his forever love. Nonsense, Lance muttered. Even without the legend, there is still the problem that you brought an unmarried lady to a house where there is no proper chaperone for her. I wager you didn't even think to dispatch someone to fetch Rosalind's maid. No, I didn't. Forgive me if I failed to think of the proprieties while Rosalind bled to death. You're going to have to think of them now, Lance. You've placed Lady Carlyon in an unfortunate situation, enough to bring any woman to ruin and unhappiness if she leaves here unwed. I'd make her a damn sight more unhappy if I married her. There has to be a less drastic solution. Lance raked his hand back through his hair with a frustrated sigh. "'scarce able to believe this. "'He barely had time to feel relieved from escaping one disaster, "'only to find himself teetering on the brink of another. "'As soon as the storm eases up, I'll send for her maid,' he announced. "'That won't be good enough, Lance. "'Then tomorrow I'll force Effie to come here and play chaperone as well. "'Will that satisfy you? "'But what about tonight? "'What about it?' Lance asked impatiently. Rosalind's reputation can surely survive one night beneath our roof. No one besides a handful of the servants even knows she's here, and I think I can command their silence. That's not what I meant, Lance. Someone needs to sit up with her tonight, in case she develops a fever. Have Sally do it. She's a sensible girl. It should be you, Lance, Val said stubbornly. Me? Lance's brows shot up in outraged astonishment at the suggestion. After the way you've been preaching propriety at me, now you want me to be alone with her in the bedchamber? 
His eyes narrowed with sudden suspicion. Anyone would almost think you wanted me to compromise Rosalind, so I'd have to marry her. Of course not, Val denied hotly, although he seemed to have difficulty meeting Lance's eyes. But what if she wakes up in the middle of the night, in a strange place, to find a stranger bending over her? After what she's already been through, she'd feel frightened. Val heaved a deep sigh, and so desperately alone. Lance cast his brother a dark look. He was fairly certain Val was deliberately trying to play upon Lance's emotions regarding Rosalind, and was annoyed by it, mainly because it was working. The image Val conjured up of Rosalind waking in the night, feeling lost, alone, terrified, affected Lance more powerfully than he cared to admit. Rosalind doesn't know Sally or me, Val persisted. She only knows you, Lance. Like she knows the devil. And I think she'd find Satan a deal more welcoming than me. In fact, there's only one man in all of Cornwall that Rosalind would be delighted to find by her bedside, and that would be her beloved hero, Sir Lancelot. Lance had started to sneer the name, but he found himself strangely unable to do so. He finished in softer, more thoughtful tones. Sir Lancelot du Lac he murmured, as the idea struck him more forcibly than a lightning bolt from the storm. Perhaps he would never have even entertained such an insane notion if he wasn't a little mad or a little drunk. Imbibing whiskey on an empty stomach was never a good thing. And yet the more Lance thought about it, the less crazed the idea seemed. To don his disguise of Sir Lancelot du Lac, to play the hero for her one last time, make her feel safe, comforted if she awoke in the night. In some strange way, Lance almost felt he owed it to her. His unfortunate Lady of the Lake had already become entangled in his family's own mad legends, and Lance's reckless escapade with the sword. She'd be leaving Cornwall with a scarred shoulder. Did he have to send her away with a scarred heart as well? All her romantic illusions in ashes... He'd taken Excalibur away from her. But he could give her back Sir Lancelot, spin for her a memory she could press forever between the pages of her books on Camelot. Some of his thoughts must have been visible in Lance's face. Val stiffened, regarding Lance warily. No, Lance, he said. I can guess what you're thinking, and it wouldn't be a good idea. Why not? Lance asked seems to me the perfect solution. I can keep vigil over Rosalind without compromising her honour. No lady's virtue can be threatened by a ghost. But it's dangerous for you. You're blasted night-drifting. He who has great power must use it wisely. That's rich coming from you. Val had the grace to blush. It's not only that. For you to deceive Rosalind again in this way, to keep up this absurd pretense... It can only make matters worse between you. I don't see how that's possible, do you? When Val continued to argue, Lance cut him off and shoved to his feet. My mind is quite made up. Now, are you going to help me or not? Val regarded him for a long moment, his eyes clouded with apprehension and frustration. But he heaved a resigned sigh. What do you want me to do? I thought that would be obvious, Lance said with a wry smile. Come and help me find the damned chainmail. Chapter 9 Rosalind sank deeper against the pillows, her eyes darting fearfully past the bed curtains to the unfamiliar chamber that yawned before her, a dark, uncharted territory, lit only by intermittent flashes of lightning. When a loud clap of thunder shook the windows, she flinched and dragged the sheet closer to her chin. She'd never been afraid of storms before, and yet even the wind and rain seemed rougher here than those soothing downpours that had watered her garden in Kent. The thunder raged and the lightning tore jagged slashes in the sky with a violent grandeur that matched this wild land, this formidable house perched high atop the cliffs. 
She'd caught terrifying glimpses of the place from the shelter of Lance's arms when he'd lifted her down from the saddle. Through the haze of her pain, she'd obtained night-darkened impressions of a sprawling manor adjoined to the towering battlements and ancient keep of an old castle. As though time itself had blurred here, centuries shifting with the blink of an eye. Castle Leisure. The name itself whispered of a certain dark mystery. And now she was a virtual prisoner within its walls, held fast by her own weakened condition. She had dozed fitfully for a while, only to be awakened by the storm. The cordial that Val St. Ledger had coaxed her to drink must have contained some tincture of laudanum, because the throb in her shoulder had eased. But without the pain to distract her, she was left with nothing to do but stare into the darkness. Fretting about her maid, thinking how alarmed Jenny would be when her mistress did not return to the inn tonight, the poor girl would have no way of knowing that Rosalind had landed squarely in the last place in the world she wished to be. Lance St. Ledger's bed. When the storm lit up the room, she could see traces of his presence everywhere. The man's very aura seemed to cling to the sheets, musky and disturbingly masculine, as intimate as if he'd taken those strong, bold hands of his and caressed them down the length of her body, Rosalind thought with a dark shiver. Why had he insisted upon bringing her here instead of back to the village, as she had begged him to do? He'd made it perfectly clear that he'd only followed her out to the lake tonight to recover his sword, that even her getting wounded had been nothing but a confounded nuisance to him. She remembered the fury in his voice, the scathing things he'd shouted at her. Open your eyes, you little fool. There's no magic lake, no Excalibur. And gazing down at that mud-spattered sword, looking suddenly quite ordinary in the pale moonlight, she'd realized he was right. To have ever imagined otherwise was absurd. As absurd as a grown woman who still couldn't tell the difference between fantasy and reality, who wasn't even sure she wanted to. Despite all her fear and anxiety this past week, she'd been strangely happy, feeling more alive than she had since Arthur had died, cherishing and protecting that old sword, believing she was on some sort of quest to help Sir Lancelot du Lac. Was her head truly that empty, her life so barren, that she had to fill it with such foolish dreams? Rosalind feared that it was. Otherwise it wouldn't hurt so much to surrender her romantic illusions about Sir Lancelot. But it did, because without them she'd become exactly what she was when she'd first ventured into Cornwall. A lonely widow. Nothing more. The thought brought a lump to Rosalind's throat and she tossed restlessly on the pillow. The movement caused the bandage on her shoulder to shift a little, and she froze, feeling gingerly beneath the loose bodice of the overlarge nightgown loaned to her by one of the St. Ledger housemaids. Rosalind sought to adjust the thick wad of linen, making certain it remained fixed over her wound. She was surprised when her gropings did not cost her a fresh spasm. Even a splinter removed from a thumb left some tenderness behind. She'd had a bullet dug from her shoulder, and yet she felt nothing. Lance had claimed his brother was a gifted healer, but this was nothing short of miraculous, the more so because Rosalind could not recall exactly what Val St. Ledger had done. From the moment he had sat beside her on the bed and gathered her hands into his, Rosalind's memory became a blur. She thought she must have fainted, and yet it felt more like drifting off to sleep, a golden warmth seeping slowly through her veins, breaking up the darkness of her pain. When she'd opened her eyes, it had been all over, the pistol ball removed from her shoulder, the unbearable ache gone. She'd found both Lance and Val St. Ledger bending gravely over her. Val had looked pale and drawn, and yet all the anguish seemed to have settled deep in Lance's eyes. Ridiculous, of course, especially the notion that she'd seen anything on Lance's face other than mockery and impatience. Only another instance of her imagination running wild. One would think that after all that had happened tonight, she would have finally learned her lesson. 
but it seemed that she hadn't. Otherwise she wouldn't have fancied that she just saw something move beyond the bedposts. Her pulse gave a frightened leap, and her fingers dug deep into the coverlet. Where was a burst of lightning when one needed it, she wondered desperately. Even as she struggled up onto one elbow to peer into the darkness, she tried to tell herself, Don't be silly, it was nothing. Only the shadow cast by the wardrobe in the far corner. But wardrobes, as a general rule, didn't have the ability to shift position, coming closer. Until they reached the foot of the bed and assumed the shape of a man. Tall, broad-shouldered. Rosalind's heart leapt into her throat, and for one moment... She thought it was Lance who'd stolen back to her bedside, the idea at once alarming her and causing her blood to quicken with a strange excitement. Then lightning flared outside the window, throwing him into sharp relief. The flowing dark hair, the hard angles of the profile were Lance's, but the hesitancy of manner, the sadness of expression, belonged to another man entirely as did the coat of gleaming mail that encased his powerful frame. "'My lady,' called that deep voice she had longed for so many nights to hear, "'art thou awake?' A half-strangled sob of joy snagged in Rosalind's throat to be immediately swallowed in the wake of an even stronger despair. She sank back against the pillars, tears starting in her eyes. "'Go away,' she whispered. "'You're not real.' "'My lady, I vow to you that I am,' he said. "'Else my heart could not ache to see you thus, so pale and forlorn.' Rosalind clapped her hands resolutely over her ears and closed her eyes so tight that tears leaked out and trickled down her cheeks. She remained that way for several moments before she dared open her eyes again, despairingly certain he would be gone. He was still there, gazing down at her with such tenderness it was enough to make her heart break. When she scrambled to a sitting position, he cried out in alarm, Nay, my lady, you must lie still. You have been most grievously injured. Ignoring him, Rosalind groped frantically for the candle and tinder box that had been left on the bedside table, muttering, you're not real. You are not. Only a figment of my imagination. And as soon as I get this candle lit, you'll be gone. Nay, my lady, I assure you. His protest died away as she struggled with the flint and tinder. Her hands were shaking so badly it took her long moments to strike up a spark. But she managed to coax the wick to light. As the candle spilled forth its soft glow, she held it up so that the light fell over him, detailing the black woolen tunic, the chain mail that belonged to a warrior of another age. But his face, the generous mouth with its perpetual hint of sadness, the firm jaw, the hawk-like nose, the eyes that glowed with so many dark facets, were possessed of a masculine beauty that was timeless. Rosalind stretched one trembling hand toward him, and he reached for her. She could sense how badly he wanted to catch up her fingers, carry them to his lips. But as he attempted to grasp her hand, his fingers passed through, melting into hers, as though their flesh had become one. No, not flesh, she realized, but spirit. All that he was, all his warmth, passion and courage, all his sorrow, loneliness and despair, blending with her own to become unbearable joy, unbearable pain. With a soft cry, Rosalind shrank back, nearly dropping the candle she clutched in her other hand. Somehow she managed to set the wrought iron holder back upon the table. Then she buried her face in her hands with a shuddering sob. Oh, God, I've gone completely mad. She could almost feel his hand flutter past her hair, wanting to give comfort, helpless to do so. Milady, please do not weep. I swear your mind is as healthy as my own. That is hardly reassuring, she sniffed. For I'm completely delusional. 
And you're dead. Aye, but other than that, I'm quite sound. Rosalind choked on a laugh that bordered on hysteria. She forced herself to take deep breaths, struggling to compose herself. She raised her head, blinking away a blur of tears as she studied his darkly handsome face. The face of a man who couldn't possibly exist outside her dreams. That is certainly what Lance and Ledger would have told her. And yet, you're still here, she faltered, her eyes travelling wonderingly over him. I am a lady to keep watch over you. I never meant to cause you such distress. But if it is truly what you wish, I will go. Rosalind stared at him, knowing that she should command him to do so. That would be the same thing to do. Banish him from this room and her mind forever. When she said nothing, his shoulders slumped in defeat. He turned slowly, sadly, away from her. No, wait, Rosalind cried. Yes, milady. He came about at once, his eyes so eager, his mouth lifted in such a hopeful smile. It settled somewhere deep in her heart. If this was indeed madness, she realized in that instant she didn't want to be cured. Please, don't go. I will stay with you the entire night through, if that is your wish. I only beg one boon of thee. What is that? that you dry your eyes and lie back against the pillows to take thy rest. It was not a brusque command such as Lance would have rapped out, but a gentle request she was powerless to resist. Mopping hastily at her moist eyelashes, she settled back against the pillows, relaxing with a deep sigh. She was rewarded with another of his heart-melting smiles, and she found herself smiling back at Sir Lancelot. But she could not keep the note of reproach from her voice as she asked, Where have you been? I waited at the inn, night after night, for you to come back. I found this old sword hidden between the floorboards in the storeroom, and I thought it was the one you were looking for. I thought it was Excalibur. I know, my lady, he said sadly. You knew, she repeated, stunned. And still you did not come. Forgive me, my lady. He dropped to one knee by the bedside. The humble pose had the effect of bringing his face at a level with her own. So close she could see every sorrow that darkened his eyes. Every regret carved deep into his noble brow. Rosalind found herself forgiving him even before he offered up his explanation. I only realize the truth tonight. Had I guessed sooner you had strayed into such peril, nothing would have kept me from your side, though I scarce know what good I might have done you. He held up his hands ruefully. In this ghostly state, I cannot even wield a sword on your behalf. Yet I would have given up my very soul before I allowed any harm to befall thee. Such stirring words, moving and passionate, a far cry from all of Lance's grumbling and cursing. I wish it could have been you riding to my rescue, Rosalind sighed. And not that dreadful man. Dreadful man? Sir Lancelot looked confused for a moment. Then he said, You mean Lance and Ledger? You know him? He grimaced. Intimately. I thought that you must. In her excitement, Rosalind struggled upright, only to be stopped by an admonishing glance from Sir Lancelot. She sank meekly back down. The resemblance between you and Lance and Ledger is positively uncanny. Although I, I don't mean to insult you, she added hastily. I'm sure you do not, my lady, Sir Lancelot muttered, pulling an odd face. But it is too strange to be mere coincidence. I knew there had to be some connection between you. Aye, there is. Sir Lancelot rose slowly to his feet and paced off a few steps, starting to run his hand back through his hair, only to bring himself up short. At times he seemed to forget himself that he was a ghost, a fact that Rosalind found rather poignant and endearing. The truth is, 
he hesitated like a man on the brink of some painful revelation. The truth about Lance and Leisure and myself is that I am... that we... When he faltered again, Rosalind nodded encouragingly. Yes? He cast her an indecisive look, then finally blurted out, The truth is that Lance St. Ledger is... is a descendant of mine. Somehow Rosalind had a feeling that was not at all what he'd meant to say. But she was too intrigued by the information to puzzle over the matter for long. Your descendant, I guessed as much, she said. But the legends I've read are so conflicting. Some claim that you died childless, while others say that Sir Galahad was your son. Uh, yes, uh, he was. But I never remember reading anywhere that he married. Well, he, uh, he did. He settled down quite nicely after his quest to find the Holy Grail met a sweet young lady, purchased a magnificent castle, and and one of his daughters eventually married a St. Ledger. I suppose it didn't get recorded in the tales, because, because it's not the sort of thing one considers heroic. Weddings, babies, the changing of nappies. It sounds wonderful to me, she said wistfully. I've often thought that if only Arthur and I could have had a child. Rosalind ducked her head in embarrassment, such a sorrow far too intimate to have confided to any man. Yet from the first she had felt a kinship with Sir Lancelot. She couldn't explain. As though he were no stranger, but a close and valued friend. His eyes glowed with a quiet sympathy. Thou cannot conceive, my lady? I don't know, Rosalind said miserably. Our marriage was so brief, and we were separated so often by Arthur's work in Parliament. We hoped for a child, we planned, but it never happened. And then, then time simply ran out for us. Time has a way of doing that. Who should know better than he, Rosalind thought with a pang. One whose life had ended in the full vigour of his manhood. She gazed deep into his haunted, dark eyes and wondered. Besides his tragic love for Guinevere, what other dreams had he seen go awry and remain unfulfilled? Dwelling on such regrets was making them both melancholy, and Rosalind sought to return to the original subject. We were speaking of your descendants, she reminded him. Oh, yes, the St. Ledgers, he said, wrenching himself back from whatever unhappy memories consumed him. I believe you were telling me how much you disliked them. Well, not Valentine St. Ledger. He seems a most kind and gentle man. I like him a great deal better than I do his brother. So do I, Lancelot agreed with a sad smile. But that Lance St. Ledger! Rosalind pursed her lips, having no wish to offend her courtly friend by criticizing his namesake, but she was unable to refrain from venting her indignation. He is arrogant and tormenting, bad-tempered and overbearing, he has no respect for a lady's wishes. I begged him to take me back to the inn, but he dragged me here to Castle Ledger and thrust me into his bed, and... and I'm a little afraid. You have no reason to be. I would never... I mean, he would never harm you. He already forced me to kiss him once. Now I am completely at his mercy. Rosalind added in a small voice, and I am not sure he has any. By God's blood, my lady, if he should ever forget himself so far as to threaten your virtue again, I vow I would smite him down myself. Sir Lancelot looked so savagely protective of her. Rosalind was both thrilled and alarmed. Oh, no, she cried. Please don't do that. The knight eyed her with an expression that was at once curious and strangely hopeful. Then you do like this, Lance? Just a little? No! Sir Lancelot flinched. Perhaps her denial had been too vehement, Rosalind thought guiltily. Despite all of Lance's angry bluster, she couldn't help remembering other things. The gentle way he had lifted her onto the saddle. How strong and secure his arms had felt. 
holding her fast against him, all that long and terrible ride back to Castle Ledger. Lance St. Ledger did save my life, she conceded, but he was perfectly horrid about it, shouting and bellowing at me. Ah, these modern young men, Sir Lancelot sighed. They have no notion how to rescue a damsel in distress. No, they don't. But despite Sir Lancelot's solemn expression, Rosalind detected a twinkle in his eyes, and she couldn't help laughing herself. "'Tis a trifle ridiculous,' she chuckled, "'when a man saves you to be complaining about the manner of it. "'But your infamous descendant could have been a bit more chivalrous. "'He swears far too much. "'That's because he's a damn... he's a dastardly villain.' Sir Lancelot's hearty endorsement of her estimate of Lance's character should have pleased Rosalind. She didn't know why she kept feeling this ridiculous urge to defend the rogue. I suppose Lance had some reason to be angry with me, she said. After all, I did throw his ancestral sword into the lake. She regarded Sir Lancelot rather wistfully. It truly was his sword, wasn't it? And not Excalibur. Alas, my lady, that is so. I crave thy pardon. It was solely my doing that thou wast so grievously misled. Rosalind nestled her cheek against the pillow with a heavy sigh. It is no one's fault but my own. I fear I have a most impulsive imagination. But Lance and Ledger set me straight quickly enough. He doesn't believe in Excalibur or the Enchanted Lake. She offered Sir Lancelot an apologetic smile. I don't think he would even believe in you. I'm sure he wouldn't. The man puts no faith in any of the legends of Camelot. He doesn't believe in his own legends, Rosalind said. I think that's rather sad, don't you? Infinitely, Sir Lancelot murmured, with a wry twist of his lips. He would have abandoned his sword by the lake if I hadn't made him go back for it. He even threatened to throw me in the water if I didn't stop struggling. Men behave strangely when frightened, my lady. Sir Lancelot said gravely. Frightened? Lance and Ledger? What could he possibly have had to be afraid of? He wasn't wounded. No, but you were. Sir Lancelot averted his face, staring fixedly toward the rain-washed windows. He hesitated before finishing. Perhaps, perhaps he was afraid of losing you. But I'm not his to lose. Unless you also believe in this legend of the Chosen Bride, that I am somehow destined for Lance and Ledger, she added anxiously. You don't, do you? I fear I am long past the point of having anything to do with legends or love, my lady. He came about slowly. Perhaps the more important question is, what do you believe? Oh, Rosalind gave a half-embarrassed laugh. Usually I'm far too ready to believe anything. But it seems quite impossible that I should ever fall in love with Lance and Ledger. Although... She broke off in horror at what she'd almost been about to confess. But Sir Lancelot's eyes were filled with the weary understanding of a man who knew far more about the ways of the world than she ever could. Passion, temptation, the longings of the flesh. Although what? he prompted. Her cheeks flushing hotly, she blurted out, "'When Lance forced me to kiss him, I... "'I was not entirely indifferent to him.' "'An odd smile played about the corners of Sir Lancelot's mouth. "'I have heard that kissing is one of the few things the rogue excels at. "'It is not surprising he managed to fluster you.' "'It was more than being flustered. "'It was this rush of desire, so powerful.' I scarce trusted myself with Lance and Ledger. For one moment I felt as though I could have been his for the asking. Was that not terribly wicked of me? Sir Lancelot regarded her with a strange, almost unnerving intensity. At last he averted his gaze, saying, No, my lady, whatever wicked thoughts are present in this house, they are certainly none of yours. He heaved a deep sigh. Mayhap it would be wiser if you did not confide so much in me. But why not? I trust you completely. 
she added shyly. Are you not my friend? Would that I could be worthy of such an honour. I am certain that you are. It's not as though you would fly straight to Lancet Ledger and betray my confidence, would you? No, he said. But he frowned, and Rosalind feared that, as usual, she had been too impulsive. She had presumed too much on their brief acquaintance, unburdening herself to him, perhaps even giving him a disgust of her unmaidenly behaviour. She watched him anxiously, feeling mortified, but when he returned to the bedside, she was relieved to see that his eyes were more kind and gentle than ever. "'You should try to rest now, my lady,' he said. "'You've been through a terrible ordeal. "'But if I fall asleep, you... you will... "'She paused, fretting her lower lip. "'But he readily understood her unspoken fear. "'I'll be here,' he said. "'Did I not swear to keep watch over thee tonight?' And what about tomorrow? But Rosalind refused to spoil the moment by asking such a melancholy question. She tried to comfort herself with the thought that it was enough he was with her here, now. Even the storm seemed to have abated with his arrival, the rain pattering soothingly down the windows. He perched on the edge of the bed, the mattress not even shifting beneath his phantom weight. He was a formidable figure of a man, powerful of shoulder, sinewy of limb, and yet she felt none of those flutters Lance's presence aroused in her, the overwhelming sense of physical awareness. "'It does not alarm you, then?' Sir Lancelot asked. "'To be sharing your bedchamber with a ghost?' "'Not at all. I feel completely safe with you.' She could hardly imagine why her remark should have made him look so sad— but he forced a smile to his lips. Unable to touch her, he contented himself by resting his fingers near hers atop the coverlet, his strong bronzed hand in marked contrast to her own smaller one. You should try to sleep now, my lady. But I'm not tired, Rosalind said, even though she was well nigh exhausted. To close her eyes to sleep would bring the morning, and her gallant phantom would be gone. Talk to me, please, she begged. About what? About everything. Tell me all about your life in Camelot. Uh, ah, well. Sir Lancelot looked extremely discomfited. Perhaps he feared she was seeking to pry into the more painful aspects of his past, his ill-fated affair with Guinevere. Rosalind hastened to reassure him. I meant... Could you please tell me all about your glorious deeds? My glorious deeds? He pulled a rueful face. I fear I do not have many of those to boast of, my lady. The greatest knight who ever sat at King Arthur's round table, who was a legend for his feats of daring and skill at arms, and yet he believed he had done nothing of note? She was much moved by Lancelot's humility. "'But she persisted eagerly. "'Oh, please, what if your quests, your battles? "'If only half the stories written of you are true, "'you must be the most courageous man who ever lived.' "'He shook his head deprecatingly. "'Any fool with enough brawn and two little brains "'can dash about, hacking away with a sword. "'The truest bravery I have ever witnessed "'was after the battle was over, "'the smoke cleared away, "'the last drop of blood spilled.' Lancelot's eyes darkened at some inner vision, not one of any glory, but one that rendered him hauntingly sad. "'Twas then the women would come to find their dead, husbands, sons, brothers, to wash their wounds and lay them out for burial, to shoulder their own grief and then soldier on with their lives. Women of courage, like you. "'Like me? I." You are the fairest and bravest woman I have ever known. His words and the fervent look that accompanied them made Rosalind momentarily forget to breathe. It was painful to have to disillusion him. Oh, no, she said. I've always been rather shy and timid, not, not brave at all. I'm so afraid of... Of, of what, milady? 
he asked when she hesitated. Of dying, she whispered. I've been afraid of dying ever since I lost my husband. Ever since I had to sleep in the morning bed. The what? It is a custom in my late husband's family. After Arthur died, his maiden aunts, Clotilde and Miranda, prepared a special bed for me. The hangings were draped with crepe, and the sheets and pillowcases were all of black. Good Lord! Of course, I wanted to honour Arthur's memory. He was such a good and noble man. But I felt like I was resting in a tomb, that my life was also over. For so many nights I lay awake, like a frightened child, snuffling into my pillow. By God! Sir Lancelot cried passionately. I would never have permitted such a thing. If only I could have been there with you. I wish you had been too. When I am with you, I don't feel afraid of anything, not even death. It doesn't seem like it would be such a terrible thing to join you on the other side. Nay, my lady, never let me hear you say such a thing again. I suppose you wouldn't wish to be plagued with me through all eternity? She meant her words to sound light, almost teasing, but she must have failed, for a tormented look sprang to Lancelot's eyes. What I wish is... is... He levered himself abruptly from the bed, saying in an agonized voice most unlike his own, Oh, God, Rosalind, why? Why couldn't you have left that sword alone when you found it? Why didn't you just go home? I don't know, she said, with a soft break in her voice. Perhaps because I don't really have a home any more. Surely you have the house where you lived with your husband. No, the entire estate was entailed upon a distant male cousin. What? You mean you inherited nothing? Not even a widow's jointure? At least some capital left in keeping for you, safely invested in the funds? Rosalind's eyes widened. For such a dashing phantom, Sir Lancelot was possessed of an astonishing business-like streak, far more so than her idealistic husband had been. No, there was nothing like that, she said. Arthur always meant to establish a trust for me, but he never got round to altering his will. Never got round to it? Something in Sir Lancelot's tone caused Rosalind to feel a trifle defensive, my late husband was preoccupied with a very noble cause, she said proudly. He was a reformer, dedicated to improving conditions for the poor. Such as his own wife? The caustic comment sounded exactly like something Lance and Ledger might have said. When Rosalind regarded Sir Lancelot in pained surprise, he immediately said, Forgive me, my lady. I intended no disrespect to your late husband. If my passions betrayed me, it is only because of my concern for you. Rosalind was deeply moved by this, but she could not allow him to believe that Arthur had neglected her, a thought she found too painful herself to consider. I was not left destitute. I have a small competence I inherited from my parents, an income of nearly fifty pounds a year, she said. And Arthur's aunts are very kindly permitted me to live with them, Although, she pulled a wry face, I'm not certain even Miranda and Clotilde will want me now. Why not? Arthur's aunts have never truly approved of me. They've always found me sadly scatterbrained, and this latest disaster only proves them right. If they ever find out that I ended up in a rake's bed instead of properly visiting Cousin Dora, as I was supposed to do, they are likely toss me into the streets and fling all my legend books right after me. She attempted to smile, but Sir Lancelot's brows had drawn together in a heavy scowl. Nay, my lady, he protested, I cannot believe even the most hard-hearted of dames would treat you thus. They would, and I would not blame them. I fear I may have created a dreadful scandal and sullied the Carlion name. Sir Lancelot muttered something beneath his breath. If it had been anyone else but her chivalrous hero, 
Rosalind would have thought it was an extremely ungentlemanlike description of Arthur's aunts. He took to pacing furiously, looking so disturbed, Rosalind regretted she told him anything. Her noble phantom had enough else to torment him. His own bitter memories, the sins that kept him a drifter for all eternity. She could not allow him to add her troubles to his burden. She spoke up, seeking to reassure him. Even if Arthur's aunts should turn me away, I know what I would do. I've often thought before of setting up my own establishment. Sir Lancelot stopped his pacing long enough to regard her with a hint of impatience. On fifty pounds a year, my lady? Surely I could afford to rent a small cottage, if I were very frugal, and, and I could take in sewing. I'm very handy with a needle. If Sir Lancelot had appeared disturbed before, he now looked positively horror-stricken by her suggestion. It is something impecunious widows often do, isn't it? she asked. I believe it is considered respectable. Respectable, perhaps. But what a devil of a life, Lancelot said. Then flinched and immediately added, Your pardon, my lady, but you have no idea. You would be entirely cut off from any society worthy of you. No dinner parties, no balls, no invitations of any kind. I don't attend parties now. But you should. You are far too young to be left so all alone. I still have my books, she smiled cheerfully up at him, and my legends. But rather than giving him comfort, she only seemed to be making matters worse. He gazed back at her, his mouth pinched hard, his eyes stricken with... with guilt? But why should Sir Lancelot feel any guilt over her? Before she could even begin to fathom the odd expression, his lashes swept down, veiling it, and he murmured, there is no reason for you to reach any drastic decisions tonight. You really should sleep now. You are looking incredibly tired. Rosalind could not deny it. Her exhaustion did finally seem to be catching up with her. Perhaps it was all this talk of her future, which even in her most optimistic frame of mind had never seemed anything but bleak. She snuggled deeper beneath the covers, but before she closed her eyes, she stole one last glance at Sir Lancelot. He appeared to have fallen into such a dark state of distraction that she couldn't help reminding him of his pledge. And you will stay with me the entire night through? I, my lady. The darkness fell from his eyes to be replaced by an infinitely tender look. I will be here for as many other nights as you wish. Rosalind's own eyes widened with a delighted wonder. That is a very reckless promise, she warned. I might wish for a good many nights, even though it is very selfish of me. But I did try to free you. That is why I went to the lake tonight. When Sir Lancelot appeared thoroughly confused, she said, The sword, remember? You told me if it was sunk back to the bottom of the lake, you might finally know peace. Lancelot cringed. I tend to say so many stupid things, my lady. Sometimes I think my tongue should be cut out. Then even if the sword had been Excalibur, and I had restored it to the enchanted lake, it would not have helped you? Nay, my lady, I am past all hope of redemption. Unless... Unless what? Unless one day, instead of attempting to steal away another man's bride... I were to find a love that was all my own. Quite impossible now, I fear. His eyes smiled into hers with a longing that was both poignant and unbearable, and found an answering echo in Rosalind's own heart, as though she too were reaching for the impossible. She stretched her fingers toward him. He hesitated, then reached for her as well, until his larger hand rested against hers, palm to palm in an unearthly glow of light, as though for that one fleeting moment they could actually touch each other, not flesh to flesh, but one lonely soul briefly joined to another in a rare feeling of peace, warmth, and complete happiness. All too soon, Sir Lancelot drew back, commanding her to take her rest. 
Rosalind obediently closed her eyes, but as she was drifting off to sleep, Lancelot's voice came to her one last time. My lady, there is a very great favour you could do for me. Anything, she mumbled drowsily. Would, would you be willing to give Lance and Ledger another chance? The request startled her enough that she forced her heavy eyelids open a fraction. Another chance to do what? To make amends for his behaviour. To right the wrongs he has done you. Do you think the rogue would be likely to do so? I believe that he would. Perhaps he is not so black as either of us have thought him to be. At least if you would be willing to listen to him, allow him to try. Rosalind nestled her head deeper in the pillow, confused by exactly what Sir Launcelot was attempting to say. But she could refuse him nothing, and she mumbled a sleep-blurred promise, although she was scarce aware of what she had pledged herself to do. Her eyes fluttered closed again, her last thought being that somehow her future did not seem so grim any more. She knew with sudden certainty she would not be going back to stay with the aunts in Kent. Miranda and Clotilde would most decidedly not want her now, for she had finally committed the most unpardonable folly of all. She had lost her heart to a ghost. Long after Rosalind had gone to sleep, the ghost of Sir Lancelot de Lac paced by her bedside, a valiant figure from another age in chain-mail and black tunic. But when he gazed down at her, it was with Lance St. Ledger's troubled eyes. Did the woman have to look so blasted sweet and vulnerable? Lance reflected gloomily. Rosalind hugged his pillow as though she were embracing a lover, her golden hair fanning about her shoulders, a soft rose blushing her cheeks as though she were lost deep in the most blissful of dreams. Of Camelot and knights in shining armour, no doubt. Lance expelled a deep sigh. Valentine had, as usual, been right. Lance should never have continued this ridiculous masquerade. It had gotten him in far deeper with Rosalind than he'd ever imagined possible. What folly had possessed him to promise her that Sir Lancelot would come to her again, for as many nights as she wished. The woman already believed in him too entirely, trusted him too completely, imagining he was her friend, confiding in him more about herself than he'd ever wanted to know, especially the most daunting confession of all. I could scarce trust myself with Lance and Ledger. For one moment I felt as though I could have been his for the asking. It was a dangerous admission to make to any man, let alone a rake as notorious as himself. Lance had never been noted for his self-denial. He could be grateful at this moment that he was only a spirit, not flesh. But come the morning, he observed her with hungry eyes, the way she curled up in his bed, so innocently unaware of the temptation she presented to him. As soon as she was healed enough to travel, the best thing he could do would be to send her away from here. But send her away to what? If Lance was unable to cast a mantle of propriety over this ill-fated adventure, if Rosalind did end up being cast out by those two old witches, if she were indeed forced to strike out all on her own, the mere thought of such a thing made Lance's blood run cold. His dreamy-eyed Rosalind clearly had no idea of the sort of grim fates that could befall an unprotected woman, especially one who was branded ruined goods, Anything from the soul-wearying drudgery of so-called genteel poverty to the complete degradation of being forced into prostitution in order to survive. Yet even if he succeeded in saving Rosalind's reputation, was the destiny that awaited her any better? To return to a dismal existence of sleeping in beds with black sheets and being bullied to death by two spinsterish harpies? He felt an almost suffocating rage against the late Lord Carlyon, an idealistic idiot out to save the world, but obviously with little thought to spare for his own bride. If her beloved Arthur had failed to provide for Rosalind, Lance didn't know why he should feel as though it had become his responsibility. 
or why he should care so much. But it had, and he did. He hovered by the bedside, observing Rosalind with a tender exasperation. A lady who possessed far more courage and enthusiasm than she did good sense. Someone who, no matter how bleak and cold the world turned around her, would always find a way to believe in dreams and cherish legends. Just like Val, Lance realized with some amazement. Was that why he felt this fierce sense of protectiveness toward Rosalind, that he'd always experienced toward his twin? No matter how much his brother's dreamy-eyed optimism often irritated Lance, he'd never wanted to see Valentine changed, poisoned with the disillusionment that darkened Lance's veins. And now he felt exactly the same about Rosalind. Perhaps that had been the real reason he'd swept her back to Castle Ledger, the instinctive urge of a man when he found something that precious to tuck it away in the one place he might feel sure of keeping it safe in his own home, behind the security of his own castle walls. Lance would have sworn such noble impulses were no longer a part of his make-up. That, perhaps, was the most dangerous thing about Rosalind Carlyon. She would always be looking for a hero, and Lance doubted he could ever be what she wanted. But sweet heaven, how she made a man long to try. You truly did become my Lady of the Lake tonight, he murmured, restoring to me my sword. Now he found himself wondering if his innocent enchantress might not be capable of restoring other things as well. Lost honor, lost love, lost dreams. Foolish thoughts, he chided himself, for it hardly made any difference. He'd already reached a grim conclusion. Despite everything he'd already visited upon Rosalind, the dangers, the deceptions, the wounds both of body and spirit, he was obliged to inflict upon her one thing more, perhaps the worst of all. He was going to have to force her to marry him. A daunting decision, and one that should have him in considerable turmoil. Yet once he'd made up his mind... Lance felt strangely at peace. He settled himself into a chair to await the first heralds of dawn. For once in his life, his restless spirit, content to do nothing more than watch his lady sleep. Chapter 10 Rosalind awakened late next morning to a flood of sunlight and a strange sense of well-being for a woman who'd been shot only the night before. Every effort had been made to see to her comfort, both her maid Jenny and her belongings fetched to her from the inn. The entire staff at Castle Ledger put at Rosalind's disposal to bring her anything she desired, from books from the library to dainty morsels designed to tempt her appetite. When Val St. Ledger changed the dressing on her wound, the earnest young man pronounced himself pleased with her progress, but he advised her to spend the remainder of the day in bed. Rosalind meekly accepted his gentle orders, all the while privately thinking that Val could have used some rest himself, as pale and tired as the poor man looked. No sooner had he left the room than she flung back the covers. Although she felt a twinge in her shoulder, she managed to swing her legs over the edge of her bed and groped for her muslin shawl. She wrapped the black-dyed garment over her borrowed nightgown and struggled cautiously to her feet. Rosalind made it as far as the window. There she was obliged to sink down into a wing chair, but she leaned toward the casement, determined to take stock of her surroundings, bracing herself for, what, a castle wall with pikes on the top? a moat swarming with gigantic snakes. But Castle Ledger did not appear quite so alarming a place by day. In fact, the view from Lance's bedchamber window was breathtaking. The land sloped away before her, sweeping off into the distance to become a dramatic vista of cliffside and hazy blue sea. And just below her was a pretty wilderness of garden, trees heavy with lush pink rhododendrons, standing shepherd over herds of flowers 
primroses, bluebells, foxglove, and daisies. Only one thing marred her delight in the scene, the realisation she could never explore the garden with the one person she wanted most at her side. At least, not in the sunlight. She cast a troubled glance at the bright blue sky, wondering what time it was, how much longer until sunset. Would Sir Lancelot return to her this evening? He promised, and he wasn't the sort of man, or spirit, to break his word. Rosalind felt her pulse quicken. Was this what it was like, then, to fall passionately in love? This inability to think of anyone else, this unbearable longing for the sight of that one beloved face, so different from the gentle affection she had felt for her late husband? One moment, swept up in a transport of pure joy, the next, flung down into the darkest pit of desolation. And she had more reason than most lovers to despair. Could there be anything more hopeless than tumbling in love with a man who could never be anything more to her than a haunting dream in the darkness? She couldn't even be certain of being loved in return. Who was she to suppose that she could win the heart of one of the greatest heroes that had ever lived? A man who had once loved a queen of such dazzling charm and beauty. He'd sacrificed both his honour and his immortal soul for her. Who was Rosalind Carlyne to compete with the memory of Guinevere? No one at all. Just a shy widow with a snub nose and freckles. And yet if Sir Lancelot consented to be no more than her friend, it would be enough. She could never return tamely to the dismal life she'd been leading since Arthur had died. She couldn't fathom her knight in shining armour, making his bow to her beneath the roof of Miranda and Clotilde Carlyne. The house of two dour spinsters was not conducive to midnight assignations with any man, even if he was a centuries-old ghost. It was in Cornwall that Lancelot clearly belonged, among the rugged hills and wind-swept coasts where he'd once ridden his charger, engaging in quests and performing daring deeds in the service of his king. And it was here in Cornwall that Rosalind meant to remain, to be near him, no matter what the cost. She was turning over several desperate schemes in her head, wondering if enough remained of her quarterly allowance to hire even a small cottage, when she was disturbed by a knock at the door. She'd no chance to answer before the door eased open, and she tensed when she saw who it was. Lance and Ledger appeared dauntingly virile in his gleaming boots, skin-tight breeches, and striped silk waistcoat. He wore no cravat, his white linen shirt left casually open at the neck to reveal a V of sun-warmed skin. He paused on the threshold and demanded, May I come in? Well, I... I... I she stammered. She'd been anticipating another encounter with the man all morning and dreading it. No doubt that was why her heart missed a beat and her hand flashed up to smooth the tousled ends of her hair. I promise I haven't come to bedevil you, he said, with one of his most engaging smiles. I was coming up from the stables and chanced to see you looking out at the garden, and I thought you might like to have this. He whipped his arm from behind his back, producing a nosegay. A nosegay? No. It was more like he'd attempted to fetch the entire garden to her. His large hand barely confined a glorious blaze of colours, vibrant rhododendrons crushed up against purple heather, marigolds, daylilies and primroses. As he crossed the room to her side, he left a trail of petals fluttering in his wake. Stunned, Rosalind could do no more than stare. Here, he said, thrusting the bouquet toward her. Take them. Not the most elegant arrangement, I fear, but I'm not accustomed to picking flowers for young ladies. Somehow I doubt that, Rosalind murmured. It's true. I usually just have my man order up a bouquet and have it sent round. With my card attached, of course, jotted full of words of appropriate seduction. Rosalind had started to reach for the flowers, only to freeze in alarm. Don't worry, he drawled, his eyes glinting with amusement. I was fresh out of cards this morning. 
He folded the bouquet into her reluctant hands, and she drew it closer, breathing in deeply, the mingled sweet scents as familiar and comforting to her as her books of legends, the remembrance of her papa's smile, her mother's soft caress. She felt a prickle of tears behind her eyes and blinked them quickly away. Thank you, she said. You're welcome, he replied gravely. It had to have been no more than a casual gesture to him. He could not possibly have guessed what the flowers meant to her. And yet a rare kindness had stolen into Lance St. Ledger's eyes, softening the arrogant planes of his face. Rosalind was suddenly reminded of something Sir Lancelot had said to her only last night. Perhaps the rogue is not so black as either of us have thought him to be. She contemplated her flowers, considering the possibility. While she did so, she heard a soft click. Glancing up, she saw that Lance had taken advantage of her distraction to close and lock the door. Her heart did an immediate leap, all her mistrust and wariness of the man returning. When he stalked toward her, she stiffened. Don't be alarmed, he said. In that seductive voice, she found anything but soothing. I have something of a private nature to say to you, and I would as soon not be interrupted until I've finished. Finished what? Rosalind dropped the flowers into her lap and dragged the ends of her shawl closer together, trying to tuck her bare feet as far out of sight as possible. She might be able to entertain Sir Lancelot in her nightgown without a qualm, but Lance's mere proximity made her acutely aware that her body was draped in little more than thin linen, and there was a bed looming far too close in the background. She faltered. My maid should at least be present. This, this is hardly proper. I fear it is a trifle late to be worrying about propriety, don't you? Too late for you, perhaps. But I, Rosalind, please. I only want to talk to you, just for a few moments. I would not press you, but the matter is rather urgent. Rosalind shifted uneasily on her chair, unable to imagine there was anything Lance had to say that she would want to hear. Only more scolding, perhaps, about what a fool she'd made of herself last night, or some of his wicked brand of teasing. But he didn't look like a man bent on flirting or delivering another tirade. He appeared subdued this morning, and determined. Knowing Lance's persistence, Rosalind did not see how she could easily be rid of him, short of feigning a spasm of pain and forcing him to go fetch his brother. Lance made her so uncomfortable she was tempted to do so. But she was held back by another remembrance of Sir Lancelot's voice whispering through her mind. If you could but give Lance St. Ledger a chance, my lady, to make amends, if you would but deign to listen to him. She squirmed, recollecting her own sleep-blurred promise. I will do anything that you ask. Rosalind fetched a heavy sigh at the memory. Unfortunately, Lance appeared to take this as a sign of her assent and perched one lean hip upon the window ledge, settling himself in a negligent pose, the very picture of the idle rake hell. She found herself watching the sway of his booted foot, fascinated to note he had a grass stain on the knee of his immaculate breeches, acquired, no doubt, when he'd bent to fetch her the flowers from the garden. Only a small flaw in his otherwise perfect appearance, but it had the curious effect of rendering him somewhat less alarming. She relaxed a little and inquired in a reasonably calm voice, "'What is it you wanted to speak to me about, sir?' If it is anything more to do with what happened last night, I am afraid I have little to say. Unfortunately, I know nothing of the thief who stole your sword. I don't even have any information that will help you track. I know, Lance interrupted. Valentine already told me. He said he asked you about the man who attacked you, and you have no more clue to his identity than I do. I'm sorry. She ducked her head staring down at the cascade of flowers strewn across her lap. No reason for you to be sorry, my dear. Yes, there is. To keep her hands from fretting the ends of her hair, 
she began to separate the blossoms and arrange them in a more tidy bouquet. When he was changing my bandage, Val asked me if I noticed a chip was missing from the crystal of the sword, and I... I'm not certain. I suppose it must have happened when I threw the blade in the lake. And I am more sorry than you could possibly imagine, she concluded miserably. Oh, hang the stupid sword, he said, with a hint of impatience. It's of no great importance. But your brother said the sword is part of your family legends, that some day you are supposed to surrender it to the lady you love. Val has a tendency to talk too much. As far as I'm concerned, that blasted sword's been nothing but trouble. It is partly responsible for last night's disaster, and I'm to blame for the rest of it. He infused a softer note into his tone. However, you are not to worry about anything. That is what I wanted to tell you. I've already begun making arrangements. Arrangements? Rosalind paused in the act of coupling a daisy with two bluebells to cast him a puzzled frown. Ay, this morning I've been to call upon the vicar, and I've sent for my solicitor to consult about a will. A will? The mere word was enough to send a frisson of unease skittering up Rosalind's spine. But I'm not dying, she said. Your brother told me I was recovering amazingly well. And so you are, sweetheart. Lance gave her an oddly tender smile. The will is for me. Rosalind felt herself flushed at the unexpected endearment. You think you are going to die? Not for a while, I trust. Unless you decide to murder me in my bed. But it is always as well to be prepared. Rosalind plucked a half-dead leaf off one of the primroses, her brows knitting together. She didn't know whether it was the heady scent of the flowers or the distracting way the summer breeze had teased several dark strands of Lance's hair across his forehead. But she seemed to be having a great deal of difficulty following this conversation. Her bewilderment only increased when Lance continued, I've also sent for a dressmaker. A dressmaker? A local woman. She's a bit provincial with her styling, but she'll have to do until I can find you a more fashionable modiste. He fingered the ends of her shawl, making a moo of distaste. I notice that most of your wardrobe consists of black and... black. And I believe even wearing half-mourning is considered bad luck. Bad luck for what? Rosalind asked, in frustrated confusion. To be married in. What are you talking about? A wedding, of course. Her eyes flew wide open. The bouquet she had been so carefully arranging dropped from her fingers, this time tumbling to the floor. She stared at Lance for a long moment. Then a hot tide of indignation swept through her. Oh, uh, what? You... She sputtered, unable to think of a name bad enough to call him. This is more of your horrid teasing. I assure you, my dear, I am in deadly earnest. He smiled but there was an edge in his voice that filled Rosalind with alarm. She scarce knew what dismayed her more, the sheer arrogance of the man to be consulting vicars, lawyers and dressmakers without even speaking to her first, or the steely determination she read in his eyes. Not that of an ardent suitor, but more like a general marshalling his forces to take a particularly stubborn hill. How dare you, Rosalind gasped, to be making such arrangements, and, and you never even trouble to ask me. I suppose the standard form is to go down upon one knee. I was hoping you would not require it, but... He heaved a long-suffering sigh, and, to Rosalind's horror, dropped down before her, kneeling in the fallen flowers. My dear Lady Carline, he began, reaching for her hand, will you do me the honour of... Oh, stop it, stop it! She attempted to thrust him away from her. Failing that, she tugged at his shoulder in an effort to get him to rise. Do get up, please. Have you run completely mad? I fear I have, he murmured, tightening his grip on her hand. But you don't want to be married any more than I do. No, I don't, he admitted frankly. Then why are you doing this? Is it because of that chosen bride legend? You insisted you don't believe in it. I'm not certain what I believe. But the problem is, everyone else seems to be quite sure. 
he yielded to the tuggings of her hand and levered himself back to his feet. I had hoped I could contain any scandal. I thought if I could fetch Effie Fitzledger back here to play chaperone, I could make everything all right. But besides the fact I couldn't even manage to rouse the infernal woman from her bed this morning, it was already too late. Lance offered Rosalind an apologetic glance. I am sorry, my dear, but the entire village seems to know you spent the night beneath my roof. A rush of heat surged into Rosalind's cheek. Because I was wounded. Don't people know that? Didn't you tell them? I could stand in the village square and try to proclaim the truth until I dropped from exhaustion, but I fear it would do no good. It's the damned legend. From the moment Effie declared you to be my chosen bride, everyone hereabouts has been expecting our passions to rage out of control, with or without the benefit of clergy. It's happened before. They say that one of my great uncles spent an entire week between the sheets before... Well, never mind about that. Lance broke off hastily. The point is that everyone from the vicar to the village blacksmith thinks that I must have had you last night. Oh, God! Rosalind pressed her hands to her flaming cheeks. She'd feared something like this, had tried to brace herself for it. But somehow, accepting the reality that her reputation was destroyed was far worse than she'd imagined. Lance hovered over her, stroking a stray curl back from her brow. It'll be all right, my dear, as soon as we're married. Rosalind thrust his hand away, shooting him a reproachful glare. Your notions of what would be all right are clearly different from my own, sir. Do you think I would consent to marry a man like you under any circumstances? He flinched as though she'd slapped him, but Rosalind was far too caught up in her own distress to care. It doesn't matter to me if I'm ruined, she cried. It matters to me, he said, drawing away from her, his mouth thinning into a taut line. I know you have a bad opinion of me, and God knows you have reason. I've done some reprehensible things in my life, but there is one thing I've never done, and that is to sully the reputation of an innocent woman. Exactly whose honour are you trying to save? Rosalind asked. Yours or mine? Mine, was his unexpected reply. You see, I have so little left. He turned away from her, but not before she saw the bleakness that stole into his eyes. He stood by the window, looking out, just as Sir Lancelot had done last night, and for one moment the resemblance between man and phantom was more marked than she'd ever seen it. The same sad eyes, the same haunted expression. Rosalind found the likeness so unbearable she was forced to look away. How differently she would have felt if it had been Sir Lancelot kneeling at her feet, begging her to be his bride, fulfilling all her girlish fantasies. When she thought of the happiness that would have flooded through her, the contrast was painful in the extreme. But Lance and Ledger was not as thick-skinned as she would have supposed. She had clearly wounded his pride with her rejection, and it was not in her nature to hurt anyone. I'm sorry, she said gently. I know you're trying to do right by me, and I appreciate the offer. But you must see as clearly as I do how ill-suited we would be. She attempted to smile. I am not a woman given to violence, and I have already hit you once. I fear I might be driven to murder you before the first year was out. A fleeting smile touched his lips. It would only be a marriage of convenience, Rosalind. I wouldn't even have to come near you. I already had. Rosalind broke off, appalled by what she'd been about to say. That she'd already had such a marriage, and didn't want another like that. Since when had she ever thought of her union with Arthur in those cold terms? They had wed with great affection, at least on her side. There had been times in her bleaker moments that she'd wondered about Arthur, an extremely busy man, so preoccupied with all of his noble causes, that perhaps, left with a young girl on his hands, the most convenient thing for him to do had been to marry her. No, he loved her. Rosalind was certain of that. But she suddenly felt an unreasoning surge of anger against her dear Arthur. If he hadn't burned out his life trying to save the world, perhaps he never would have died. He wouldn't have left her so alone, 
burdened with such problems and doubts. She would still be comfortably wed to him, and not in such a dire situation, where legends and swords, heroic phantoms and sad-eyed rakes seemed to be getting all jumbled up in her head, to say nothing of her heart. When Lance moved back to her side and took hold of her hand again, she suddenly felt far too weary to resist him. I might not make you the best of husbands, my dear, he said, but I wouldn't be the worst. I could give you anything you wanted, even if I wasn't to inherit Castle Ledger. I have a fortune in my own right. While I was in the army, I had the devil's own luck. I gambled on some rather risky investments that paid off and made me a very wealthy man. I don't want your money, Lance, Rosalind said softly, then started a little, realising it was the first time she'd ever used his name. It sounded dauntingly natural falling from her lips. Lance's eyes widened, and he pressed her hand with renewed determination. I can give you other things as well, a home and more family than you would know what to do with. My brother Val already adores you, and I'm persuaded my parents would dote upon you. As for my sisters... They would be only too happy to join you in roundly abusing me. Leonie, Phoebe, and Mariah would welcome you as one of their own. Oh, please, Rosalind murmured. Did he have any idea of how he was twisting her heart, holding out such tempting possibilities to a woman as lonely as she was? I... I would prefer my own family, she said in a small voice. You mean children? I'm afraid I've never thought of myself as a father. He frowned, but then shrugged. But if you wanted a few, I suppose I could provide them. A hint of his roguish smile surfaced. In fact, if I really applied myself, I vow I could have you with child by Michaelmas. Rosalind uttered a soft protest, her face searing with embarrassment, her mind seared with visions. Of herself, with the dark-haired babe, curled up all warm and soft in her arms. Of the things that Lance and Ledger would have to do to her to make such a reckless promise come true. Lance only made it worse by raising her hands to his lips, brushing her knuckles with a butterfly-soft kiss. You wouldn't find the getting of this child unpleasant, he murmured. That's one of the few advantages of marrying a rake. I have certain... "'Skills I would bring to the marriage bed.' "'Oh, don't,' Rosalind said, "'although she scarce knew what she was objecting to, "'what he was saying or what he was doing, "'kissing each fingertip in turn, "'each caress of his mouth sending a fresh quiver through her. "'She made a weak attempt to pull away from him, "'but instead of releasing her, he only leaned in closer, "'resting his arm along the back of her chair.' You don't find me completely repulsive, do you? he asked. No, Rosalind was forced to admit. She tried to shrink back, but there was no place to go. She could feel his hand stealing behind her, burrowing softly beneath her hair, teasing the nape of her neck, stroking shivers up and down her spine. His face had drawn far too close, and there was nowhere else to look except into the mesmerizing haze of his eyes. She attempted to do so bravely, trying to reason with him. You... you are very handsome, Lance, as I'm sure you're well aware. But I'm sorry, I don't feel any sort of passion for you. No? One of his dark brows lifted in almost polite inquiry. He kissed her quickly, lightly, just long enough to set her mouth tingling. What about now? No, she said, wishing she sounded firmer. He nestled her hair, her temple, her cheek, his mouth warm and rough against her skin. She wasn't breathing in the aroma of flowers any more. Only Lance's own scent, dark, musky, and masculine. And now, he whispered. She started to shake her head but he stopped the motion with another kiss, nibbling the curve of her jaw. His mouth moved downward to her neck, exploring and finding sensitive hollows that were so eagerly responsive. She found herself forgetting to breathe entirely. You're taking advantage of me, she faltered. You know I'm too weak to fend you off. 
I'm a complete villain, Lance agreed, with no compunction. And he fastened his lips over hers. She managed to wrench her head aside, placing her hand against his shoulder in a feeble effort to keep him at bay. Oh, please, she begged. I don't want you to do this. Lance only smiled at her, a glint springing into his eyes that was both wicked and tender, as though the rogue knew full well she was lying, that she did not find his kisses so unacceptable as she feigned. For one awful moment, Rosalind thought Sir Lancelot must have appeared to Lance and betrayed her confidences of the night before. Ridiculous, of course. Her noble hero would never do such a thing. And what was more, he didn't have to. As Lance bent ruthlessly to kiss her again, Rosalind realized with dismay that she was betraying herself. With her own soft sigh, with the way her lips parted, to allow him greater access to the heat of her mouth. Lance's large hands splayed against the back of her neck, holding her captive to his embrace. As his kiss deepened, her resistance grew weaker and weaker, until there was nothing she could do but clutch at his shoulder and hold on as though for her very life. She melted into his embrace, becoming a willing prisoner. The next she knew Lance was seated on the chair, and she was cradled on his lap, their lips barely separating long enough to draw the air. This is wrong. You don't want this to happen, her conscience insisted. But she could barely hear the whispering of her mind above the thundering of her heart. Lance's kiss waxed more passionate, his tongue teasing hers with hints of his sensual prowess, the even greater pleasures he could bestow. She was all too aware of his powerful thighs pressing against the soft swell of her bottom, the hardness that strained against the confines of his breeches. She squirmed on his lap, the sensation both shocking and exciting her. When her shawl drifted from her shoulders to pool with the flowers on the floor, she barely noticed or cared. Lance's hand drifted over the folds of her nightgown, roving over her hip, skimming up her ribcage to cup her breast. The heat of his palm penetrated the thin fabric, teasing her nipple, causing her entire body to quicken with a sweet, heavy anticipation. Rosalind bit down on her lip to stifle a tiny whimper of pure pleasure. Lance buried his face in her hair, his breath coming quick and shallow, his voice hot and hoarse against her ear, as he murmured endearments that she absorbed as hungrily as his caresses like a woman starved for such tender words, such intimate touches. She responded in kind, feverishly running her hand over the hard plane of his chest, whispering, Lancelot, oh, Lancelot. Was it the breathing of that adored name that finally shocked her to her senses? Or reaching up to stroke his cheek, so poignantly like the face of another whom she would never be able to touch, whose kiss she would never know? She blinked, as though she'd been slapped hard, and snatched her hand back, recoiling not so much from Lance as from herself. Oh, God, what sort of a wanton was she? Only last night she'd been silently pledging her heart to Sir Lancelot du Lac, and now she was swiftly surrendering to the seduction of his rake-hell descendant. When Lance attempted to kiss her again, she found the strength to wrench herself out of his arms. She staggered across the room and caught the bedpost for support, her legs now trembling not so much from the after-effects of her wound, but from weakness of a different sort. Lance came hard after her, the flush of passion in his face fading to an expression of concern. Rosalind? Clinging to the post, she buried her face against her hands, too mortified to look at him. Whatever is the matter, my dearest? Whatever was the matter... Rosalind thought, stifling a strong urge to break into sobs. Everything. But most of all, she wasn't his dearest. When he attempted to place his hands upon her shoulders, she flinched away from him. Damn, he muttered. Is it your wound? Have I hurt you? What a cursed brute I am to have forgotten. He slipped his arms round her waist, and she was feeling so wobbly she was forced to accept his support. But when she realized he was guiding her toward the bed, she tensed 
No. Hush, sweetheart. I only want you to lie down, to rest, which is what you should have been doing all along. He urged her forward, but as soon as she could break away from him, she dived for the mattress. She rolled onto her side and curled into a ball, dragging the blankets over her as though the frail coverings could somehow serve as a barrier for temptation, both his and her own. Lance sat down on the bed beside her. She could almost feel the bed creak, the mattress yielding to his weight as readily as she had almost offered her own body up to his strong, masculine frame. Oh, sweet heaven! She burrowed her face in the pillow, her eyes stinging with tears, her face burning with humiliation. Lance leaned over, anxiously trying to peer into her face. Rosalind, are you in pain again? Do you want me to summon Val? No, she choked out. Then may I fetch you some water, a glass of wine? What can I do? Just go away, she groaned, splaying her hand across her face, trying to hide from him entirely. I am so ashamed. Ashamed? He sounded genuinely confused. Of what? Lance paused a moment, as though mulling the matter over, and then exclaimed, Oh, that! To Rosalind's indignation, the rogue actually chuckled. My dear, there's nothing shameful in the way you responded to my uh, ardour just now. It was perfectly natural. After all, you're a passionate woman, and I am an irresistible man. Rosalind peered through her fingers long enough to glare at him. Despite his teasing tone, he was smiling at her in a way that was disconcertingly tender. And if the legends are true, he went on, it isn't your fault at all. If you are my destined bride, you are not going to be able to help yourself. I'm not your bride, she sniffed. I wish I'd never gone to Miss Fitzledger's that day. His smile dimmed. Very likely it would be better for you if you hadn't, he agreed. That is one thing I've never quite understood. Why did you come to Effie's? How do you know her? I don't. I knew her grandfather. The Reverend Septimus Fitzledger? Aye. He was an acquaintance of my father. Once when I was a little girl, he came to visit, and he told me that I should come to Toracum some day to see him. Fitzledger told you to come here? Lance asked in a strange voice. Yes. He was most insistent upon it. He said, when I was quite grown up, I must come to his kingdom by the sea. Good Lord. Lance appeared so thunderstruck, Rosalind rolled onto her back and peered up at him. Is there something strange about that? She asked anxiously. Yes, I fear that there is. Lance murmured. Fitzledger was a good and wise man, perhaps the wisest I've ever known. He was also our family bride finder before Effie. If he is the one who told you to come here, Lance paused and reached for her hand, then perhaps there truly is no escaping this legend for either one of us. Rosalind studied him mistrustingly, but for once there was no trace of cynicism or mockery in Lance's dark eyes. Only a look of wonder so deep, Rosalind almost felt herself caught up in it. But she shrank deeper into the pillow and cried, No, I don't want to be a part of your legend, Lance and Ledger. I can't be. My heart belongs to someone else. I know you still grieve for your late husband, Lance began gently, but in time... No! God forgive me, it's not my poor Arthur I'm speaking of. But... but... Rosalind swallowed hard, then confessed. It is that same gentleman I told you of, the day we first met at Effie's. Lance looked blank for a moment, then his eyes widened. You don't mean that... That one who is more noble and handsome than me? Yes, she said passionately. I will love him until the day I die. There will never be any room in my heart for anyone else. Lance's mouth fell open and then closed again. 
as though for once the man could think of nothing to say, no witty remark, no teasing quip. He appeared so stunned, Rosalind was moved to some pity for the arrogant man. She had never expected he would take her rejection quite this hard. I am sorry, she said, giving his fingers a soft squeeze. She wasn't sure Lance even heard her. He patted her hand absently and rose from the bed with a dazed look on his face. Mumbling something about her getting some rest now, he turned and stumbled from the room. Only when he was out in the hallway, with the door firmly closed, was Lance able to let out his breath in a huge rush. He had expected that his marriage proposal to Rosalind was going to be difficult. He had expected to overcome such resistance, to have to use every last bit of his charm to persuade her. But he had never expected anything like this, that she would turn him down because of a myth. A legendary hero, a phantom that he created first to deceive and then only to comfort her. Never in his wildest imaginings had he ever thought his Lady of the Lake was going to up and fall in love with the damned fellow. What have I done? He leaned up against the door, eyes closed, and groaned. But perhaps the far more important question was... What the bloody hell was he going to do now? Chapter 11 Lance descended to the lower hall and grimaced at the activity he had set into motion only that morning. The doors to Castle Ledger's most elegant drawing room had been flung open. The long gallery, with its tall, latticed windows and walls hung with mint-green spitalfield silk, had been the site of many St. Ledger celebrations since long before Lance could remember. Birthdays, christenings, betrothals, marriages. The room had been closed up during his parents' absence, but now the chamber bustled with servants dusting, polishing, and removing the holland covers from delicate lavender and rose upholstered furnishings. But he might as well tell the housemaids to put the covers right back again, Lance thought dourly. There would be no wedding celebrated any time soon, unless it was at the local cemetery. But where else would a woman go who clearly preferred to plight her troth to a ghost? There must be a certain grim humour to be found in the situation, but Lance was damned if he could see it. Stealing one last disgruntled look at the servants' preparations... He took himself off to the relative peace of the library. His first impulse was to pour himself out a good stiff drink from the half-empty decanter he and Val had failed to finish last night. He found himself snatching up the St. Ledger sword instead, abandoned on the library table. Hefting the blade that seemed to be the source of all his present troubles, he peered down at the flawed crystal and saw his own image reflected back to him, slightly distorted, but still amazingly clear. Lance studied his own face with brooding intensity. He'd never thought of himself as a conceited man before, but he was dismayed to realise he must be. He'd rather taken for granted that uniformity of feature, the dazzling smile that never failed to charm most women. So what the blazes was it about Lancelot du Lac that Rosalind found more appealing? Was it merely a turn of expression, a softness in the voice? Or was there something about a man clad in chain mail that Lance completely lacked? He expelled a frustrated sigh, fighting a strong urge to go storming back up to the bedchamber, seize hold of Rosalind, and try to shake some sense into the woman, get her head down from the clouds of Camelot and back to the realities of the 19th century. Could a heroic ghost save her from ruin? Could some noble phantom provide her with a decent home and a handsome marriage settlement, warm her bed and give her children? No, damn it all! And even if Rosalind was not head over heels in love with Lance, she was not indifferent to him either. Had any more passion stirred between them, they both would have forgotten her wound or any notions of propriety and ended up in bed. If not for that damn Sir Lancelot... The devil take the noble idiot, Lance thought angrily, then brought himself up short, realising that he was fuming just like a jealous lover. But jealous of whom? The rival that he'd created himself? By God, he thought, 
raking his hand back through his hair with a soft groan. Maybe he needed a drink after all. But before he could even reach for the decanter, the door burst open and Val limped into the room. His brother still looked worn from the ordeal of the night before, and he was leaning more heavily on his cane than usual, but his eyes were alight with eagerness. There had been no way to conceal from Val the nature of his visit to Rosalind, but Lance wished there had been. He winced as Val bore down upon him. How did it go? he asked, then beamed at the sight of the weapon in Lance's hand. Are you getting ready to offer her the sword? What did Rosalind say? When is the wedding to be? Most likely when hell freezes over. Lance plunked the sword back on the table. The lady turned me down flat. It was almost ludicrous the way Val's face fell. He couldn't have appeared more stunned or dismayed if his own suit had just been rejected. You cannot be all that surprised, Lance continued impatiently. What did you think, that the legend was going to triumph at last, love and happiness ever after? Well, no, not exactly. But from the way Val's face coloured, it was perfectly obvious to Lance that was exactly what his romantic brother had been thinking. You know the woman doesn't exactly dote upon me, Lance said. Yes, but I was certain you'd be able to change that. You have such a way with the ladies, Lance. Your faith in my powers of seduction is touching, Valentine, but apparently the only sort of proposals I'm many good at are indecent ones. But didn't Rosalind understand your offer was an honourable one? That you were trying to save her reputation? She did, but it doesn't matter. She would as soon go straight to the devil as wed me. Lance was surprised himself by the note of dejection that crept into his voice. It wasn't as though he'd ever wanted to be married in the first place. It wasn't as though he should even care. But somehow, damn it, he did. He stalked away to stare moodily out the windows, opening onto the gardens where he'd laboured but an hour ago, struggling to put together that haphazard bouquet. What he'd told Rosalind had been perfectly true. He never had troubled himself to pick flowers for a woman. Well, Lance's mouth twisted into a wry smile, except for his mother when he'd been a wee lad. None of his mistresses would ever have tolerated such a humble offering, still smelling of the earth of the garden, the petals yet moistened with dew, especially not Adele Montreuil. The woman had had far too many young fools like Lance, rivaling one another to present her with only the finest of roses, far too perfect to be real. But Rosalind. She'd led a rather sad and lonely existence, his Lady of the Lake. No roses, no admirers, no dashing officers ready to come to blows for the merest token of her favour. Despite her natural cheerfulness, there was often a wistfulness that stole into her eyes. But when she had breathed in the fragrance of those flowers, her face had brightened. For one fleeting moment she'd seemed genuinely happy, and Lance had been stirred by the strangest emotion, the feeling that he would ride to the ends of the earth, do anything to keep her that way. But was he willing to continue wearing chain mail for the rest of his life? Lance was disturbed from his glum reverie by the sound of his brother coming up behind him. He'd almost forgotten that Val was still in the room. Val placed his hand awkwardly on Lance's shoulder and squeezed. Lance, I'm sorry that things went so badly. Lance shrugged, trying to summon up a smile, a quip, some clever remark to brush off his brother's sympathy, but for once he couldn't seem to think of any. He wondered if Val would have been so swift to offer comfort if he knew the reason Lance's wooing had gone so far awry. He'd warned Lance against continuing his absurd masquerade. Val was far too much of a saint to say, I told you so. But he would be bound to come out with a remark that Lance would find equally unpalatable. Val would certainly insist again upon Rosalind's being told the truth, and Lance considered the possibility himself, but only for a moment. He still quailed from the thought. Not only would Rosalind be crushed and humiliated, she would hate Lance for it, and likely never agree to marry him. And for a man who'd vowed to end his days as a bachelor, 
he was suddenly very determined to be wed. He shook off Val's hand and squared his shoulders with fresh resolution. There is clearly only one thing to be done. I will have to find a way to force Rosalind to marry me. He swung round from the window to find Val regarding him completely aghast. Force her? Lance, you can't do that. Why not? You're the one who's insisted from the beginning that I have to save her honour, that she is my chosen bride. Yes, but... but what do you think I'm going to do? Simply give up and let her return to those two harpies to be buried in calf's foot jelly and black crepe for the rest of her life? Or to be cast out onto the streets where heaven knows what might happen to her? Val's gaze narrowed, and he studied Lance for a long moment. Lance grew uncomfortable. Val finally breathed. By God, Lance, you have fallen in love with her. No, it's just that, that I don't like to see her unhappy, that's all. I never thought to hear myself say such a thing, but even marrying me would be better than the life she's been leading since her husband died. I agree, but Lance, you can hardly march Rosalind down the aisle at sword point. Can't I? Lance retorted, pausing by the library table to caress the hilt of the St. Ledger blade. At least I'd finally get some practical use out of this thing. Lance. Lance thrust the sword aside with a rueful grin. Never fear, Valentine. I have no intention of offering my lady any violence. But I fear there is only one other solution. Lance cringed at the very idea, but saw no help for it. He heaved a deep sigh. He's going to have to visit her again and persuade her. He's the only one she'll listen to. Val's brow knit in bewilderment. Who are you talking about? Sir Lancelot du Lac, Lance said somewhat bitterly. Rosalind would do practically anything for him, though I'm damned if I can see why. He gave a dark scowl and muttered, Blasted idiot in chain mail. What did he ever do but spout poetry at her? It was my kiss that fairly had her swooning. But, Lance, you are... I mean, he is... Val faltered, casting him a troubled glance. You are really starting to worry me. That wasn't surprising, Lance thought. He was starting to worry himself. But before he could assure his brother that he was not going entirely mad, they were interrupted. After a brisk knock, a timid housemaid poked her head in the door to announce that Captain Mortmain had arrived and was requesting a few moments of Master Lancelot's time. Lance exchanged a startled glance with Val. As often as Val had invited Rafe to his home, Rafe had been adamant in his refusals. Rafe had not set foot near Castle Ledger since that long-ago summer when he'd ended his brief stay with the St. Ledgers by running off to sea. Lance couldn't imagine what had finally overcome Rafe's reluctance to visit, but he was not left to wonder for long. The trembling housemaid ushered Rafe into the library, looking as terrified as though she'd allowed the devil himself to breach the walls. As the girl vanished, Rafe hesitated on the threshold, a formidable figure in his uniform, the military cut of the navy frock coat matched by the precision of his dark, cropped hair and neatly trimmed moustache. But something in his friend's stance carried Lance back to that day, so many years ago, when Rafe had first been ushered into the library by Lance's own mother. It had been employed as a schoolroom then, and Lance and his brother and sisters had lifted their heads from their books to stare wide-eyed at the creature Madeline St. Ledger had brought into their midst. A lanky youth, whose arms and legs had all but outgrown his shabby clothes, a shock of dark hair hanging over his brow, half obscuring the most hard, sullen eyes Lance had ever seen. For Lance and his siblings, it was their first glimpse of one of those terrible beings they'd heard so many dark whisperings about. A mortmain, Lance remembered the horrified whisper they had all exchanged, until they'd been hushed by a gentle word of admonishment from his mother. Children, Madeline St. Ledger had said, with a firm but warm smile, this is Rafe. He is a friend who has come to stay with us for a while, and I expect you to make him feel welcome. A friend, Lance recalled, it had been the first time in his eight years that he'd ever questioned his mamma's wisdom. The boy had loomed frighteningly over all of them, his thin features blazing defiance. Yet there'd been a pride in Rafe's bearing that Lance had admired even then, and beneath the half-savage demeanour he had found something else in Rafe's eyes, an uncertainty. 
the hunger of a wild thing trying to summon up enough trust to creep closer to a beckoning campfire. That surly boy was long gone, transformed into the cool, collected man Lance saw before him. But for a brief moment, all the old uncertainties simmered in Rafe's eyes. His mouth curved in a welcoming smile. Lance stalked forward and clapped his friend on the shoulder. Damn, Rafe, but it's good to see you here. This is an agreeable surprise. A surprise, certainly. But as to how agreeable... Rafe's gaze travelled toward Val. Lance was dismayed to notice how his brother had stiffened at Rafe's arrival. Val's hands clutched tightly about the handle of his cane. Val had known Rafe fully as long as Lance had, but he felt obliged to bluster out some sort of introduction. Rafe, you do remember my brother. The noble Valentine, Rafe purred. He extended his hand, and for one awful moment, Lance thought Val intended to refuse to take it. But his brother shuffled forward. Captain Mordmain, he said gravely, and the two men shook, palms barely touching, in a gesture that reminded Lance of the original purpose of the handclasp between men, the assurance that one's enemy came in peace and carried no weapon. If that was the case, neither Val nor Rafe looked particularly satisfied. The air in the room seemed to have thickened with an aura of tension and mistrust. An uncomfortable silence descended, and Lance leapt to fill it. In his heartiest tone, Lance pressed Rafe with offers of refreshment and urgings to be seated, both of which Rafe declined. "'I don't intend to trespass on your hospitality for long,' Rafe said. "'I only came to inquire after Lady Carline. Has she recovered from her attack?' Lance heard Val suck in his breath. "'How did you know about that?' Val asked. The tidings are all over the entire village by now. How else should I know? Rafe arched one brow in an expression that was part mockery, part challenge. How else indeed? Lars agreed with a warning frown at his brother. Rosalind is doing remarkably well and should fully recover. No thanks to the devil that shot her. Val pinned Rafe with a hard stare. But Rafe either did not hear the remark or chose to ignore it. I believe the lady has sustained no lasting harm. She was rather imprudent to be wandering the countryside alone. Rafe fingered the end of his moustache before asking. The gossip circulating through Torricum was, as usual, rather jumbled. What actually happened to the lady? Lance related the adventure by the lake and the events leading up to it as briefly as possible, leaving out a few salient details such as how Rosalind had come to be involved in the entire business in the first place, namely Lance's masquerade as the ghost of the legendary knight. He'd never revealed the secret of his night drifting to anyone outside the family, not even Rafe. Though there had been a time or two that Lance had come close to confiding it, something had always held him back, his promise to his father, which was even stronger than friendship. When Lance had finished his tale... Rafe shook his head in amazement. So, Lady Carline saved your sword from this desperate brigand. What an extraordinary woman. Lance smiled and agreed softly. Aye, that she is. And she was not able to identify her assailant? No, the thief was once again masked. How unfortunate. Yes, wasn't it? Val put in. But perhaps you can assist with the villain's identity. I. Rafe regarded Val in a haughty, questioning fashion, and Lance dreaded what Val might be about to say next. He'd never seen his brother in such a humour. Val's face fairly radiated hostility. His warm, brown eyes turned hard as agates. You are a representative of His Majesty's government, are you not? Val demanded. It is your sworn duty to uphold the law and apprehend such villains. Rafe shrugged. I am merely a humble customs official, sent to ferret out smugglers, unless you believe that is who attacked her ladyship. No, I am certain it was no smuggler. In fact, I was wondering where you were last night, Captain Mortmain. Val! Lance snapped at his brother. Although Rafe smiled, his eyes narrowed. Why should my whereabouts hold any interest for you, Valentine? Lance intervened hastily. Val merely thought... 
That is, if, if you were out making rounds last night, perhaps you might have seen or heard something. Alas, I fear I was derelict in my duties. I spent the evening carousing rather too heavily in the taproom. All evening, Rafe added, as though daring Val to contradict him. Lance feared that his brother meant to do just that, but Val compressed his lips to a taut line. It is most regrettable that Lance was unable to apprehend the thief, Rafe continued, his eyes never leaving Val's face. I doubt now that he will ever be caught. Why is that? Val asked sharply. The man would have to be a fool to linger hereabouts after having committed such a crime, wouldn't he? Or damnably arrogant, or extremely sure of himself and his powers of deception. It doesn't matter how clever the blackguard imagines himself to be, Val retorted. I intend to unmask him. Lance followed this exchange with mounting unease, noting Rafe's expression, the thin smile, and the dangerous glitter in his eyes. He'd seen Rafe fall into this ominous humour before, when he seemed purely to enjoy playing the devil, encouraging another man's worst suspicions. And Lance's usually sensible brother looked all too ready to rise to the bait. So you are of a mind to play thief-taker, are you, noble Valentine? Rafe asked. I assure you I won't be playing, Val said fiercely. And when I catch up to that bastard... Yes, what will you do then? Clenching his cane, Val actually took a step closer to Rafe. His friend continued to smile, but Lance recognised all too well the wolfish look settling into Rafe's eyes. In another heartbeat, Val would be challenging Rafe's honour, and Lance would have the pair of them confronting each other with pistols at dawn. Was this how the St. Ledger-Mortmain feud had been perpetuated over the centuries? Lance wondered with exasperation. Born out of misunderstanding, suspicion, offended pride and unyielding tempers. It was an unusual experience for Lance, being the level-headed one in the group. He stepped quickly between the two men. When the villain is found, he'll be turned over to the proper authorities, Lance said firmly. Until then, Val, I'd like a word with you. In private, he added through clenched teeth. If you'll excuse us, Rafe. Lance directed a curt nod at his friend. Before Val could protest, Lance seized him by the arm and hustled him out into the hallway. Thrusting Val away from the library door, Lance closed it and then exploded in a harsh undertone. What the devil do you think you're doing, Val? Insulting a guest in our home. Pardon me if I have trouble making civil conversation with the man who likely attacked my brother and nearly killed that sweet lady upstairs. So now you are certain Rafe is guilty. Where is your proof, Val? Lance sneered. Or have you merely added mind-reading to your other St. Ledger talents? One doesn't have to be a mind-reader. Good God, Lance, I've held my tongue about Rafe Mortmain until now. But surely even you have to realise. You heard him in there. Val made a furious gesture toward the library. All those, those innuendos, the smirks, the taunts, practically daring us to prove him a thief. Daring you? And lower your blasted voice. Lance dragged Val further out of earshot. Rafe has borne the brunt of unjust suspicion all of his life. The mockery and sarcasm are just his way of dealing with it. And is it also his way to visit Castle Ledger? Or is it mere coincidence that he turned up here this morning, asking after a woman he barely knows? Rafe's unexpected visit had startled Lance as well, but he replied stubbornly, I believe Rafe has long wanted to return to this house. Inquiring after Rosalind merely gave him an excuse. Aye, an excuse to find out if she could identify him. You seem to forget, Val, that Rafe has been the one riding out with me, night after night, searching for the very soul you're trying to prove he stole. Pretending to help you search? The same way he pretends to be your friend. For all you know, he could have been merely leading you in circles, diverting your suspicion. Enough, Val! Lance snapped. I'm not listening to any more of these unfounded accusations against a man who's been like... like a brother to me. Like a brother to you, Val echoed somewhat hoarsely. I... I rather thought that's what I was supposed to be. Lance shrank from the hurt he saw in Val's eyes. He muttered... At least Rafe Mortmain doesn't plague the life out of me with constant lectures and 
hovered at my elbow like a blasted guardian angel. You are my brother, Lance. Forgive me for being concerned about you. I've told you often enough before. I don't want... I know. You don't need any more help from me. Val's gaze dropped to his cane, his finger flexing over the ivory tip. When he raised his eyes again to Lance, the soft brown depths were almost pleading as he asked, Was it such a terrible thing I did to you that day? He and Val had barely ever discussed what had happened on that battlefield in Spain. And Lance hardly thought this an auspicious time. He tried to turn away, to head back to the library, but Val persisted, shifting to block his path. I used what little St. Ledger talent I possess to try and save my brother's life. Was that so wrong, Lance? What if you could have taken a bullet from me? Are you telling me you wouldn't have done it? That would have been different, Lance said. Why? Because you are the great Lancelot, named for some legendary hero, while I'm only Valentine, christened after a ridiculous saint. You are a blasted saint. You ended up crippled because of me, and you don't even mind. Of course I mind. Every day I have to struggle just to mount the tamest old nag out in the stables. Every morning when my leg's so blasted stiff, I wonder if I can manage getting out of bed on my own. And every time I look at my foils, and I know I'll never be able to fence again. Val broke off his passionate tirade, his voice softening. But despite all that, I still don't regret what I did for you. I have enough regrets for both of us, Lance said. I didn't ask you to make any kind of noble sacrifice, and I find it damned hard to forgive you for it. I never hoped you'd forgive me, Lance. All I ever wanted was for you to forgive yourself. Val sighed, but said no more, stepping out of Lance's path to limp sorrowfully away down the hall. Lance watched him go, churning with the familiar mingling of regret and resentment, wondering why Val couldn't simply do as he would have when they'd argued as boys. Deal Lance a swift knock to the head instead of those mournful looks. He had to fight against the strong urge to go storming after Val. And do what? Have out this thing between them once and for all? There'd been a time in their youth when he and Val had understood each other so well. It had taken scarce more than a look, a friendly clap on the shoulder to heal their quarrels. But Lance doubted there were enough words in the world ever to put things right between them. And besides, he still had Rafe Mortmain to deal with. With a weary sigh, Lance took a moment to compose himself, and then pushed the library door open. It annoyed him to discover the source of his most recent rift with Val, calmly thumbing through a book. The danger had disappeared from Rafe's smooth features. He merely looked amused as he set the volume aside. Did you manage to soothe your brother? he asked. I never realized he was such a fire eater. He's not. Lance slammed the door closed behind him. Not unless he's been deliberately provoked. Ah, but there is something a little too saintly about the noble Valentine. One cannot resist ruffling his feathers. I'm sure you've done so often enough yourself. Yes, Rafe, but he's my brother, blast it. It's my right to torment him and no one else's. Then perhaps you'd better warn your brother I have little patience for thinly veiled accusations and suspicion. Suspicions you did your best to encourage. When did it ever do me any good to do otherwise? Rafe replied, and Lance found it impossible to argue with him. It was true. Any crime committed within a league of Castle Ledger, and the St. Ledgers had always been too ready to hang the nearest Mortmain. It embarrassed Lance that his own twin was the one most eager to fashion the rope. He attempted to apologise for Val's behaviour. A strange undertaking for him, he reflected wryly. Usually it was the other way around. Val didn't mean to imply anything, Lance said. It's only that he's exhausted, on edge from all that happened last night. We both are. And my coming here was obviously an unwelcome intrusion. Don't be a damned fool. You're always welcome in my home, and I should bloody well hope you would know that. A ghost of a smile touched Rafe's lips. How odd. Your mother once said very much the same thing to me. Without the swearing, of course. 
Rafe's gaze roved about the library, and he confessed, I seem to be a bit strained myself this morning. It's been a long time since I've been back to this house. Too long, Lance agreed. Rafe strolled down the line of bookcases, lifting his fingers to stroke the well-worn spines like a man reaching out to touch memories he wasn't certain he cared to resurrect. A rare softness had stolen over the usually hard planes of his face as he pulled out one book, then another, half smiling at some title as though at an old forgotten friend. I remember a little of the rest of the house, he said, but I recall this room very well. Perhaps because your mother spent so many summer afternoons here trying to make a scholar of me. My mother tries to do that with everyone. She might have actually succeeded with me. She was, is a very gentle and patient woman. After my mother died and left me abandoned in Paris, it was Madeline who insisted I be searched for and brought to England. Did you know that? No, I did not. But it sounds like something my mother would do. It took your family's agents nearly eight years to find me. But your mother would never give up. She's a very persistent woman. Sometimes I wish she hadn't been. A brooding look stole into Rafe's eyes. I think it might have been better if I'd never been found. Lance frowned, wondering why Rafe would say such a thing. Better for whom, he asked. All the good folk in Torricum, certainly sleeping safely in their beds for so many years, believing all the Mortmains were dead. Now they behave as though a dragon's been set loose among them again. Perhaps it would help if you behaved less dragon-like, Lance suggested. Rafe merely shrugged. Moving away from the bookcase, his gaze alighted on the desk, the St. Ledger sword glinting against the mahogany surface. Ah, St. Ledger, he drawled. Still so careless with this magnificent blade. One would think you'd learn to treat it with more respect after its miraculous return. Rafe lifted the heavy weapon, cradled the hilt against his palms, so that the crystal caught the sunlight, sending fragments of a rainbow dancing across the bookcases, refracting an even stranger light in Rafe's eyes. An inexplicable sense of unease stole through Lance. Anyone else observing the expression on Rafe's face at this moment might have been pardoned for supposing that he did indeed cover the St. Ledger sword. And the world was already too inclined to suspect the worst of Rafe Mortmain. For Rafe's own sake, Lance was glad his friend had been able to give a good account of his whereabouts last night. I spent the evening carousing rather too heavily in the taproom. But Lance had been to the taproom himself when he went to inquire after Rosalind. And he now remembered distinctly. Rafe hadn't been there. The realization sent a jolt through Lance, causing his stomach to clench. As Rafe continued to admire the sword, almost caressing the hilt, Lance regarded him with a troubled frown. Rafe, where did you say you were last night? I told you, at the dragon's fire. All evening? I. But I was there myself, and I didn't see you. Rafe shrugged. I suppose there was a brief period of time when I went out to the stables to have a word with the ostler. He's been doing a damn poor job of looking after my horse. Oh. Lance expelled a deep breath. He might have known Rafe would have a good explanation, but he felt relieved all the same. Small wonder his friend had managed to goad poor Val... Rafe had an evil genius for making himself appear guilty. Something in the tone of Lance's questions must have captured Rafe's full attention at last. He cast Lance a sharp look. Why, what makes you ask? Rafe demanded. Where did you think I might have gone? Oh, uh, nowhere in particular. I was merely curious, that's all. As to whether I might have actually taken a moment to nip out to the Maiden Lake to steal your sword and shoot your lady? Of course not, Lance blustered, but he found himself unable to meet Rafe's eyes, because for one terrible moment he had suspected Rafe, and Lance feared that his doubt was all too painfully evident to his friend. Rafe's features had gone very still. He replaced the St. Ledger sword carefully back on the table. 
The pattern of the noble Valentine is not the only St. Ledger ready to see me hanged for a thief. It'll be ridiculous. It was only that I'm finally reconsidering the wisdom of befriending old Mortmain. No, it's quite all right. Rafe looked more weary than angry, which somehow made it worse. I was expecting this to happen eventually. Then you were wrong, Lance said vehemently. You're my friend and always will be. Damnation, Rafe! He dragged his hand back through his hair in pure frustration, ashamed of himself, angry at his brother. Damn Val and his suspicion, anyway. It was like a poison, and Lance refused to be infected by it. He crossed the room to Rafe's side. I was merely being stupid. The only excuse I can offer is the strain I've been under of late. Forgive me. Lance thrust his hand out, firmly, forcing Rafe to take it. After a brief hesitation, Rafe yielded, returning Lance's hearty clasp, his stiff features creasing into a reluctant smile. Perhaps now that this wretched business of the sword is settled, you can accompany me back to the dragon's fire and we can raise a pint in celebration. Lance started enthusiastically to agree, only to check himself. I can't, he said. I need to meet with the vicar this afternoon. Planning my funeral, Rafe jested. No, hopefully my wedding. Rafe's expressive brows arched upward, and for a moment he appeared rather stunned. But then he said dryly, You plan to marry Lady Carline, I presume, your chosen bride. Aye, Lance said, somewhat sheepishly, bracing himself for a full onslaught of Rafe's teasing jibes. To his surprise, Rafe merely murmured, Well, well. I suppose congratulations are in order. It would seem you finally succumbed to your family's traditions. I never thought I'd see the day. It appears you have turned into a true St. Ledger at last. Lance found that an odd remark, as puzzling as the hooded expression that settled over Rafe's eyes. He was left with the unsettled feeling that something had altered between him and Rafe during these past few moments. Lance's brief flare of doubt and his upcoming marriage somehow changed everything. Their friendship was never going to be quite the same again. After Rafe had gone, Lance tried to shrug off the melancholy notion. He felt so infernally frustrated and drained, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do most, sink down into the nearest chair or bang his head up against one of the bookcases. What a devil of an afternoon it had been. First his rejection by Rosalind, then the quarrel with his brother, and now this friction with Rafe. Lance heaved a bitter sigh and wondered if his father had ever known days like this. Not bloody likely. Not Anatole St. Ledger, the dread lord of the castle Ledger. Lance doubted his noble sire had ever let matters slip so far out of his iron control. He stumbled over to the library window to peer out, but not at the garden this time. His gaze focused on the path that he knew meandered eventually down to the stables, and Lance felt the old restlessness rising in him, taking such a strong hold it became almost a physical ache. He yearned to tear down to the stables, fling himself on the back of a horse, and simply gallop out of here as he'd done so many years ago. Far away from Castle Ledger, with its crushing weight of expectations, including the image of the father he could never hope to live up to. Lance wasn't even certain where he'd go. Back to his regiment, perhaps. He'd long since lost any illusions about the glamour of military life, but at least things had been a deal simpler in the army. Always certain who your enemy was. No sad-eyed brother to prod at his conscience. And best of all, no dream-ridden lady looking for a knight in shining armour. Only women interested in the size of a man's purse. Val could surely manage the estates here. Until Anatole St. Ledger returned, Lance stirred restively, wondering what was holding him back. But even as the thought occurred to him, Rosalind's winsome face filled his mind. He pictured her so clearly, his blue-eyed maiden, watching and waiting eagerly tonight for her hero to return to her. And he imagined her devastation if Sir Lancelot du Lac failed her. Lance heaved a deep sigh and turned away from the window, realising he was going nowhere for now. He had a wedding to plan, 
and a bride to woo. After he'd persuaded Rosalind to marry him, made sure that her future was secured, fulfilled his family's tradition, gotten her with an heir, well, then, it could hardly matter to anyone if he went or stayed. First, he was going to have to slap on that damned chainmail, Lance reflected grimly. But if he could find just the right words to say to Rosalind, if he had any kind of luck at all, perhaps tonight would prove Sir Lancelot du Lac's final performance. Chapter 12 Rosalind paced restlessly before the bedchamber windows. The glow of the candles cast dancing reflections on the darkened panes, as though a dozen tiny lanterns bobbed just outside. Fairy lights, Rosalind had often thought of them as a child, and now they heralded magic of a different sort. The coming of night, the time when the great mansion of Castle Ledger would settle to silence, and he would come. Sir Lancelot du Lac, her beloved friend, her gallant knight, and never had she felt more in need of a knight in shining armour, to rescue her from the velvet folds of the trap she felt closing around her, from the lure of a legend and the temptation of a man's kiss and far too bold caress. She had long since bathed, donning a fresh lawn nightgown, and yet the feel of Lance's touch still seemed to cling to her body, bold, intimate, tormenting her with feelings of unwanted desire. Hugging her arms tightly about herself, she sighed, torturing herself yet again with a question. What if she had not summoned up the will to stop Lance? Her gaze strayed to the bed, her mind filling with images, of lying naked upon the cool sheets, being warmed by the dark fire of Lance's eyes, of melting beneath one of his kisses that seemed to have the power to render her so weak, of watching hungrily as he stripped out of his shirt, exposing the broad plane of his chest, bronzed, hard-muscled. Oh, stop it, stop it! Rosalind moaned at herself in dismay. What in the world was happening to her? She was a woman who'd always daydreamed about castles and knights, faraway kingdoms peopled with gentle fairy folk. Not about wild, heated tumbles between the sheets with seductive rogues who wore their breeches far too tight. She could almost hear Lance's husky voice rumble in her ear. You are a passionate woman, and I'm an irresistible man. If you are my destined bride... You are not going to be able to help yourself. What if that was true? Rosalind wondered, horrified. The St. Ledger tale of the Chosen Bride sounded almost as old as the legends of Camelot. What if, fight it though she would, she was indeed destined to succumb to Lance and Ledger? Effie Fitzledger had predicted it, and Effie had never been known to be wrong. Even the wise old Reverend Fitzledger appeared to have selected Rosalind to be a St. Ledger bride. No, Rosalind didn't know why Lance had been able to rouse such temptation in her. Most likely because he was an accomplished rake, far too skilled in seducing women, and Rosalind had too little experience in how to deal with such a man. Her body might have betrayed her, but she knew full well where her heart lay lost somewhere in the mists of time with a gentle spirit from a nobler age, when heroes were not afraid to be tender, as well as courageous and bold. So, Lancelot, Rosalind murmured, closing her eyes, please don't fail me tonight. I feel so frightened and alone. I need you more than ever. Even though the prayer had been no more than a fervent whisper, it fortified her enabled her to banish Lance's troubling image from her mind. Rosalind padded across the carpet, taking care not to make a deal of noise. Everyone from her maid to her earnest doctor, Val, assumed she'd already gone to bed. She had no desire to alert anyone into coming to check on her. Drifting back to the dressing table, she settled before the mirror. 
It would likely be hours before Sir Lancelot arrived. He had yet to appear earlier than midnight, but Rosalind was determined to prepare herself. Although she had already combed out her hair thrice, she reached for the brush again, running it through the silken strands until her hair shimmered like a curtain of moonlight down her back. Rosalind pulled a wry face at her own image. She looked wide-eyed as ever, ridiculously young, with a countenance her Arthur had always described as sweet. Sweet was the last thing she desired to be tonight. She wanted to be dazzling, radiant, the kind of enchantress that could entice a weary warrior into staying with her forever. Rosalind's gaze roved disconsolately over the imperfections of her figure, draped beneath the nightgown. Light, slender perhaps, but hardly seductive. And the padding of her bandage, thickening one shoulder, did little to help her appear more alluring. Was her wound healed over enough to risk removing the thing? Squeamish at the thought of what she might see, Rosalind had closed her eyes when Val had changed the dressing earlier, but now she loosened her nightgown and eased it off her shoulders. The lawn fabric pulled to the chair, bearing her to the waist. With fingers that trembled slightly, Rosalind began to undo the layers of linen. She was heartened by the fact that she no longer felt even so much as a twinge of pain. Whatever sort of medicine Val St. Ledger practised, it was nothing short of miraculous. Or perhaps the wound was not so dreadful as she'd imagined. Surely no more than a scratch. But as the last of the bandaging fell away, Rosalind emitted a cry of dismay. The wound was amazingly healed over, but still raw, red and ugly. Rosalind could not fool herself. Even with the passage of time, there would always be a prominent scar left to mar the whiteness of her shoulder. She felt her throat tighten and swallowed thickly, adjuring herself not to be ridiculous. She should be thankful merely to be alive. What did a scar matter? It wasn't as though she would ever be unveiling herself to Sir Lancelot anyway, feeling his tender caress, his gentle touch. Not as though she possessed enough beauty to charm the man, even if he were still alive and capable of loving her, which he wasn't. The entire situation was, was all too absurd and hopeless. Despite her best efforts, Rosalind felt a few tears escape to splash down her cheeks. Resting her arm upon the dresser, she buried her face against it, quietly indulging her despair. Lost in her misery, she never felt the slight stirring in the air, didn't realize she was no longer alone, until a deep voice called softly. Milady. Rosalind sat up with a start, blinking away her blur of tears. The sound seemed so close, directly behind her, yet she saw no reflection other than her own in the mirror. She twisted on the chair, coming halfway about before she gazed up at him, a towering figure of a man, scarce more than an arm's length away, a mail-clad warrior with midnight hair and weary face, sad smile and haunted eyes, as ephemeral as the candlelight, and yet somehow more solid and real than the very castle walls. The glad cry breached her lips. Sir Lancelot's dark eyes glowed warmly, but his smile of greeting froze into a stunned expression. It was only then that Rosalind remembered her state of undress. Gasping, she hastily crossed her arms over her bare breasts, clutching her hands to her shoulders. The movement seemed to snap Sir Lancelot out of his trance. Uh, I'm sorry, milady. Obviously, I wait upon you too early. I will just... Just, if a ghost could have stumbled, Sir Lancelot would have done so, as he backed away from her. Oh, no, Rosalind cried, fearing he meant to vanish as suddenly as he'd come. She started to rise, nearly causing her nightdress to tumble off the rest of the way. She shrank back down. Please don't go, she whispered, even though her face seemed to have turned to fire. But, milady. Sir Lancelot began, only to check himself with a frown. 
His own embarrassment vanished as he focused on her face, and Rosalind realised the tracks of her tears must be clearly revealed to him in the candlelight. She was more mortified to have him catch her weeping than half-naked. She would have dashed her tears aside, but moving her hands from their present position was unthinkable. All she could do was duck her head. To her dismay, Sir Lancelot knelt down in front of her. He peered up at her, his eyes so intent with concern. It was nearly enough to make her start crying all over again. Milady, he said, his voice a gentle balm. I had hoped to find thee in much better spirits this evening. Uh, I am, now that you're here. Yet you were weeping. Why didst thou so? No particular reason. Only something too trifling to mention. Tell me, he insisted. Rosalind squirmed, feeling more embarrassed than ever. If you must know, it was because I suddenly realised I... I'm going to be left with this dreadful scar on my shoulder. She forced her lips into a lopsided smile. You see, I told you it was mere foolishness. Sir Lancelot did not look as though he thought so. He demanded... Let me see thy wound. Rosalind shook her head, horrified by the mere suggestion of such a thing. Please. There was no way he could have forced her to comply with his request, but neither was there any way she could resist the plea in his eyes. Slowly, reluctantly, she inched her fingers down her shoulder until her wound was revealed. It struck her as being even larger and more ugly than she remembered. She hardly dared look at Sir Lancelot, but she found no revulsion in his eyes, only a deep sadness. He raised his hand, his fingers drifting over the region of her wound. She could not sense his touch, but she tingled with a powerful warmth all the same, as though all of his regrets, his comfort, his caring, flowed directly from his soul into hers, leaving her trembling. "'Tis a most grievous wound, my lady," he said. "'How much I wish it could have been inflicted upon my own tough hide "'instead of thy gentle frame. "'But if you think such a scar will mar thy loveliness, "'thou art much mistaken. "'Yours is the sort of beauty that shines from within.' "'She offered him a wobbly smile. "'I thank you, sir. "'But like most women... I fear I am foolish enough to wish for more outward signs. That thou hast, too, in abundance. His thick, dark lashes fluttered as his gaze drifted over her face, the column of her neck, the soft swell of her bosom. Rosalind realized she had allowed her arms to relax, nearly exposing her breasts again. She should have moved promptly to recover herself, but she couldn't seem to stir, held fast by the look on Sir Lancelot's face. Was it truly possible, she wondered, to find such awe and hunger, such reverence and longing simmering in this magnificent man's dark eyes? Her hands dropped limp to her side, and she thought she saw a tremor course through her gallant night. She scarce knew how long they remained that way. Sir Lancelot kneeling at her feet, herself perched on the edge of the chair, barely breathing. Like two lovers woven into an ancient tapestry, caught spellbound in a moment of sweet desire that could never fade, never be fulfilled. Sir Lancelot was the first to rouse himself. Struggling to his feet, his great spirit seemed to tremble as he turned away from her. You... You'd best robe thyself before you take a chill, my lady. Rosalind made no move to do so. She stretched out one hand toward the wall of his back, her heart aching with impossible womanly longings toward this man she so adored, whose touch she could never hope to feel, whose love could never be hers. Only when her hand passed through him did she snap back to her senses. She pulled up her nightgown and eased it back over her shoulders with shaking fingers. 
When Sir Lancelot came round to face her again, she might well only have imagined the passion she'd seen raging in his eyes. I crave your pardon, lady, he said. I should not have stared at you thus. It is only that it has been a very long time since I gazed upon charms such as thine. It is all right, Rosalind assured him, attempting to recover her own composure. Though she blushed to confess it, she said, I did not mind you looking. Because I am only a ghost, he asked, with a sad smile. No, because... Because I love you. Rosalind swallowed the imprudent words just in time. She fidgeted with the lace on her nightgown in order to avoid his eyes. Because you are a man of great honour, and I know you would never harbour any wicked thoughts about me. Sir Lancelot flinched. You accord me far too much credit, milady, he muttered. Rosalind glanced up at him in surprise, wondering what she could have said to make him look so grim, but he was quick to rally behind one of his blinding smiles. In my eagerness to see you again, I fear I have managed to discompose us both with my untimely arrival. Allow me to greet thee in more proper fashion. He swept her a courtly bow. I bid thee good evening, my fair Lady Rosalind. Good evening, sir. She rose to her feet and dropped a demure curtsy, her primness barely concealing the quiver of delight that shot through her. He'd been eager to see her again? Stepping back, he subjected her to a more thoughtful scrutiny this time. Despite your distress over thy scar, it pleases me to see you so much on the mend. I trust you have been well looked after during my absence. Oh, yes. Everyone here has been most kind, except... Except, Sir Lancelot prompted when she hesitated. Rosalind fretted her lower lip. She hadn't meant to pounce upon her noble hero with her distressing tale the moment she clapped eyes upon him. But she couldn't seem to help herself. She would have flung herself headlong into the comfort of Lancelot's strong arms, if it had been possible. The only thing checking the urge was her realization she would pass right through her bold night and likely end by cracking her head against the wall. She burst out instead, It's that descendant of yours, Lance and Ledger. He's done the most dreadful thing. Lancelot's mail-clad shoulders heaved with an almost martyred resignation. What now? He's asked me to marry him. Sir Lancelot looked rather nonplussed for a moment. Then he exclaimed, Ah, by St. George, is there no end to the man's villainy? Rosalind's mouth twitched in a reluctant smile, realizing herself how absurd her complaint must sound. But she went on earnestly, Truly, sir, his proposal was most distressing and unwelcome. In her agitation at the memory, she took a restless turn about the room. I suppose Lance meant well enough. He was likely trying to save my reputation, and he seemed genuinely disappointed by my refusal. I might even have felt a little sorry for him, except for his reprehensible behaviour since. But I haven't even been near... I, I mean, what else has the varlet done to you? Nothing directly. But my maid has carried reports to me of what's been going on below stairs. Jenny told me that she saw bolts of cloth being delivered for my bride clothes, and Lance kept his meeting with the lawyer and the vicar, as though he intends to force me to marry him. He could hardly do that, my dear, Sir Lancelot soothed. N no, Rosalind agreed reluctantly. But he could do other things, she thought. Those things that rendered her so weak and breathless in his arms, threatened to strip away her very reason. She had this inexplicable fear that if she ever did surrender to Lance's seduction, she would somehow be lost, lost to her beloved Sir Lancelot forever. Not that she at all belonged to him now, she was forced to remind herself, 
No, only in her own heart. She turned to her gallant knight in sheer desperation. Is there nothing that you can do to stop Lance? she pleaded. Could you not find some way to spirit me far from here, hide me away in some peaceful little cottage? No, my dear, he said. I cannot help you escape, and I am not sure that I would, even if I could. His words stunned Rosalind. Why not? That is the matter of the legend. If you are indeed fated to be Lance's bride... You told me you weren't certain you believed in that yourself. I am fast learning to have an entirely new respect for the traditions of the St. Ledger family, Sir Launcelot replied. But setting the legend aside, my lady, there are more practical considerations here. The question of your reputation and your dire circumstances. Lance St. Ledger may be a worthless rogue, but he could provide you with a home, a secured income. And I believe he would do his best to make you happy. I know that everyone else seems determined to push me into a loveless match, Rosalind said, with a tiny catch in her voice. B but I thought it was your solemn vow to rescue damsels in distress. I thought you were my friend. Ah, my dear Rosalind, so I am. He smiled at her so tenderly it hurt. He moved toward her with hands outstretched, only to check the futile gesture. Milady, he said gently, I only want to see you kept safe. She shrank reproachfully away from him. Safe? I don't want to be kept safe. All my life I've been tucked away in some bower, reading about romance and legends, while the world slipped away from me. I am weary of it. She realized she must sound like a petulant child, but she couldn't seem to help herself. Some long, suppressed rebellion swelling inside her like a painful tide. Just once... I would like to find a legend of my own, some small bit of passion and excitement and, and adventure. You don't think that Lance might be able to supply those things? He has a reputation for... I know all about Lance's reputation, Rosalind said bitterly. Oh, I will admit that the man is possessed of a dangerous kind of attraction. And it can even be kind upon occasion. But he has no belief in chivalry, magic, and dreams. He simply isn't... isn't... Isn't what, milady? he asked. She raised her head to look at Lancelot, unable to suppress the yearning in her voice. He isn't you, she whispered. No, Lance certainly isn't me, he said, with an inexplicable bitterness. Forgive me, my lady. I can no longer pretend to misunderstand the nature of your feelings toward me. But I assure you, I am most unworthy. Rosalind flushed hot with shame, realizing she had betrayed herself. She'd ever been too impulsive, too transparent in her emotions. She'd clearly distressed Sir Lancelot with her unrequited love. The man was far too chivalrous, too noble, too willingly hurt any lady. I'm sorry, she stammered. I never meant to burden you with with an affection I know you can't possibly return. Ah, my lady, all such tender feelings died in me a long time ago, when I dishonoured myself for the sake of the wrong woman. He hesitated for a long moment before going on. But if by some miracle my life and heart could be restored to me, then they would belong entirely to thee. Rosalind stilled, scarce daring to breathe, her heart torn between hope and disbelief. She was certain she couldn't have heard him right. Uh, are you saying... That you could love me, too. I, my lady. Until the day I... He checked himself with a wry smile. 
I will love you through all eternity. Rosalind stumbled toward him, her arms outstretched, her pulse hammering in her ears. Sir Lancelot's hand came up to meet hers. Their fingertips seemed to meet in a shimmer of light, unable to touch, yet touching each other in a way that mattered far more. A gentle communion of heart and soul. Sir Lancelot could not kiss her, but he caressed her with the dark tenderness of his eyes. And she felt, flowing from him, that which she could scarce believe. You, you do love me, she murmured. His mouth trembled with a smile as full of wonder as her own. I, lady, from the moment I first set eyes upon you. Oh, sweet heaven! Rosalind released a tremulous, half-laughing breath, her eyes misting with a joy too strong to be contained. Then nothing else matters. Lancelot's smile faded to sadness, and he drew his hand away. Not so, lady. My love for thee can afford you nothing. You must still plight your troth to Lance and Ledger. Rosalind's own hand fell limp to her side. Her overwhelming happiness clouded with painful bewilderment. You say you love me, and yet you would still see me wed to another man. There is no other choice, lady. Sir Lancelot spread his hands in a helpless gesture. Look at me. I am only a ghost, a mere shadow of what was once and can never be again. There is no way I can care for you as I would wish to do. But if I married Lance, wouldn't it be like Arthur and Guinevere all over again? Rosalind suggested timidly. That would appear to be my destiny, lady. Always cursed to love another man's wife. No, I can't do such a thing to you, or to Lance either. If you are worried about wounding St. Ledger, my lady... Don't be. Sir Lancelot spoke with unusual harshness for him. I can assure you he has no such tender sensibilities you need trouble about. Rosalind stirred uncomfortably, but she feared Sir Lancelot might be right. After all, she'd told Lance that she loved another, and it clearly had made no difference to the man. He still seemed ruthlessly determined to marry her. Lancelot's voice gentled his hand drifting along the fall of her hair, the gesture rife with his own sense of futility and desperate longing. There has been little good in Lance, but this proposal he has made to you, it is the best and most honourable thing he's ever done in his entire wretched life. I should so like at least one time to be able to look upon his face with some pride. I beg you, my lady. Allow it to be so. Rosalind wrung her hands together, feeling as though her heart were being torn in two. She found it difficult to deny Sir Lancelot anything, especially when he looked at her so, his eyes an aching torment of love, despair, and tenderness. Yet what he was asking of her was nigh impossible. If I was to wed Lance, she argued, how would I ever see you? How could you come to me each night? I could not. This would have to be farewell. No! Rosalind's chest tightened with alarm. She clutched at Sir Lancelot in terror that he might vanish before her very eyes. Her hands passed through him, only adding to her sense of desperation. But, milady, it would be far better for you if I... No! she cried again, even more fiercely. I would die if I lost you now. Lancelot stared back at her helplessly. It was hardly possible for a ghost to sigh, but he emitted a sound full of weary resignation. Very well, he said. I will continue to visit thee. But you must promise to wed Lance at once. How can I do that when I love you so? Milady, I have had so many regrets to torment me. Let not the night that I drifted into your heart become another of them. 
if I were forced to see thee embark upon a life of poverty, cast off and alone, it would be more than I could bear. Rosalind could see the truth of his words, writ in every agonized line of his noble countenance. Sir Lancelot continued to urge, Your marriage to Lance would not diminish what we feel for one another. It would become a kind of courtly love, like the troubadours used to sing of. Courtly love? Rosalind echoed. Aye, a rather popular fashion in my time, though I could never see precisely why. A lady properly and respectably wed to some lord, giving him airs, tending his castle, a most practical arrangement, while her heart was bestowed upon some knight who performed courageous deeds in her honour for no more repayment than a smile. Rosalind nodded dreamily, a love that was ever destined to remain pure and chaste, unfulfilled, but it would be more than enough. Would it? Sir Lancelot cast her an odd, enigmatic glance. Oh, yes. Was there ever a higher form of love? Mayhap not. Lancelot smiled ruefully. Then I will swear never to forsake thee, and in return you will promise to do as I ask. Rosalind wrestled with her own doubts for a moment longer, but there was no resisting the plea in Lancelot's expressive eyes, the painful knowledge there was little else she could do for her love's weary spirit, condemned to an eternity of wandering the earth, just this one thing that might bring his noble heart a little ease, perhaps the only way they could remain together. All right, she said, in a small voice. I will marry Lance and Ledger. 